Council, I'll call the meeting to order for the record. It is Tuesday, April 5th, 2022 at 4.31 p.m. We'll begin this afternoon's City Council work session with roll call attendance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Byrne? I'm here. Councilwoman Perot? Here. Councilman Borton? Here. Councilman Hoagland? Here. Mayor Simison? Here. Next item is adoption of the agenda. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoagland. We do have one item we want to move. That's item number 15, final plat for Gray Cliff. Gray Cliff Estate Subdivision Number Two. We'll have a brief explanation of activity that's occurred out there. So, with that, Mr. Mayor, I move adoption of the agenda as amended. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the agenda as amended. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the consent <coughs> agenda is adopted. Uh, we do have one item fifteen or. Er, Yes, 15 that was moved to the consent, off the consent agenda. So, Mr. Hogan, would you like to make any comments or invite someone up to speak to them? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hogan. We're going to move adoption of the consent agenda, correct? Oh, yeah. Don't we just, we just did that. I thought we just adopted the agenda. Now we're going to adopt the consent agenda. Okay, then thank you. you jumped ahead on me. I, I did jump ahead. Confused. So, okay. Next time is the adoption of the consent agenda. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hogan. Uh, with item 15 move to uh, off the consent agenda, I move approval of the consent agenda as amended and for the mayor to sign and clerk to attest. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as amended. Is there any discussion? If not, in favor of signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it and the consent agenda is agreed to. We do have item 15, which is moved off the consent agenda. So, Councilman Hogan. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Bill, I understand you are going to be talking about this as well as some other folks, uh, just about some activity with ACHD and right away and some things like that. So if you wouldn't mind updating us. Happy to, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, typically, we don't bring these types of issues before this body. Um, I just emailed the applicant and let them know that this was actually getting removed to discuss this item. Uh, we've been waiting on ACHD to give us a clear direction on dedication of right away for this particular <laughs> project moving forward. So give you some background, some history on what's occurred and where we're at today. And then if you want um, Laren to come up and testify, he's not the applicant on the application, but he's the one that brought it to the city's attention. So he wanted to share some of that information with you as well. So essentially what we've have here is we have a final plat that's in front of you. As far as the city's concerned, the plat is consistent with the phasing plan and the conditions of approval. What we've realized recently is that this property has been sold to a different developer. And at the time that this was before you, the ACHD staff report considered, um, so essentially I'll, I'll pull up Laren's presentation so I can use his graphics for you and explain it a little bit more succinct. So get your orient here. So this is gray cliff here. And then off to the west is what's called Brundage Estate. So that's, it's the area bound by Linda Road on the west and Meridian Road to the east. So it's right in the middle of that particular section here. And then Harris Street here ties into Meridian Road at the, at the Mid Mile Collector here. So essentially, this is what we're talking about today with you. And we're trying to get clarification from ACHD. So at the time, um, there was some property to the west here, which is called Brundage Estates. It was entitled in 2014. At that time, uh, they had a layout, but services weren't available to that property. After that was approved, Annex and Zoned, um, the same property owner came in with Gray Cliff Estates. And this came back before this body on several occasions, but the most recent approval was 2019. At that time, um, the city council approved this plat and ACHD recommended conditions of approval apart, as part of that preliminary plat that required a portion of this collector road to be conditioned or constructed um, as part of an offsite improvement because it was held under common ownership. As part of that condition, the area, the developer was only required to, to construct a portion that would only construct the portion that would serve this development. So all that's the reason why they only had to build a portion of that collector. And then anything south of this intersection would be dedicated either through the Brundish, with the Brundish State subdivision to the west or with this phase when it came in. Since that time, ownership's changed. Now it's no longer under common ownership. So this is a this 
It was owned by Lee Centers. He sold it to KB Homes, who's the applicant on this particular final plat. And so now the city is trying to work with ACHD as to whether or not they're going to enforce the dedication of that additional right of way in this area here that you see circled. Um, so as part of the construction drawings that was submitted with the final plat, the applicant will be building this much of the collector road per the condition, but we're trying to determine how to get this dedication to happen with this phase as per ACHD's condition. And that's one of the slides here that um, Laren has, has provided as well and how that, this is how the condition reads. So it's not really, again, not a city's condition. Uh, we don't try to get involved and enforce others conditions of approval. Um, but I have to at least commend Laren for bringing that to our attention and trying to work with ACHD staff. Um, they, again, we have not got clear direction from them. I sent them an email last week asking for clarification on this. I also emailed the planner asking for the, whether or not they were going to require the right of way as part of that. Um, right now, all we've gotten from ACHD is they, they aren't sure how to enforce it at this point because of the different ownership. Uh, so with that, again, if you find this is significant enough of an issue that you want resolved, either vacated from the agenda and we continue to work on the issue, or as I mentioned to you, the, the applicant is complying with their conditions, at least they're consistent with the city's conditions and process. And so if you feel like the applicant can work behind the scenes with ACHD and, and get this resolved, then we would just ask that you approve the plat as, as stated or as written and then uh, hopefully at some point in the future, we'll get things moving. But I can tell you right now, Brundage Estates has not had any other final plan approvals done on it. And there's been multiple time extensions on that particular property. And so that's what's raised the concern for, or at least from planning staff, is that if Brundage Estates does not receive a time extension or the applicant doesn't move forward with a time extension on that plat, then we could be left with kind of this no man strip of right away that would not be extended until such time as that property came back and, and developed consistent with the city's plans. With that, I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hogan. Councilman Borton. Bill, do, do conditions of approval get placed as a requirement within a recorded DA that they must comply with that type of condition of approval, which would then run with the land when it yeah, sells? Yeah, mayor, members of the council, that's the argument that we're trying to, a conversation we're trying to have with ACHD is it's your condition of approval. Um, the staff report is tied to the findings that are tied, essentially tied to the DA. Uh, but again, it's been our stance that we don't try to enforce other agencies' conditions of approval. And so that's why I'm here trying to daylight the issue with you is it's it really is an ACHD condition of approval. Which Mr. Mayor, Councilman Board, which they've the new property owner still is obligated to comply with. Are they saying they they don't believe they have to comply now? Uh, that is my understanding. I have not been in those conversations oh. with ACHD. I've only seen I've only seen the emails going back and forth. But I know Laren's been in more direct contact with the director over there talking about this particular issue. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hogan. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear from Laren on this. It sounds like he might have some insight into some of these things that uh, we're discussing as far as enforcement and what parties might be agreeing to or not agreeing to. Uh, thank you, Laren Bailey, um, Conger Management Group, 4824 East Fairview Avenue, Boise, Idaho. Um, first, I want to point out, I don't go around town just trying to create problems for other developers. We have recently acquired a, a contract on the property south of this. We had about 40 acres and we've been able to piece together now about 80. And so this collector becomes very important part of, um, of the transportation network as well as connectivity um, for pedestrians. And so our, you know, we really this arose about three weeks ago. We figured out this was a, an issue. Um, and I understand it's maybe not yours to solve. It's an ACHD issue. We've been trying to work with them. Just the final plot was coming up to be heard and wanted to get it out there because we do believe that connectivity is, is, a, is, is a policy of the city of Meridian and it's something that you guys want and have pushed for. You know, we've, we've tried to do that where we can and just feel like it's you know, um, everybody's responsibility to make those connections with development. And we just didn't want to have a spite strip here. Um, we have met with ACHD numerous times. 
at first I thought we had made progress, everybody was on the same page, but now they're getting relatively wishy-washy and that's, that's concerning and that's why we're here tonight. Um, trying to make sure this gets put in so that it you know, affects future development, or doesn't affect future development and creates that connectivity. Um, so I, I guess, I, I know I'm putting you guys kind of in, a, in the middle here, but I, we're just trying to make sure, like Bill said, the issue's daylight and everybody's on the same page going forward. Do you have any questions I'd glad to answer? Mr. Mayor, House one board. So the, the question about the new owner of this parcel, north of your parcel, apparently. Is that, who was that, was that Lee? Or, or is he the seller? Lee was the seller. Who bought it? Um, was it that? Owns it, Bill? I'm having a KB home start. Okay. So are they taking the position to ACHD that we don't have to do that anymore? They're saying, well, we don't own that property, so how could we dedicate it? And they didn't make that a condition of their... It, it is a condition. I mean, it's item number eight. I can hand them out if you'd like of ACHD conditions. I've got handouts if you want to see them. But, so, you know, I don't... I don't know that all issues have been exhausted with ACHD. I mean, I think there's, they're still trying to figure it out on their end. It's just the process is still moving forward and we didn't want to miss an opportunity to make sure this is taken care of. And like I said, we're not just trying to make a problem for everybody. It's just, it, it's an issue that I think deserves a little bit of thought, so. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember. So, what are what are our options tonight? Approve, deny. So, Mr. Hold. Mayor, I think I think what what they're asking is again a, a continuance. I think Sabrina is on here too, so the applicant's representative is also on here. Well, so it it has met the conditions for planning's purposes, but there is this one piece that's unclear as whether it's resolved or not and it can impact all the other developments. So I think what they're asking essentially is a delay again to see if we can get some different and, and maybe have ACHD part of the conversation because again we're getting simply emails from them and have them actually be a part of the conversation like two weeks or whatever. Um, but I don't know if, if Sabrina wants to weigh in too for the applicants their application. Sorry, I don't see Sabrina, so that's why I don't know where she is. If she's that's right, she's in waiting. I didn't know with everything else on the agenda if you wanted to go there tonight. I leave it to council if you'd like to hear from the applicant. Mr. Mayor, Council Borden. We could. I don't know anything that could be said that would probably make us feel comfortable to approve a plat, final plat right now, as opposed to just tabling it, giving it a couple weeks to have these conversations fleshed out a little more, give the applicant some more time to if there's a clear explanation that gives us comfort, so it seems appropriate just to wait. Mr. Mayor, be supportive of that. It's your, it's your, your motions, so. Mr. Mayor, is there a date that we want to continue just two weeks? I think that'd be great to hear from the applicant if you really, <laughs> we, we, we're, we're made, no, no disrespect to Lauren, but we're making, we're, we're doing something based upon someone who's not the applicant and the applicant's here and we don't want to hear from them. So I think you should at least hear from them if you're going to delay okay. to a time certain or make sure that they are in agreement with what has been presented to you. Sure. Is the applicant, Sabrina, are you there? Hi, can you hear me, everyone? Council member, yes. mayor? Hello, yeah. um, thank you for um, taking a few minutes to let me talk. Um, I'm totally fine with having it tabled for a couple of weeks. I actually have phase three, I think, since you with you guys in a couple of weeks. So that might be perfect timing. I did just talk to Lee Centers and um, he has not made any formal commitments. Um, my goal is to, um, help facilitate this um, with Lee and to get the right of way um, dedicated. But as you guys are aware, we, I'm not in control of that land. So um, he was gonna get back to me. So I think that um, having a little extra time to talk to Lee, talk to ACHD um, would be wonderful. So I would appreciate that. Thank you, Sabrina. Council, any questions for Sabrina? 
Mr. Mayor. Councilman Burton. I move that we continue item number 15. Do I need to give uh, um, FP-2022-0005 to April 20th, 19th? I'm looking at it first. 19th to the 19th of April. Mr. Mayor, um, can you... Can the motion maker clarify the six o'clock or the four thirty? Four thirty is fine. Second. Have a motion, a second to table this till the the two weeks at four thirty. Is, is there discussion, Councilman Borton? It would be really helpful. Um, perhaps it's even like on the consent. We don't know, but if we can have Sabrina, um, kind of the resolution in detail of how this is fleshed out, who's committing to what and when in writing. Um, I think that'd be helpful for us to review prior to um, the 19th. Is that possible? I think Sabrina has been removed from the... Well, Phil, you can convey that message. I just think it's going to be more productive for us to see that in however things did or didn't get sorted out. Sure, um, council members, absolutely. Do you need that like a week prior, a couple days prior, Bill? Um, do you have a preference on when you need that information by? Mayor, Council, I think if you see it on the consent agenda again, the, the issue has been resolved. I mean, that's how we can approach it, but I'll certainly give you guys an update in, in, in a memo form and let you know that right away is going to be dedicated or something to that effect so you know what's happening. That works. Good. Thanks. Is there further discussion on the motion? If not, in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the item is continued. Next item up is under Department Commission Reports, item 29, which is the Art Commission Annual Update. We turn this over to Bonnie. Or, Sandra, are you going to do introduce? Mr. Mayor and City Council, um, I'm here to introduce the 2021 Annual Reports by the Meridian Arts Commission and the Historic Preservation Commission, and also introduce myself. I'm a uh, new city employee. I'm the Arts and Culture Coordinator. And I do the arts and culture programming and um, all of the administrative functions of both of the commissions. And with that, um, Bonnie Griffith will be uh, introducing the annual report for the Meridian Arts Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Thanks, Bonnie. Thank you, Cassandra. So first of all, I just want to give a big thank you to the council and to you, Mayor, for all the support that you give the arts over over time, and that's uh, certainly appreciated, and I think the residents of the city appreciate that also. So to start out with our annual report, we st our, our mission statement is to develop, advance, and nurture all facets of the arts and to enhance the quality of life for Meridian residents and its visitors. So in, in 2021, we had two commissioners leave the commission and two more joined. We have Bobby Gayton, who is uh, part of the Public Arts uh, Committee, and Patrick O'Leary. And of course, we're delighted to have Cassandra as um, our Arts and Culture Coordinator. So the commission is comprised of three different subcommittees, the Public Arts Committee, the Events and Outreach, and the Initial Point Gallery subcommittees. The Public Arts committee, their purpose is to identify and develop public arts within the, the city of Meridian. Meridian arts in public, pace, in public spaces, maps. Um, the city allocates $50,000 a year to maps funding. Public art committee then identifies and develops projects with these funds. In 2021, we started a new public arts with the art with the Park Identity Project for the new Five Mile Pathways Trailhead. The site is the city's first gateway to the Five Mile Pathway. And in 2022, we'll continue working on this project with an open call to artists that will go out nationally. Another part of this subcommittee is the traffic box selection, the traffic box series. Um, we did increase the artist's payment for design to $600 which is more in a line with what, what other um, cities in, in our area are, are paying. For design, we, we wrap seven um, 
boxes from the artist repository and from the West Ada School District, which was funded by MAPS. Five wraps were selected from the uh, student art show, and those were installed in the urban renewal area funded by MDC. Another project of this committee is the mural series. We started out with a goal of three murals in Meridian, the first murals for the city collection. We were able to install one um, in this past year, and that was dedicated in late fall at the Meridian Cycle. And it was the work of artist Ben Conkle. And that's a pretty, pretty cool one. Um, so what's next? New venues identified for 2022 murals. The design phase is currently underway with the Unbound Library. <clears throat> the public art plan. The goal is to develop a vision for the public art and Meridian and to assist in selection and future installations of public art pieces. So we, we enlisted uh, via partnership consultants to, and they completed a questionnaire and survey for public input. Uh, they completed a report and findings. After that, Mac held a workshop to develop ideas. And what's next? A continued development and implementation of the strategies uh, along with the new arts and culture coordinator and following the uh, VIA's uh, recommendations. The events and outreach subcommittee, their purpose is to provide uh, events and activities that engage Meridian residents in visual and performing arts in a family-friendly setting. So part of that committee is to um, organize the concerts on Broadway. So in 2021, we had three concerts uh, following a, a, a black, a dark, dark year in 20. Um, those were the King of Swing, the Billy Blues Band. And for the last one, we had a folk heritage concert, which included four guest artists and groups. Another big project for this subcommittee is Meridian Art Week. And that includes the, the beloved art drop where pieces of art are gently hit around downtown Meridian and it's finders keepers. If you find a piece of art, it's yours. The annual chalk art competition, as well as other activities that include arts classes. Uh, there was a paint out with the uh, plein air painters of Idaho, some dance presentation and um, the Meridian Arts Foundation had their art sip, the Kleiner Park art, um, party and concerts on Broadway. And the last thing that um, this subcommittee did was the holiday ornament drop. And so that's fashioned after the art drop. And it's uh, once again, it's the ornaments are hidden gently throughout downtown. And um, again, it's finders keepers. The third subcommittee is the Initial Point Gallery subcommittee, and their purpose is to provide a fine art gallery space to showcase, showcase the visual arts of the Meridian students of the West Ada School District, and as well, local and regional emerging and professional artists. And in 21, we came off of a year that we had very few um, shows at the gallery and and we were able to do 10 one month long exhibits and one two month long exhibit and those included the west data school district show of the youth art there were four large organizational groups that exhibited um, works of 20 to 30 artists in each show and there were six group shows that featured about 23 individual artists so what's next for mac in 2022 once again, we'll do the concerts on Broadway, and there's some tentative um, scheduled with Smooth Avenue, High Street, and Soul Patch. We'll continue with the, the Meridian Mural Series, a, a partnership, as I said before, with the Meridian Library District, uh, the Unbound Library, which is currently in its design stage, and then a final mural proposal partnership with um, the West Ada Recreation District uh, at the Meridian Pool. There will be a national release of Call to Artists for the Public Art Project at the new Five Mile Pathways Trail Hub and development of the public art plan. Uh, the traffic box maintenance is underway at this time with cleaning and there will be an installation of additional wraps from the West Ada School District and Artist Repository. 
Art Week this year is scheduled for September 7th through the 10th, which follows the Labor Day weekend. And again, the holiday ornament drop and 11 shows at the uh, exhibits at the initial point gallery of our being scheduled or have been scheduled. So with that, it's um, always interesting to look at what the, Im what the impact um, based on economics are for the, of the arts in the state of Idaho and compared to nationally. And it's, it's quite significant. Arts and cultural production adds $2 billion to the state's economy, which is about 2.8% of the economy based um, that can be traced back to arts and culture. Uh, the, the number of jobs that, that arts and culture support is almost 21,000. And in, in one year, approximately 58% of Idaho adults attended live music, theater, or dance performances and an additional 37% of adults attended art ex ex exhibits. Nationally, the arts contribute to more than $766 billion to the national GDP, uh, which is about 4.2%. 4.92 million workers in the arts and culture. Um, there, there was a, it's created $20 billion in trade surplus, surplus for the arts and cultural products in the US. And this, this information is, is really based on a, a 2017 survey by the National Endowments for the Arts. And you know, from, from other presentations that we've looked at recently, those numbers are, are pretty, pretty stable with the exception of last in 2020, there was a significant um, loss of, of um, performing arts jobs and production, obviously because of the pandemic, um, but, but that's starting to come back. So why are arts a good public sector investment? Um, economic drivers, educational assets, good for health and wellness, civic catalysts, and uh, great for cultural legacies. And these are just a few quotes from um, you know, the National's Governors Association stating that they're, they're finding that the arts, culture, and design can be an important component of the comprehensive strategy for growth. Uh, the President's Committee on, on Arts and Humanities, uh, quote, a society that supports the arts and humanities is not engaging in philanthropic uh, activities so much as, as it is assuming the conditions of its own uh, flourishing. flourishing. Um, and the arts are unique in revitalization of areas as well as creating platforms by which collaboration can be attained. And I think we see that in, in um, revitalization areas everywhere. And, and that came from, um, I believe it was the Federal Bank of Atlanta that had um, posted that statement. So with that, I think we know, we know that the arts are good for so many things. And um, from the commission, I just wanna thank you for recognizing that the arts is important in Meridian and our community. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Bonnie. Council, any questions? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. Thank you for being here, Bonnie. I have the opportunity to uh, be involved with and attend several of the events last year and it was fantastic. So I'm looking forward to what's coming this year. Question for you about the um, display that is underway uh, for consideration at the Five Mile Trailhead. Um, last year, I thought that there was an artist that, that was decided upon and that a design had been worked on and there was a contract going out. Did that not come together? That, didn't, that did not come together. So the call is being put out again for, um, for that site. And so the goal is to have that completed this in 2022. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, Blaine, I think you already had your introduction from Cassandra. So uh, we, we'll, we will welcome Blaine to give the Historic Preservation Commission annual update. Blaine, you look different without your cowboy hat on. I know it, I know it. Barely recognize you. <laughs> hats aren't appropriate inside the building. Cowboy hats are. We're good. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, my name is Blaine Johnson. I am president of the Meridian Historic Preservation Commission. We have a great commission, some new members. Um, I think it's important to recognize them. Uh, so our commission members are Destiny Hart, Tyler Ricks, Pam J. Gosh, John Dinger, who are new this year, um, Jody Alt, and our youth commissioner, Jack Keller, who I'm glad he's a freshman. Hopefully we can get him for three or four years and stay in our commission. So um, I'm excited about that. Um, we're continuing our historic virtual tours, um, partnering with Whole Films to create those um, for Meridian history. Newly completed sites are Meridian City Hall, the Creamery, and Meridian Speedway, and all those are available online. Uh, the link is is there um, on City's website. Go through everything. So um, those are really exciting for us. National Registry is is probably the biggest undertaking that we've we've trying to do. Um, we were awarded a grant from SHPO for $2,000 for a reconnaissance survey for the Speedway. Um, we're in the final phases of that. Um, TAG, the group that's done that uh, work for us, submitted all the final paperwork at the end of last month to State Historic Preservation Office. They had the final say in June. That goes on to National. We should hear this fall whether or not National approves that. So keep your fingers crossed. And with the, any luck, um, we'll have a new National Registry place here in, in the city. Preservation Month was tough these last couple of years with the pandemic. We haven't been able to do anything in person. We've done some virtual things. Um, scavenger hunts, um, a few participants last year, but again, due to the pandemic, I think we had people were afraid to get out a little bit. We're hoping to have um, some live events this year. Um, we've scheduled tentatively um, the curator actually from the Owyhee County Historical Museum to come in. Um, he's got the old school bus that was the history centers. Uh, hopefully we'll bring that down here, park it. Maybe we can take some tours with that. And then um, he's got some displays um, for um, the railway in southern Idaho, which will kind of tie in with what Shippo has for um, the mining history of Idaho. Because um, without railways, the mines wouldn't have worked, couldn't have got the ore to the smelter. So that's what's on tap for Preservation Month. Um, certified local government. Um, we're required by SHPO to have um, continuing education units for our commission members. Um, this past year, we had three commission members virtually attend the Pass Forward Conference um, for those. Um, so that was a good, good thing for us. Um, part of our certified local government status suggestion from SHPO is that we undertake an intensive survey and their comments were that we should look at North Meridian, so Broadway up to Cherry, and then that area. So that's an undertaking that we want to get started on also. Um, so I think that covers that. So I don't multitask very well. <laughs> um, continuing education, which I covered. Um, what's next? We started social media efforts last year with Instagram and Facebook. And um, Tyler Ricks, one of our commission members has been doing a great job finding, finding posts to put on that. Um, so we get those out Thursday, usually you throw back Thursday on Instagram. So we usually try to post something on Thursday to deal with history. Um, I need to thank Cassandra for her work to get those things out for us. Um, so I would encourage members of the city council to like, follow, share our posts. Um, the more you guys like and share, that just increases our um, exposure out there to the public. Um, we're also exploring new sites for listing. Um, right now we're also talking about 
looking at Zamzel's mill. So um, hopefully once we get the, the speedway done, we can start looking at Zamzel's mill for possible listing on the National Registry also. Um, architecturally, it's not much of anything to look at, but historically and culturally for the city of Meridian, it's very important for the city. Um, I want, we want to recognize the importance of, of that facility to the city. Um, with that, I'd like to thank the mayor's office, city council, the city staff for all that you guys do for HPC. Without your support, we couldn't do what we do. Um, and we thank you. And with that, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, I'm here to take them. Thank you, Blaine. Council and con questions. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Borden. Blaine, I had a nice walk with Mr. Norse last week. And you maybe you already have this, but is, is he part of the interview package um, that you've cataloged and interviewed? And Lila has done that. If, uh, and on the virtual tour, not only on our into the smartphone apps, but on the website, the nurse house, Lila, I believe, has interviewed him and talks about Good. his family history and the house and everything like that. So, yes, he, that is included. Yeah, that's a great wealth of knowledge that gentleman i wish i could pick his brain every day you could learn something new every day yeah no doubt yeah believable so good i'm just glad it's been cataloged yes. he was telling stories from the 30s that yes blew me away cancel any additional questions or comments thank you blaine thank you, thank you so much have a great day Council, the next item up is resolution number 22-2320, uh, a resolution appointing members to the Meridian District Inc. Committee. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, speak with each of these six individuals, all of which whom have a relationship with the city currently. They all are currently serving on one of our city commissions. Um, I think they, they definitely meet all the intent of the ordinance. We have two people south of the interstate, four people north of the interstate, three people east of Meridian Road, three people west of Meridian Road. But more importantly, I think if you look at the backgrounds and knowledge, we have a former city council member, so someone who has some knowledge of serving. Um, we, we have a current elected official who, again, can bring that um, element to understanding uh, what, what it means to represent and serve others. Uh, we got some someone who is helping the state on their redistricting process, has, having some of that knowledge and background uh, through that process. And then we got just some people who are longtime Meridian residents who've given lots of service. So I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you have about this group. Otherwise, I know they are ready to get to work and fulfill the duties of, uh, of the committee and move forward to get these things set up um, by the date. And I guess the one last thing I'll say is uh, they have all committed to not having an interest in running for the next five years. I don't know how technically we can prevent them from doing that in, an, in this, but they've at least expressed that that's not their desire, you know, from that standpoint. So <coughs> happy answering questions or take comments. That's Mr. Hoagland. Mr. Mayor, just wanted to, if they have the, it talked about uh, the due date and it talks about uh, having a plan, districting plan to the city clerk no later than June 28th. So that gives them just a little more than two months. So you're confident they can, they can do that. June. June was a June or July. I think, I think the, with well, there's, there's, yeah, yeah. I, I think there's plenty of time to get it done from that perspective. I, I didn't look, see how they backed out the date just to make sure we could have it in place by August. That seems to be pretty early for the August date for noticing purposes, but yes. Mr. Mayor, I just have to look at the ordinance to see, but we did a lot, plenty of time there. I don't, I'd have to look up what the June date is, but I, my recollection is we have uh, public meetings in June and July, and then an ordinance before council in August on a public hearing. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Holcomb. 
Yeah, it, it just section five does talk about is hereby directed to transmit the Meridian District Plan to the city clerk no later than June 28th, 2022. So that's gonna. I think that that's three months. Okay. I think it's they're ready to get to work and they've already started working on setting up dates. So great. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hovland. I move we approve resolution number 22-2320, appointing members to the Meridian District Committee. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 22-2320. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor, or do we need to do this by roll call? If not, clerk, call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Byrne? Aye. Perot? Aye. Borden? Aye. Hoagland? Aye. All ayes, <laughs> motion carries and the resolution is agreed to. So Mr. Clerk, they are now your charge to Meet those deadlines and timeframes. Next up is item 32, uh, fire department department report for fire station 78 bid package update. I'll turn this over to Chief Bloom, but as you can see, he's got a whole host of people here to assist him to provide this information. All right, Mayor, members of council, thank you very much for the opportunity to provide you an update on where we are in the bid process for fire stations seven and eight. The information that I have, and obviously there is an entourage here, is intended to provide a snapshot or a screenshot, a moment in time of where we are right now in the bid process. And I think that that's important because the bids are not complete. Um, like I said, I have an entourage, I have ESI here and the ownership team with City of Meridian. We have finance, procurement, and uh, they're here to answer any specific questions you might have. I'm here to give you some the broad uh, picture of where we're at in this process. So ESI sent out the bid packages on February 18th. The bids closed on, on March 20, on 21st. There were 22 bid packages. 16 of those received um, what are considered legal responsive bids. So there are still six bids or six bid packages with unknown values that are still uh, outstanding. And uh, approximately, uh, we're approximately 20% over um, last year's approximated estimates. So that puts it approximately $1 million per station over estimates from last year. Um, on April 11th, we will have rebids back from those six that were either um, uh, not complete bids or they were under some VE um, being looked at from a VE perspective. So we'll, able, we'll be able to give you a more complete picture in the future. Um, once uh, we get done with those, the rebids and on April 19th, we're gonna have the site work as well as the police precinct rebid, which will give us a more complete picture for not only the rebids, but also uh, the site work and the uh, police precinct in the, in the North. So that's where we're at right now as again, a snapshot screenshot in time, a moment in time, um, and on April 26th, when all the bids, hopefully, hopefully, are back and acceptable, we'll be able to give you a, um, a more clear estimate. Thank you, Chief. And if I could just add, you know, I think part of the conversation was we want to make sure that we understand the full picture rather than moving forward with some of the information at this time so the council can make a... Um, knows exactly what the costs are going to be for those outstanding items, uh, which is why the direction was at this point in time to wait till we bring everything back in one, one package for council consideration at that time. So with that, uh, happy, the chief is happy to answer any questions or ESI or the design team or finance and purchasing are over there by themselves for some reason. For some reason, maybe they're the wise ones, right? Council, any questions? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. That was that was what I had to present. Sorry. That was one pro. Thank you. Uh, Chris, you probably don't have all the, the specific little details, but if you could just give us a big picture understanding of the increases, um, if, if there's a particular area that, that's causing that increase one over the other, and how that is comparing to other increases being seen on similar size projects in the area. Mr. Mayor, Councilwoman Pro, excellent question. That's exactly why we have ESI here this evening to address that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, it's an excellent question. It's something we've been experiencing, I think, since we last spoke. 
uh, when ESI was here. Um, it's really across the board on all packages, all scopes of work. Um, you know, we, we've seen fluctuations up and down with corrections in the market, um, supply chain issues, obviously fuel cost issues. So there's no real single targeted package that you know, was outstanding. I mean, there's a few that were definitely more than we anticipated being up in the market, but we're working through G Plume discuss identifying value engineering options to identify cost opportunities for the city and the fire department. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Barrett. So I, I'm sorry that you're the guy that's standing in front of me right now. I, and I, you must have drew the, this, the really small straw. Um, but, and I get, I'm in the construction business. I, I get it. But I asked you guys point blank multiple times, same question three times in a row about why you guys were estimating buildings that had the same budget as buildings that were built two years ago. And you guys specifically said, remember, specifically said, don't worry, we got it. You know, we built in contingencies, we're going to be just fine. So you said that you built in a contingency of like what, 10, 15% and now it's 20% above that, and you still don't have all your bids back yet. So um, just to recap on that, um, at the time when we last spoke, yes, we were estimating the fire station. I could even tell you the date. It was July 20th. Yep, July 20th, council meeting, we were here. Um, you know, is mid-COVID. At the time in the market, obviously, we were coming out of COVID. Supply chain issues were starting to relax a little bit. We were getting... Uh, market reports from our trade partners and suppliers that things were projected to settle down. Um, you know, as we also discussed, the crystal ball is kind of broken. It's hard to read at this time in the market. We were projecting at that time things to settle down. Um, obviously, they haven't settled down, and especially in Boise, Meridian, Nampa uh, areas, we're experiencing a large growth of population in the area. Um, so the residential is also affecting you know, the supply chain issues locally. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a really tough year, you know, in construction, but it's, it's not just this single project. It's not just our company. It's sub subcontractors, suppliers, everyone in the area. It's, it's, you know, we're getting weekly price increases and, you know, some, some trades are saying, you know, we're, we can only hold this, this number until Friday, you know, we're getting the bid on Monday. So it's, it's been a really tough, uh, Tough market to project, and we're doing everything we can to ensure that we're we're getting the lowest possible price for the city. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Borden. I, I don't know if I get that. I mean, all of those factors existed last year. I mean, all the pressures, everything was the same, mm -hmm. even worse in some cases. Um, and so I, this is how I took it. I'm not in the business, but. I took it, we have all those factors, all of the tremendous growth, everything's the same. And because of all of that, the estimates were six and a half million, right? So all of those factors you already assumed were present, nothing's changed, but we're off 20%, seven figures. That's, so, that's surprising to me because there's no new element in the last nine months. You have you don't have Texas freezes and, and and things stuck in canals, right? But yeah, it's, so that's a big miss. Yeah, it's, so to reiterate, you know, at the time we obviously were experiencing large um, escalation in the market, but again, communicating with our suppliers and trade partners and trying to project out, you know, the nine months ahead, you know, indications were saying, you know, these. These items are going to relax. You know, we we saw that with with the timber products. You know, they dropped in price, and then you know, recently this spring we saw an uptick in in the timber market again. So, um, you know, some some aspects did did um, tr trickle down, but other ones just kept going up with escalation, and they just did not stop as far as uh, what we were projecting at the time of of actually settling down. They just kept going up. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Perot. I know we're throwing a lot of questions at you, but I really, I really do want to understand as the decision makers, we really need to, to have a good grasp on this. So um, 
you know, first six months of COVID, nobody's working, but there's still some supply that, you know, some overage and supply. And we go through that. And then still no one's working, especially in areas of the country that were really, um, you know, really closing things down, whether they had large populations or they, they had more uh, restrictive rules with COVID. Okay, I get that. Last year, people are back at work, but there's a short um, shortage of labor. Okay, so, but so help me understand how then that actually affects product issues because we're two and a half years or two years, I guess, past this. And we're still not seeing more product coming through yet. People have been back to work for a year. So first it was, you know, nobody's working. Then it was a shortage of labor. Is this a really a labor problem? Is this a problem that now, you know, oil costs have gone up. So everything that's created that's plastic and that uses oil for, uh, for its manufacturing. I mean, I'd still, I'm, I'm just really struggling with that that labor element of it when we, we, things have been back open again now for quite some time. Yeah, it's an excellent question. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of factors that play into the construction market, the material demand. And I think we all could talk about COVID and all the impacts and geopolitical aspects of it. Um, but really just kind of on a high level, spark notes version of it. Um, you know, the construction industry, you know, when COVID shutdowns hit, you know, a lot of suppliers, manufacturing plants shut down um, in projecting that, you know, we're going to be seeing this COVID virus take a large impact in health and community. Um, but as time went on, you know, construction still kept going, growth still happened in the area. You know, our projects stayed open through COVID. We're still pushing through, trying to make sure we're meeting our end dates. Um, and that lag of the shutdown really affected the manufacturing of supplies. Um, we've even had, you know, discussions with siting suppliers where they're, they're simply cutting out, you know, high-end materials and just going with the basic materials because that's, that's all they can keep up with at the time of housing boom going on in the country and locally. So um, it was that lag that really affected the supply chain. And, you know, we're, we're still working through picking up on that and we're starting to see signs that it's getting better, but the growth rate and the labor shortage um, because of that growth rate is really still affecting everything locally. And, you know, we can, we can certainly follow up with a more, you know, in-depth review of, of the market and everything, but just as a high level, those are some key factors. Mr. Mayor. That's one part. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, you're a smart guy for sure. But I don't know if you would ever know the answer like to the global crisis we're experiencing. I, I, I see it in my business too. That's the reason why I asked you these questions a year or two ago because I knew that yep. we'd probably be having this conversation today. But enough about that. I've, so I know one other question I had regarding the bidding process. So I remember that we, at least the last conversation that we had, we were going to bid these projects out separately, including the precinct. Why are we bidding them together? So, excellent question. So, um, from a design standpoint, and we can bring up the city uh, team members as well, um, I believe we received approvals for the project because at the time last summer it was four projects, it was two projects, you know, we didn't know exactly where it was going to go. I think August is when we received that approval and I'd have to check the dates um, to go forth with that. Um, from that approval, the design schedule set it up such that the police and north site were going to be coming after the two fire you know the fire stations are the same design so it's it, you know, a little bit faster to design those together um and we met as a team oops, excuse me as a team met with the mayor to discuss um bid strategy and what would be best with the design stance at that time um, trying to obviously make it on the market earlier um, you know, we always find that bidding early first quarter is the best time to bid. Everyone's trying to build up their backlog. Um, and that's what we're really trying to target um, by getting those two stations, economies of scale, you know, the same station, hopefully better buying power, just looking back at historical. And that was the reason why we, we bid these out prior to the precinct being available with the North site. Right, Mr. Mayor, follow up. That's one part. So I, I, I get that. I mean, I get economies of scale, but I... I I think if I'm remembering correctly, the reason why 
we were wanting them done separately is to find out what the cost was per building per project just in case you know we, we got numbers back that were astronomical completely out of your control not your fault i get it same things happening to me totally get it but the likelihood of that happening was in my opinion was going to be high so if we decide and i'm not this is i'm not i'm not saying we're going to build one or two or five but if we decide what you know in the future hey we just need to do something about this these are too expensive are we in a position where we can figure out okay this is the cost for this building these are the cost for this building these are the cost for this building and this is the cost for this building to be able to for us to be able to make educated decisions smart decisions on behalf of the taxpayers of meridian that's so kind of two-part answer here so we from the beginning we've we've planned to regardless of their bid together or separate we plan to separate each of the projects out from the fire from the police budget from a schedule, right. schedule value standpoint for billing right from different mm -hmm. budgets um concerning being able to do one or more one or two stations uh, we'd have to talk with purchasing and, and and really dig into the state statute and see what options we have available from that standpoint and that that juncture what do you mean dig into the state statute? um so if if you know we bid the two stations together just ensuring that you know if we are to split and say in hypothetical hypothetical i get don't it. like talking no, i get no i just I, I'm, I'm trying to protect you hypothetical yeah hypothetical we would have to you know evaluate with legal subcontractors oh you know, it, it, it's probably not going to be a 50 50 split just from the buying power right we'd have to yeah. discuss and, and research that after Fair enough. mr mayor councilman hogan and moving forward, we know this is a crystal ball and, you know, we hear from home builders who are, you know, they tell their clients, um, here's, here's the price, but you have to cover all the costs that exceed that when, when their supplies come in because they cannot give an actual bid because it changes. Like you said, you can guarantee it on Friday, but come Monday, it's, it's going to change. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out on April 26, all bids are due. And I don't know, this might be a Keith Watts thing or, or someone else, but uh, what happens after that? They have these bids, we have bids, and we will have a price, but it may be that that price is only guaranteed for such a short period of time, and we know the project's going to take way longer than that. Yep, so, so in our planning and discussions as a team, we, you know, I obviously plan out with the city council and bid dates so that we can present the findings from the bid effort, get approval, move forward with the notice proceed. Um, part of our bid package requirements is establishing a bid hold of price for a certain duration out to help protect the city um, you know, from anyone's claiming escalation increases. So that was part of our bid, bid packaging requirements. Mr. Mayor? Councilman Hoagland. Follow up. Um, it, do you think that will be successful or, or are people not willing to bid because of that? I think it's been successful, honestly. Um, I, I, I truly think um, any, any results and numbers is, is truly a function of the market and how much work is available on the streets. And again, back to why we really strive to, to bid earlier in the year than later. I guess one last question. Councilman Hogan. Is, is uh, if you want to dive into the crystal ball again, we know the feds are going to raise interest rates and, and different things are happening down the road. Who knows what's going to happen? Do you want to weigh in on that? But you can plead the fifth. I, I understand. No, no, I, I don't want to read into the crystal ball today. Thank you. <laughs> Smart move. Yeah. Mr. Mayor. Mayor. Oh. Councilman Borton. Oh, go ahead. Councilman Pro. So along those lines of uh, Councilman Hogan's question, are they, uh, are um, these, contractors bidding high with it because they're having to guarantee i mean is that why we're seeing this is there an element of where they are bidding extra high not knowing what's going to happen during the months that they're guaranteeing this i don't believe so i don't it's not specific to this project no i think it's <laughs> it's again it's a market-wide item that they're coordinating with their supplier um, on a week-to-week -week basis and you know in the private sector we're able to procure materials early um, whereas on the Public sector, we you know we have official processes that we have to follow. Mr. Mayor, Councilman Borton. 
So is this bid in a way that lets us pick station seven alone? So again, that's something we would have to talk to legal about and look at the opportunities that we have moving forward. So, and this is, a, I guess these questions for anybody who wants it, we got a crowded room, but so not, if it's not you, certainly pick somebody else. Um, why is that? Well, there was there in, in the, because there was really difficult discussion amongst us and great concern that I had that this exact scenario is exactly what would happen. And I don't think it's a crystal ball. I think you and your crew are pros and have the best ability to provide the most accurate estimate. Yeah. We rely on that. So when you said six, five, that's the best number you can ever provide by somebody who's doing this business daily in this valley. So that's really important to me. But there was great discussion about the re real possibility of station seven could be the singular item built because of this one particular issue. So where did the direction come to not allow us to have that flexibility in light of this real cost concern? So it was a, I would say it's a team effort through the design process of identifying, um, you know, here's where we're at with the design, here's what we're gonna have available for design, what can we bid as a package together to try and get those benefits of a larger package, especially two fire stations that are the same. <clears throat> but who on the team, who says it? I mean, somebody, is it Mary, is it Sue? Who says bid them together? And that's what happens. That's what I'm trying to get at because the opportunity's lost. I don't know. I think you probably have to rebid the whole thing. The direction is let's do station seven. Mm -hmm. Hell, it might be $9 million. Let's do station seven. Yeah. You probably got to rebid the whole thing, don't you? I mean, probably do. I'm not going to. Yeah. I mean, if someone else, wants if I, if I don't, it, you know, if someone, I, it, it, yeah, again, I'm not, I'm just saying I'll anyone here, let's up. just, I told you, buddy, that was that trouble there at work. But. No, no, I, you know, I done a few I, fire I, stations. So I it's feel like that opportunity's lost. And if that's, let's just say it. You that's, can't, that's probably the most likely case. I don't think if we were, if the city was doing a bid and we had two things in one bid number, I don't think legally that we'd be able to separate those yeah i just got the wouldn't think the, the subs bill. could do it what's that i don't know if the subs could do it well yeah, that would be a whole nother yeah. thing to have that conversation with the subs if they'd even be willing to yeah, like you said it wouldn't be a 50 50 because there is an economy of scale that's the the reason for for going out at the same time for everything but i don't i don't believe you could separate it legally i mean at that point, that's when we start getting protests from the guy who was number two that says, well, if I had known that, I could have done this. And that's why the statutes don't allow for that. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. So somebody somewhere said, do them together. I think as a team, you know, we, we all met um, as a collaboration and you know, consulting with the mayor, we, we determined that this was the best course of avenue or option at the time uh the design and the market right. and trying to get the bid so that, process going mr mayor are you okay if we just it'd be quicker just kind of yeah quick and back and forth thank you um okay and that decision group decision came at a cost because we might be a little bit stuck now um so who who is our and maybe it's someone in the room who's our internal city project manager for it i assume it's stacy Stacy. Okay. Um, is how do, how does that relationship work going forward? Is is Stacy in charge of the project manager work for the city? Because there's also great risk in making sure project management is done properly. We've seen that prior fire stations. That's critical. Are you talking on on site construction management from the side project management? Project management from the city's perspective. Um, sorry, I, I don't think I understand the question. If I'm not phrasing that right, whether Chief Bloom or, or Keith, somebody describe how, I mean, that's Stacy's job. I figured she's the one doing it. All right, Mr. Mayor, members, council. Um, so our perspective on this is Stacy acts as our city construction manager mm -hmm. in terms of the go-between with ESI and all of our city processes, primarily administrative 
management, I guess I would refer to it as. So all invoicing goes through her, meetings through her, but as far as actual construction on site, that's the ESI. Yeah, okay. That help? It does. I mean, that, that was a big um, improvement with station six. Yes. Um, having her the top of the food chain here exactly. from the city's perspective is critical. So that's gonna be the structure. She's in charge going forward seven or seven or eight or however this is, that is our intention is Stacy will act as the, the primary source of information for the city. She understands what we need. She understands what they need. Everything flows through her. But as far as the actual construction management piece, ESI controls that because of the, the nature of a GMCG's contract. So good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Council, any additional questions? That this was just, I understand that there was outreach to the department. This was really an intention to let that outreach be here so everyone can hear all the information at the same time about where we were and where things are moving forward at this point in time. But it sounds like, you know, there will be more information coming back, obviously, when we get it, but just want to make sure everyone had the opportunity. Is there, Mr. Mayor? Councilman Borton. Is there any information or perspective from the council? I know we've had meetings and it's all on record that anyone thinks is unclear. Speak now, if there's something that we're not sharing crystal clear. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Appreciate right. it. Thank you, appreciate it. With that council, we've reached the end of our work session. Do I have a motion? Move to adjourn, Mr. Mayor. Motion to adjourn, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay, the ayes have it, we are adjourned.
Council will call the meeting to order for the record. It is Tuesday, April 5th, 2022 at 6.03 p.m. We'll begin tonight's regular city council meeting with roll call attendance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Byrne? Here. Councilwoman Burrow? Here. Councilman Borton? Here. Councilman Hoagland? Here. Mayor Simison? Here. Next time is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'd all please rise and join us in the pledge. <laughs> Next up is the community invocation, which will be tonight delivered by Pastor Troy Drake. If you'd all please uh, join us in the community invocation or take this as a moment of silence and reflection. Pastor? Mayor, council members, join me. Lord God, thank you so much that we can gather here. Uh, just pray for everybody in this building, all the, the business that uh, happens here every day. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help everyone with decisions that are being made all the time here. I know that uh, little details are important to you. And so, Lord, we just uh, appreciate what we have in this great state, in this city, and pray that you protect it. We're thinking about the first responders, our um, police officers and, and firefighters, all those who protect us. I pray that you would protect them as well, and that... Um, Everyone that needs assistance today would get it. Um, Lord, we're uh, um, especially concerned about any of our citizens in need, and I pray that they would find it. This is a constant uh, um, um, you know, trouble uh, in any town. And so I just pray for those who might be afraid or hungry or in need of a warm place, and I just pray that they could find it today. Um, and Lord, of course, I uh, just pray for uh, wisdom here tonight for, um, for these people here, that you bless them, that you give them an extra measure of grace as they attend to the city business. And, and last but not least, Lord, I just would like to pray for the elections coming up and that you would put the right people in the right places, whether it's locally or, or with the, for our state. And um, Lord, I know that you want those who will make good decisions and be wise and, uh, and, uh, and represent the, the voice of the people. So thank you in advance for all these things. And we just pray uh, in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Next item up is the adoption of the agenda. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoagland. Uh, for tonight's agenda, uh, we are gonna move item number one, the proclamation uh, for the state uh, basketball champions to April 12th. So with that change, Mr. Mayor, I move adoption of the agenda as amended. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as amended. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. And the agenda is adopted as amended. There are no items moved from the consent agenda. Mr. Clark, do we have anyone signed up under public forum? Mr. Mayor, there are none. OK. Uh, the first item was removed, so we will move right into our action items this evening. First item up is a public hearing for a community development block grant plan year 2022. We'll open this public hearing with comments from Crystal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, we're here today to talk about the consolidated plan, which is the five year plan for uh, CDBG and uh, we're working on the upcoming five years. Uh, so we're going to go over a basic overview of CDBG. I'm going to be presenting that. And then Don Tolan with West Data School District is going to be talking about homelessness in, the, um, in West Data. And Elizabeth with Resource Consultants will be talking to us about updates on the con plan, the analysis of the built environment, and then I'll go through some important dates and then stand for comments. So first off, Meridian is federal funds. It comes from HUD and the uh, program is designed to promote decent housing, a suitable living environment and expanded economic opportunities for people with low to moderate incomes. Uh, there's four key elements of the CDBG program. First is the consolidated plan, which is the five-year plan that says how we're going to um, identify the needs and the gaps in our community and what goals we're going to address those with. Uh, then we've got our action plan, which is submitted every year, and it talks about the specific projects we're going to be funding. 
and it acts as an application for the funding for the upcoming year. And then there's the project implementation, which is the actual activity that's taking place. And then we have the end of year caper, which is just the report that talks about how we're meeting those goals. Uh, next is the project criteria to meet the basic criteria. It has to fall into these four categories. It has to meet a national goal. There's five of them. One is to provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing, provide a suitable living environment, expand economic opportunities, benefit low to moderate income persons, or aid in the prevention of or elimination of slums or blight. After that, it has to meet one of the national objectives, which is low moderate benefit, slum or blight, and urgent need. And then uh, we have to make sure that it meets one of the um, goals in the con plan and that it's an eligible activity according to HUD's regulations. So to apply for CDBG funds, it has to meet all that criteria and then the application is sent to the scoring committee where they will score it and rank it so that we can see um, if we have the funding to uh, fund all of those. We have two separate um, competitive applications. The first is for public services. That's for things like the Boys and Girls Club scholarships or emergency rental assistance. Uh, that application is open April 1st to April 30th. And there's a cap on that funding that we can put toward public services, which is 15% of the grant. We also have a housing public facility and infrastructure application. On that one, the notice of intent to apply is required because it's a little bit more in depth and it's a lot more funding. And uh, that was open from March 1st to April, or sorry, March 1st to March 15th. And they will be invited to complete the actual application. Uh, it's open April 6th to May 6th. So the consolidated plan, it's really prescriptive and there's six different sections to it. The executive summary is just an introduction and the key points that is in the con plan. The process talks about the, um, the required consultation and the citizen participation process. The needs assessment goes into the affordable housing, special needs housing, community development, and homelessness, the ways that we're going, like what we see in our community and what we're going to do. Market analysis describes the environment that it's going to be administered in. So that would be things like the characteristics of the housing market or lead-based paint hazards. And then there's the strategic plan that talks about the priority needs and how we're going to utilize the funding for the five years. And then finally, the action plan, which is that specific activities that we're going to fund. So there's three additional documents that you guys will see. The first is the analysis of impediments to fair housing, which reviews the housing challenges and fair housing issues. And then there's the analysis of built environment, which talks about the impact of Meridian's built environment on the health of its citizens. And we're going to go into all of these. Elizabeth's going to talk about them quite a bit more. Um, and then we have the citizen participation plan, plan, which documents how we're going to invite the public to be part of the, the process. So I'm going to turn it over to Don now. Thank you. Go down a little lower. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, I was asked to come here and just give you a little um, view of what, it lo what homelessness looks like in the West Ada School District. Um, again, my name is Don Tolan, and I am the Counseling and Social Work Coordinator for the district. So I'll go through just a few things. I know I have very limited time. So I'll try to go quickly. So basically, um, in public schools, we follow McKenney Vento Law, which requires our school districts to keep students in their school of origin to the best um, extent feasible, um, unless the parent says, no, we don't want to, to do that. We want to go somewhere else. We provide transportation to the school of origin. We remove any barriers that we can to enroll um, our homeless youth so we don't ask for those immunization records, um, birth certificates, the other things that most students um, need to try to find and, and to register. And then they immediately qualify for free and reduced lunch and breakfast so they get fed at school right away. Um, so why is there a focus on supporting homeless students in public education? Because research shows students who switch schools frequently score lower on standardized tests. It takes them an average of four to six months to recover academically after each change of school. Um, mobility during high school greatly diminishes the likelihood of graduating from high school. And mobile students can suffer psychologically and socially, and they are more likely not to participate in extracurricular activities um, and you know, find other things to do that get them in, in trouble. Um, so we also um, 
have unaccompanied youth, and these are students who um, have to meet the definition that they're not in the physical custody of a parent or a guardian. And so challenges for the unaccompanied um, youth that we have, transportation is always a huge challenge. Um, academic achievement, so paying bills and expenses and trying to work and pay bills and also go to school. Um, stable housing, income, parental support is a big one. And figuring out next steps, what they're gonna do after high school. And so a snapshot into the West Ada School District and what we have as of right now, 458 students identified as experiencing homelessness. Um, you can see where their um, the zip code is for 195 of these students. We have 115 um, identified as unaccompanied, so not living with a parent or guardian. Um, so 5% of these um, students live in shelters and 82% of them are doubled up, which is um, nationwide is the highest percentage. Usually it's about 70, 75% nationwide. For us, it's 82%, which means they're living with family or friends. And then 6% um, are unsheltered, 7% live in a hotel or motel. And then our special populations of unaccompanied youth um, qualify for special ed um, and EL, ELLs. Um, this is just our ethnic categories of our 458 students identified as homeless. And then the issues we have um, regarding homelessness for our students is one is a big thing, especially in the last year or two, is affordable housing. Um, so with the economy the way it is, it's really hard for them to find a um, reasonable amount of, of rent or, or housing. And with a single parent income, a lot of our homeless students have a single parent. Uh, wages and housing prices, transportation barriers, especially this year with, we had a, a really hard time finding enough staff members to be bus drivers. And so that was a huge challenge for us this year. Um, we don't have homeless shelters, as you know, in the Meridian city limits, and then many losing um, housing due to landlord increases and not being able to pay that rent. Um, I just have a couple little case studies from our social workers that gave us um, a couple different scenarios. We have lots of them, but these are just a few for you. Um, you can read this one, but basically it is, we have our unaccompanied youth, a lot of them are either kicked out of their home or they choose to leave, um, whether that be like an abuse situation or um, some other scenario why they, why they leave. And so um, it's really tough to keep these kids in school and to have um, a post-secondary plan. So our social workers uh, case manage these students and get them um, tutoring services. We try to help them with their FAFSA and any kind of post-secondary um, help that we can do for them. Uh, another scenario we see quite often is uh, maybe a mom and, a, and her son. The son is too old to go into one of the shelters, and so they have a hard time finding um, housing and you know moms that leave domestic violence issues. Um, so finding housing and finding a stable housing and then trying to transport that student to and from school. And a lot of times they're mobile, so once we do get busing set up, they might change to another location. Um, so that is, is a challenge in many cases. Wait just a second to read that. And last one um, is rent, high rent. So being able to stay in that rent, not you know giving a 30 day notice of rent might go up hundreds of dollars, not just like a $25 increase or a $50 increase, it might go up um, so significantly that they, they need to change locations and trying to find that location is, is pretty difficult. So those are um, a lot of the regular case studies that we have with our students, um, ones that kind of stand out more than, than others. I will stand for questions if you have any. Thank you, Council. Any questions for Don? Mayor, council members, I'm Elizabeth McNanny with Resource Consultants, and we are working with the City of Meridian on their five-year consolidated plan, on your five-year consolidated plan. 
We're working closely with Crystal. We're also completing the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice that HUD requires. And one of the things to think about, you know, as we look at and as Don just talked about, in the city of Meridian, homelessness doesn't look like what we see on television. It's not necessarily folks who are camping on the side of the road. I spend, I grew up in Portland, um, and I spend some time there because I have family there, and that is what it looks like there. That's not where I live at this point. And so in the places that I typically live and work, that's not what homelessness looks like. It looks like folks who are qualified for McKinney Vento. It also looks like folks who live in their cars or their RVs or who are doubled up even for short periods of time. Oh. oh. So Meridian residents who are most at risk are renters. So you are predominantly in the city of Meridian, a home ownership model housing community. And if we look at the burden on renters, it is significantly higher. So for homeowners with the most recent information that we have, homeowners who were paying 30% or more than 30%, but less than 50% of their income for their housing costs were about 12.8%. And folks who were paying more than 50% were 6.2%. Renters, on the other hand, who were paying more than 30% up to 50% of their household income were 24.6%. And if we're looking at renters who are paying more than 50% of their household income for housing cost, it's 13.8%. So housing cost burden as a percentage is more than double for renters than it is for homeowners. Possible actions. So, you know, we can look at housing development that supports housing for everyone in the community public services that help to break that cycle. And we can talk more about that if you have questions about that, but you all probably can, you know, have some ideas of what that would look like. Neighborhood investment. So the neighborhoods that are most predominantly renter filled in Meridian, investing in those neighborhoods that your most vulnerable residents live in helps to lift them up. And then working with developers. Developers want something from you. Now, in a lot of states, you can't say 10% has to go to this or 5% to that. But when someone wants something from you, you can want something back. One of the things that we're working on with the city is the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. Now, most folks think of this as dealing with affordable housing, and a lot of them do around the country, and that is not what HUD does with this. It's really looking at historic patterns of segregation and promoting fair housing choice for protected classes. It has nothing to do with housing cost, although <laughs> that can play a part in it. It really is about inclusive communities free of discrimination. And the protected classes are listed there. It really only looks at how the housing market basically plays with the protected classes in the city of Meridian. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Holland. I just want to interrupt real quick on, on that Martin. point, that prior slide. Um, if there's discussion about uh, pros and cons of, of individual ownership versus rentals and sort of the socioeconomic implications of that. Is that also included as a potential impediment for housing if if there's no? No, not unless it affects protected classes. Okay. So only insofar as it would protect, um, you know, folks who have disabilities or are discriminated against due to national origin. Okay. 
Thanks. So really the fundamentals of an AI look at Meridian's policies. So we have met with your planners, building department, um, identifying barriers to fair housing choice. It can have it can have something to do with zoning. So if that was part of your question, then yes, that can come into play with it. And then there's a plan. So every year in the yearly report to HUD about what has happened, you have to say what you've done to address these issues. And so it's really about expanding choices. So it's accomplished by reviewing any, any information that we can find and listing current impediments. They have to be actionable. So it can't be something that is statewide, that the city has nothing you know, that they can actually implement that would address that. It has to be actionable. And a fair housing action plan for the next five years. We are also looking at the built environment, which is all the physical parts of where we live and work. That includes parks, trails, health services, physical activity options and opportunities and transportation. And the Healthy People 2030 update is kind of listed there, what is included in um, the Healthy People update that the CDC is working on. And here's just a quick demographic breakdown for you. Meridian is a relatively young town. So um, obviously, and in comparison, I mean, you are definitely a lot younger than most other towns in the area too. So things that can make a difference. So eligible CDBG projects would be infrastructure. What can you do that affects the built environment? Sidewalks where there aren't sidewalks. Safe opportunities to traverse a neighborhood to get to services. Lights, street lights, lights in parks in eligible areas. Crosswalks, things like that. Community centers public facilities that are in areas where the most vulnerable folks in the city live and utilize, housing rehabilitation, which has been happening with homeowners who are really in need. So there are definitely homeowners who are cost burdened and being able to stay in their homes is very helpful. Public services, which can include rental assistance, rent and utility assistance, and homeownership assistance. These are the current block groups in purple there that are eligible for CDBG funding if you can define a service area that includes those block groups. This is likely to change. You are probably going to lose some of your eligible block groups. So the 2020 census information, it takes HUD a while. They're so much fun. <laughs> it takes them a while to catch up. So they'll use that information and this may change. But this is currently what we're working with as far as eligible block groups. So I think continuing some of the recommendations that you'll see in some of the, in the built environment report for sure is continuing the rehabilitation projects for low and moderate income homeowners within the city of Meridian. Installing sidewalks in areas where that's a critical need for residents. And continuing to update street lighting in eligible areas. You're already doing street lighting projects and continuing to do that in areas of greater need is terrific. And then upgrading community parks in eligible areas. It can include lighting and equipment. 
I think you're already doing some of that. <laughs> and support opportunities for impactful engagement with the community and community centers, park facilities, things like that. And supporting increased opportunities for community gardens. There are some scattered sites throughout the city and in some of those eligible areas that might be ripe for a community garden. And supporting access to public services that improve health outcomes because we know that people who have access to parks and to physical activity and to services have better outcomes and cost less overall um, when they have access to those items. And because nothing ever changes, <laughs> um, being nimble to kind of meet the changes that are coming. I'm going to turn it back over to Crystal. So uh, we just have some important dates coming up. We've got the applications are due, one's due April 30th, one's due May 6th. May 6th. In uh, May, we are going to be scoring and ranking those applications. And then uh, from July, or sorry, June 24th to July 29th, the official public comment period will be open. But we can definitely take comments before that time. Uh, like we'll incorporate any comments that come from this into the plan as well. Uh, June 28th, we're going to give you guys a presentation of the full con plan and all the findings that we have. And July 26th, we'll have a public hearing. And then August 2nd, we'll, we'll ask you guys to adopt the final plan. So this is my contact information. If you would like to reach me or one of these guys, I can forward any information onto them. But you can reach out to me, and uh, I can take any of those comments. And with that, we'll stand for questions. Thank you, Crystal. Council, any questions or comments? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. Thank you. So um, this is very near and dear to my heart being in the housing industry. And um, so a couple of questions. I'll try to phrase them in a way that, that will make sense. There's a lot that gets covered here from transportation to, um, you know, uh, mobility improvements to housing to um so we we talked about the homelessness element and west ada and then we transition to discussing uh community developments like what's happening in our parks and street lights and so i, I want to try to understand the link between those two because the presentation presented a concern and a need but the recommendations weren't to meet those needs that were presented as the challenges with, with homelessness. It was mostly about mobility. So I wanted to see if you, I could get some thoughts on that. And then in addition, as we're going into this open period for applications, has there been any focus, and this may be a question for Crystal, has there been any focus on improvements specifically for um, ADA or wheelchair mobility in Meridian? Do we have any groups that are interested in applications for that? and or anything specific to transportation for specific classes, like uh, I know there's um, some busing for seniors in our area. So have has the city looked into um, those kinds of specific <clears throat> needs that go just one step beyond the general improvements that might be made to a park or to a sidewalk or to streetlights? So as far as the application, I have reached out to organizations that would do that. And for uh, you saw with our notice of intent, uh, we did not have any accessibility projects. Um, I, I did reach out to groups who I thought might be willing to do that. I'm also going to look in the future about how we can do maybe some sidewalk projects. We haven't had anybody applying for those, but uh, maybe there will be a way for the city to be more of a project manager for that. So. We're working toward that, but there are none at this time. Uh, there are some transportation opportunities that I'm hoping you'll see an application in the public services that we can address some transportation. So um, again, it's a competitive application, so I can send it to the people sure. I think are the right people, but uh, I don't always get the applications that I hope for. And, and, address the other. and I'll jump in on the housing question because that's also dear to me. Um, that is the built environment study and the analysis of impediments really don't look at the need for affordable housing, but obviously there is. And that is 
part of where, you know, when I started and talked about who is burdened in the city, as far as cost burdened, and also, you know, some solutions to that, wanting something back, look, you know, thinking outside the box, looking at building partnerships with developers who can bring funding from multiple sources where CDBG can be a small part to help maybe with acquisition or something like that. So you don't want to make, make it too complex and put CDBG in the middle of it. Here's the other lovely thing with HUD, housing and urban development. You can't use CDBG money to build housing. So <laughs> it's just the restriction that HUD has that they've put on this, but there are definitely things and priority needs in every community that, you know, that I'm working with right now. And I know Crystal is actively working with developers to look at, you know, potential housing applications too. I did want to say one more thing on that. You had mentioned that it seemed like it jumped around a little bit, but we, Honestly, we were trying to present a lot of information and not take up a ton of your time. So there was the consolidated plan where we talked about those different aspects, but we didn't really talk about the findings that came out of that. And then we went more into the analysis of the built impediments. And so that's why you heard more there. Mr. Mayor, may I ask one more follow-up question? Councilman Pro. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, the fair housing element, I, I understand fair housing fairly well and have had to study all of the federal history of fair housing. Are, are they having, are they having the city look at that because it is a requirement to receive federal funds? I just, that's, that's interesting to me because even though you, you, you look at the city's, um, you talk to the planning department and look and see if we're complying with fair housing. There's, I don't see the link between that and actual utilization of the funds. So is that just like, hey, you have to be complying with this in order for us to send you the money? Or are they expecting us to use a certain percentage of the funds to meet the concerns that you find in your study? Yes, and yes, and no, and yes. Um, so yes, they are expecting that the items that are found are addressed because they will be actionable. So, and you will have to be reporting on how those are addressed. And, you know, it can be as simple as, do you have a language access plan? And is it HUD compliant? No one has one that's HUD compliant at this point, unless we've been working with them for long enough to write one for them so, or, or help them. So that's all, I mean, there are some standard things that HUD wants you to look at. And it really, again, goes back to protected classes and how do we make, how do we make the process accessible for them? And, because you report on that every year, there is some expectation that you do some fair housing activities. We are running ads um, during fair housing month across the Treasure Valley about fair housing and looking at doing some trainings and things like that. So yes, there is some money, there are some actual resources put towards that. Council, any additional questions? All right, Crystal, because CDBG is confusing, this was listed as a public hearing that I opened. Is this an actual public hearing that you're wanting public comment on this evening? Yes, <laughs> sorry, it is confusing. We have to have a certain number of public hearings. And so uh, we wanted to get some information from the public and their feedback early on in the process so that we could incorporate that in before we actually get to the final draft that we present to you. So we were just trying to do it early on. Okay. And with that, we will open this up for any public comments this evening. Mr. Clark, do we have anybody signed up to provide testimony on this item? Mr. Mayor, we do. And I have probably will apologize. I apologize, I'll pronounce your name wrong, Ra Ralph Chappell. Council, to my knowledge, this may be a first. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. If you, all right, if you can say your name and address for the record. You. All right. But you got it right there, Chris. Okay. I've been coming to these meetings since 2006. I don't know how many times they've been up here with this HUD thing. 
And every time I get disappointed because you approve it. Now, year after year, now what I want to find out is what the mindset is of this council. What has this city done to earn this money? It all comes out of Uncle Sam's pocket. And it's all one big budget. Who's going to pay for it? Your kids, your kids, my kids, grandkids. You aren't going to pay for it. So you can put some sidewalks in or you can put some lights out somewhere. Why doesn't the city just do that? They make enough money they can do it. They don't have to go to the federal government for it. Then the other thing is, question comes up, well, if we don't take it, the next city will. Let them take it. But at least we aren't contributing to this national budget. And, uh, but like I said, if you approve this, your kids and grandkids are gonna, and if you're happy with putting that burden on them, then I suppose you're gonna go ahead and say yes. And it'll be a rubber stamp like it has been for years and years. And another thing is somebody has to administer this program. And if I can recall the numbers from previous times, it's tens of thousands of dollars for one person to do all this. Why? Well, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you, Ralph. Council, any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, this is a public hearing. If there's anybody else that would like to provide testimony on this item, if you'd like to come forward at this time, or if we have anybody online that would like to provide testimony, you can use the raise your hand feature on Zoom and we can bring you in for any comments. Seeing no one else wishes to testify, Crystal, do you have any final comments? Okay. Then with that, Council Mr. Mayor, Councilman Borden, I'll just give a brief, just a brief comment. Um, I think for the big picture, um, what we recognize is that there's need in, in uh, the low and moderate income categories in our community, and as our community's grown, that need grows, and it might be convenient or easy to ignore it and what i appreciate about this program and crystal's work in particular is you shine a light on that and remind us that we do have an obligation to those citizens as well in our community and i think that this program when administered properly does help us serve in some small fashion um, that segment of our community so um, i think we keep a watchful eye on it we do this all in the public um, but i'm proud of crystal and the work that you do and uh, that the need that this program serves. So I think it's an important part of our growing community. So thank you for that. Council, any additional comments? Or do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Mr. Mayor, I don't think the public hearing closes for our future public hearings. Is that correct, Crystal? So is it going to stay open until July? That's what I th thought. Right. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoglund. I move that we close the public hearing for this phase of the Community Development Block Grant Plan Year 2022. Second. I have a motion second to close the public hearing. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Yeah, it's having the public hearing is closed. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing for a proposed summer 2022 fee schedule of the Meridian Parks and Recreation Department. Mr. White. Mr. Mayor, members of council, thanks for having me tonight. In front of you, the first set of fees I'll be here to present is, like Mr. Mayor just said, the 02 or 2022 Summer Activity Guide uh, fees. These fees are set by the instructors as well as some of our staff in regards to the 70-30 split between us and the instructors, as well as our current cost recovery philosophy that we have adopted for our um, recreational programs. With that, I will stand for questions. Thank you, Garrett. Council, any questions for staff? Okay. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. Mr. Corky, do we have any sign up on this item? Mr. Mayor, we did not. 
If there's anybody that'd like to provide testimony on this item, either online, raise your hand or in person, you can come forward at this time. Seeing no one, Garrett, any final words? Or do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Holman. Move that we close the public hearing for the proposed summer 2022 fee schedule for the Meridian Parks and Recreation Department. I have a motion and a second to close the public hearing for the 20, summer 2022 fee schedule. Is there a discussion? If not, I'm favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the public hearing is closed. Next time on the agenda is item four, resolution number 22 2318. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Holman. Move we adopt resolution number 22-2318 for the uh, summer 2022 fee schedule for the Meridian Parks and Recreation Department. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 22-2318. Is there any discussion? If not, Kirk, call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Burn? Aye. Perot? Aye. Borton? Aye. Hoagland? Aye. All eyes, motion carries and resolution is agreed to. Item number five is public hearing for Meridian Parks and Recreation Department 2022 pool fees, Mr. White. All right, it's me again, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Council. Thanks for having me up here again. Uh, in front of you are the Meridian pool fees we um, hope to establish this year. Um, as you guys all know, um, Ward has prov provided swim, public swim, swim lessons, and just a, a public place to swim for many, many years. Um, these fees are the fees that Ward had adopted and planning on taking on the 2022 season but it turns out that we have an agreement now that we get to oversee and maintain the facility and operations. So this, these fees in front of you are what Ward had already planned on using, and we're hopeful to use the same fees pending your guys' approval. So with that, I will stand for questions as well. Thank you, Garrett. Council, questions for staff? Mr. Mayor. Council on Pro. Thanks for being here, Garrett. So when is the official opening uh, for the season? Has that been decided yet? Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pro, yes, right now the tentative day for open for public swim and opening of swim lessons will be June 6th, that Monday. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoagland. Uh, Garrett, I assume that uh, you guys have taken into account you know, changes in wage structures and whatnot. And so when you have private parties, you have to cover that. Those, those are, Ward has done a good job of looking at that as well. And you guys followed up. So we're, we're covered in that area. Mr. Mayor, Councilman Hoagland, yeah, that's one of the questions I asked Ward in the negotiation, taking over the agreement was, what was the plan for wages and things? And yes, wages have increased, don't get me wrong. So um, this first year, um, we have raised some of the wages, although if you know anybody that wants a lifeguard, we'd love to have them apply. We're still a little short. Um, but yes, we did factor some of that stuff in. Council, any additional questions for staff? Okay, thank you. Mr. Clark, do we have anybody sign up on this item? Mr. Mayor, we did not. Okay, is there anyone present or online who would like to provide testimony on this item? Mr. Mayor. Uh, one second, we, I see. Uh, if you're online, you'd like to provide testimony, you can use the raise your hand feature. Just give a second, I see we have a, a representative from Western Data Recreation District, just want to give them an opportunity if they had a desire. Okay, seeing none, Councilman Holman. Or Mr. Garrett, no final call. Okay, Councilman. That we close a public hearing for Meridian Parks and Recreation Department's 2022 pool fees. Second. I have a motion and a second to uh, close the public hearing for the Meridian Parks and Recreation pool fees. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the public hearing is closed. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hogan. I move we adopt resolution number 22-2319 of the new fees for the Meridian Parks and Recreation Department uh, pool. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve adopt resolution number 22-2319. Is there any discussion? If not, clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Byrne? Aye. Perot? Aye. Borton? Aye. Hoagland? Aye. All eyes, motion carries, and the resolutions are agreed to. Thank you, Garrett. I also will move on to item seven, which is a public hearing continued from March 15, 2022 for Friendship Subdivision H2021-0083. Uh, we will continue this public hearing with staff comments from Alan. 
Greetings, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, all on Tiefenbach, planning with Meridian. Uh, so this was an annexation and zoning to R8 and a preliminary plat for 38 lots. It originally was uh, 41, so I'm a planning commission. Now we're at 38. Uh, just a, a quick little primer. The property is located south of Chinden and west of Locust Grove. There's the Burkdell State Subdivision to the west, the High Tower Subdivision to the east, Saguaro Canyon Subdivision to the south. And there's an existing church on RUT property in the county directly to the north and adjacent to this property. This was an annexation of just about 10 acres of land with the R8 zoning district, and it was a preliminary plot for 38 building lots. Again, it was 41 originally. Uh, so the, at the, uh, on February 15th, the Meridian City Council heard this item. At this public hearing, the council continued this case. Uh, they were mostly favorable towards it, and they continued it until March 15th. Uh, they wanted the applicant to reduce the subdivision to 38 lots, and they asked them to return with an updated plat and requested staff to draft a development agreement and the conditions of approval. On March 14th, which was the day before when this was supposed to come back to you, staff received a phone call from a neighbor that the required posting had not occurred along East Lockhart Street. After a, consultation, after a consultation with the city attorney, this case was continued until today for, for the proper posting to occur, which it did. Uh, with that, I'll stand for any questions if you have any. Thank you. Council, any questions for staff? Okay. Seeing none, would the applicant like to come forward? Mr. Mayor. As one pro. Before the applicant presents, I just wanted to state that I wasn't here for the last meeting. However, I did view it. Uh, by video and I've read everything in the project folder. So I feel like I'm prepared to be involved in the um, decision making this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mayor, members of the council. My name is Joe Canny. I'm with Century and Engineers at 2323 South Vista Avenue, Suite 206 in Boise. And I'm here with the applicant regarding this project. Um, I don't really want to rehash anything. Um, there was a posting error. That's why we're back tonight for a public hearing. Um, I think a uh, presentation was done back in February, what the project is. We made some modifications based on um, suggestions and that's the plat that's before you tonight. So um, really, I just stand for any questions. Thank you. Council, any questions for the applicant? Okay, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. I don't have any questions, but since I wasn't present at the February meeting, I wanted to share some thoughts with you. Um, first, I wanna say, I looked through and every reiteration that you had done since you started, which has been many. And I wanna say thank you very much for how you've listened to the commission and to council on all the different um, suggestions and um, modifications that were made. It looks like you've gone to great lengths to do that. Um, had I been here, I would have said that I thought the um, that property in the south, the properties in the southwest, the three what are currently now the three lots, I feel like the original design was okay. I don't know what the neighbors to the south um, thought, you know, or or if you had any interaction with neighbors to the south or any concerns. But we're here now, so uh, just want to say thank you very much for working on this. I know it's it's been a, a really big um, concern, um, and as many many meetings have been had on it. So the question I have for you, however, after stating that is, uh, in the past, we've had the police department tell us that they're not a fan of putting common areas between backyards and um, subdivision boundaries for safety issues. So are, is the fencing that's gonna be going in on the backs of these um, lots going to be open? And is there going to be closed fencing surrounding the subdivision or help us understand because we, we don't want uh, closed fencing there on the east. Um, on the north, it's, I suppose it's possible the church could put in some privacy fencing. And then now we have a, a concern where, where um, there might be some safety problems with, with you know, not being able to see out of those walking areas. Uh, yes, Mayor, Council Member. Um, I'll probably have to bring Mike up to talk about the fencing specifics. 
It is, it is worthy to say though, that that open space along the north property line is because of a canal relocation. So it needs to be in a, a common area. That's the best way to serve that property. Um, also, it's against the church property. We really thought it wasn't a, a bad place at all for a, for a common strip. It would be visible from the stub road to the church, looking back to the west. It would also be visible from the east-west uh, road that's uh, uh, entering off the west side. You could look down that side. Probably not perfectly ideal, but considering the location of the canal, it's it's really the best we could do. I'll bring Mike up if you have questions on the fencing. And Mike, if you can say your name and address for the record. Mike Coleman, 6820 West Randolph Drive, Boise, Idaho. So what, what was your question again? I'm sorry, I didn't. Mr. Mayor. That's one pro. Thank you. So our police department has frequently advised us that they would rather not have uh, two sets of privacy fencing and then creating a walkway in between the two. And so in, in past applications, they've recommended that there be uh, open fencing on the lot um, on the lot boundary or open fencing on the subdivision boundary. So I would imagine the subdivision to the east of this probably has some privacy fencing already there. Right. And so if you put up, if, if the, the lot owners are then permitted to put up privacy fencing on their lots, now you have a walkway that's completely blocked from line of sight. And so the, our police department has multiple times recommended that, that we have that conversation with developers at, at our public hearings. Um, we were kind of, leaving it up to the individual lot owners to, to deal with the fencing. Um, some people have dogs and so, you know, they don't want any fence. Um, that would be something that- uh, Mr. Holman, can you get closer to the mic? Um, what I was saying is that uh, we usually, you know, let the individual home owner, you know, decide what kind of fencing, if any, that they want, so. Um, maybe that's something that we could take a look at. Um, the to the the church is not fenced, so uh, we wouldn't have any problems there. And um, maybe some kind of a, a fence that you could see through or something like a three rail fence or something. But we would work with you on that, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. Thank you very much. That that would be. A preference if the fencing uh, is is see through if if there's going to be privacy fencing on the subdivision boundary, the church could still put up fencing on their side. So we can't assume that they wouldn't, uh, especially if it sells to someone else. So I don't know what my fellow council members' thoughts are on that. I'm curious to hear our staff's thoughts. If Alan has any, um, if there was any, if that discussion was had at all uh, as part of the prior planning process. Council Person Pro, members of the commission. Um, we hadn't had that discussion. When, when, if, if there's not a, if fencing isn't shown on the landscape plan, then we would fall back to the code. And the way the code basically reads, it says in any common open areas or anything like that, it has to be open style fencing. You can't put up solid fencing that to, so, so SEPTED is already built into our regulations. Mr. Mayor. That's one pro. So in this situation, that would mean that the fencing that's on the the uh, in the backyards of those lots would have to be open if the if the boundary subdivision boundary has privacy fencing already installed. No, um, maybe I didn't understand your question. You're talking about the fences along on the eastern property line. Yes, there's already privacy fencing on in that subdivision there on that side. No, there's nothing that prohibits that you can't have another solid fencing. Solid fencing isn't allowed along like um, open areas, um, common open spaces, those kinds of things. But yes, you can, have a, you can have a solid fence up against another fence. Mr. Mayor. That's one pro. It's not what I'm asking, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm not understanding the question. So, so there's the common area has a pathway between the lot, the lot boundaries and the subdivision boundary. Right, on the north and east side. Correct. Okay, so one of those fences has to be open fencing. 
Okay, I understand what you're saying. Is that so, correct? Yes. So so you cannot have a solid fence on either side of a pathway. One, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. One side has to be open, the other side can be solid, but you cannot have two solid fences on either side of a common area or a trail. I wanted to make sure the applicant understood that um, because I didn't hear that as a part of the conversation in the prior public hearing. That would come in front of you during the final plat. The, um, when the final plat came in front of you, if there was an issue with that, we would review the fencing and make sure that that was the case. Council, any additional questions for the applicant? Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Clark, should we have one sign up to provide testimony on this item? Mr. Mayor, we do. First is Marvin Montoya. When your name is called up, you'd like to come forward and state your name and address for the record and be recognized for three minutes. My name is Marvin Montoya. My address is 484 East Lockhart Lane in Brookdale subdivision. And my first uh, comment is more of a question. Uh, you were talking about signage. I came today prepared to talk with the Planning and Zoning Commission because that's what your signage stated. And then I get here and it's not the Planning and Zoning Commission, it's the City Council. So I'm kind of bewildered as to, you know, the procedurally what's going on here. That's my first comment. And with all due respect, if I could get an answer on that. Mr. Neary? Yes, Mr. Members of Council. So they did realize last week that they had, they had changed the date and time of the hearing, which is what the ordinance requires. They didn't change the body that was hearing it, which the ordinance doesn't mandate has to be corrected. So I allowed them to go forward because again, you're here because that's the notice for this hearing right now. So that was the only hearing that was reset to was here. So. Well, I was here specifically to uh, talk to the planning and zoning commission since that's what your notice stated. I mean, either you have a notice that's correct or it's not. Uh, and the, my other question was, has this actually been put forward with the Planning and Zoning Commission? And if so, what were their thoughts or recommendations? I think these are legitimate questions. So, so Mr. Mayor, I can answer this one question. The, 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 the notice is not defective. So you're here, you have notice of this meeting, you have the opportunity to, to have your time to say what you want. It was heard by the Planning and Zoning Commission. So, so what was the decision then on Planning and Zoning Commission? Well, if you would like to finish your three minutes, then we can have SAP respond to those well, questions. Okay. Any other questions you may have as well? Yeah, first of all, I'm just trying to understand the procedures here and trying to follow the procedures. So that's why I had those questions uh, up front. Uh, I'm here basically in opposed to this uh, R8 zoning in this particular area because of the fact that it does not fit in with the general aestheticness of the, of the adjacent neighborhoods. Uh, the amount of housing that they're planning on putting on postage stamp lots is totally out of character for that whole area. And I don't understand why that would be approved. Uh, the other thing is, I will comment that uh, I was informed by uh, some of my neighbors that did attend the last Planning and Zoning Commission meeting that they were against an R8. I was not there because I was out of town. And that's the reason I was asking up front, what was their recommendations? Was it an R4 or an R8? But anyway, I am against that development going in there, again, for the reasons stated. Is my time up? Is that? It, it is. And that's why I want to get you get your comments out. Then we could have SAP report. Well, yeah. I, again, I didn't know the procedure. That's why I was trying to find out what is a procedure. Okay. Uh, Alan, can you, would you mind giving the disposition? Uh, yeah. Mr. Zoning. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Alan T. from Mark Planner. The plan, this did go in front of the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission recommended denial on this case. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Yep. Council, um, sir, I think there may be a question from Council One Pro. Council One Pro. Thank you. I apologize. I, and first of all, I should have addressed Mr. Mayor and the council. This is my first time, so no worries. Uh, sorry about that. You're, you're totally fine. Thank you for being here. So just wanted to clarify, the Planning and Zoning Commission is a group of volunteers that get together and discuss, and then they make recommendations to us, the city council. So we're the final decision making on this, and we do take their thoughts uh, and concerns into consideration, but we will be deliberating on this just the same as the, the Planning Commission is. So 
just to let you know, that's, that's kind of the structure of how things are done. So I, I, what I heard you saying was that there was concern the planning commission possibly hadn't uh, looked at this or that maybe they had some authority that is, is different from, uh, uh, from councils, but we're the, we're the ultimate decision-making body in this regard. So we've taken a look at, at everything that they have uh, presented to us as far as there's concern. So I wanted to let you know that. Okay. Also, I wanted to point out really quickly that um, the, the newest plat that was just presented, which is why we're here this evening after the, the hearing in February, they've lined up the lot lines on all surrounding sides with the neighboring um, uh, subdivisions. So if you hadn't had a chance to look at their newest design for the subdivision, that may be where some of that confusion came in with how it's fitting into the neighborhood. Well, I don't think there's any confusion. It's uh, you're putting in uh, small homes on very small lots, and that is not in keeping with the character of the general area. That's my concern. Thank you. Thank you. Council, any additional questions? All right. Nope, you're good. Thank you. I apologize again. Any other questions? We're good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for your time. Mr. Mayor, next is Corey. I just want to add very quickly, I'm not against development. Okay, I'm just against overdevelopment. Mr. Mayor, Corey Bowman. Welcome, Mr. Bowman. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good. This is also my first uh, city council meeting, so uh, please bear with me. Uh, Corey Bowman, I live at 535 East Lockhart Lane, so I would be the property immediately to the west of the development. Um, let me say, I'm not against development either at all. I just am against the R8 zoning um, for the reasons that uh, uh, Mr. Montoya um, just said. So I wanted to make a point. Um, I attended the planning zoning meeting back on January the 6th, and I would encourage you to go watch that because every single member of that volunteer committee was against uh, this project in its then current form. Uh, the, the things that were said, and if you watch it, there was quite a few comments made. Lack of common area, open space, lack of amenities, those were, I would say, the two primary concerns. Um, one council member said, it looks like this proposal was done, and I'm quoting, it looks like this proposal was done to maximize investment with little regard for open space or the surrounding neighborhoods, um, which, of course, I agree with completely. There has been zero discussion with any of the neighbors that I'm aware of, either in our little neighborhood called Burkdale or in Segoro Canyon, or on the other side, I'm not sure what that one's called. Um, there's just, there's been no communication. Um, so I wanna make that point too. So you might say, well, why are we here? Why are we here then if, if planning and zoning killed it? Um, Mr. Hammond stood in front of the committee and basically begged. Um, and, and they said, look, we're not going to approve this like this. And he said, look, I've got these financial contracts. I've got these obligations. You know, I have to have an answer. And so the chairwoman finally said, well, look, we're not gonna approve this as, we would approve this as R4 because it is in, it's more consistent with all the neighborhood around and the wishes of every single neighbor on the three sides, okay? And he said, no, I, got, I can't wait. I gotta take it directly to the commission and here we are. So I would, I think my request here is that we, send this back to planning and zoning so that they can see the revisions, so they can see uh, and, and hopefully have their concerns uh, with this mitigated. Um, because there's, there's, a, there's a lot of folks that live in Segoro Canyon, there's a lot of folks that live in Burkdale, um, and we wanna make sure that this is right for, for everybody, okay? So I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, council, any questions? Mr. Mayor, next is Rob Scarrett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. My name is Rob Scarrett, live at 6075 North Claret Cupway, Meridian, Idaho. Also a first timer, uh, member of the Burkdale subdivision. Uh, 
hard act to follow those two guys. But anyways, I just got a couple things. Uh, I want to kind of hit what Corey said that uh, we kind of feel left out. We really never had any uh, meetings per se with a developer. Um, we, we live in the R2 neighborhood uh, right on the, uh, the west side of this subdivision. Uh, traffic is going to be a huge concern, which I don't even think has been, been addressed. Uh, Claret Cupway starts the last stop sign on Claret Cupway going northbound is, I think it's a Segundo Street, and that's going to shoot right through our neighborhood till the cars turn on Lockhart and go right in that way. Uh, speed limit is 25. Um, I live on Claret Cup, and uh, cars usually blast through there because they're lost. They think they can get out on Lockhart. They're going about 40 miles an hour. Right now, we have about 45 kids that live in the Burkdale subdivision. And our pool is on the southwest corner of Rio Clinas and Claret Cup. The kids have to cross the street there. I have kids. Everybody else has kids. It's going to be coming up talking to you guys. So my major concern is the RH zoning is going to increase a lot of traffic. Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, in favor of the R8. The R4, I am in favor of, but things got to be done correctly. There's a lot of, uh, I like things to be safe. There is a lot of kids, like I said, and our play areas over there, our pools over there, and I'm really worried about kids crossing the street. With our R2 that we're in right now, it's an open area. The kids think they can go outside and play, but with the impact of traffic, uh, we need to slow it down. So I would like to ask help on that thought and consideration and maybe getting together and talking about that to slow the traffic down. That's what I'll have for that. Thank, thank you. Council, any questions? And that the four-way stop I'd be talking about be at Rio Cleanest and Claret Cup there, just to slow the traffic down on that northbound area. And I'm sure all the other neighbors, they're worried about traffic as well, but thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, we have Mike Holman signed in. Mike Coleman, 6820 West Randolph Drive, Boise, Idaho, 83709. Uh, we had a neighborhood meeting and met with the neighbors. We listened to planning and zoning's concerns. We had a meeting and, and a neighborhood meeting and met with the neighbors. Then with planning and zoning, we took all their comments and to, we dropped two lots to the south, which now those lots are over 100 feet. Uh, wide and to line up the uh, lot sizes then to the um, east is an r8 zone we matched the lot lines up there then to the north we have a church and um, you know in the future if that's not a church it could be multifamily or something like that and then we pretty much matched the lots to the west and then on the common area, we uh, put more common area in. We stepped up the amenities. Uh, we put a bocce court. Uh, we put a walking path around the perimeter. This was a difficult infill piece of property. We had a big uh, 36 inch pipe ditch that needs to run through it. So we were able to move it to the exterior and, and have it work as a path too. So I just wanna let you know, we've made it put a lot of effort into this development to uh, make it work. And it's a difficult site being an infill, but that's the only thing I wanted to add to it. Okay. Thank questions. you. Council, I assume you've seen questions for applicant closing. Okay. Mr. Mayor, next is Mark Cleverly. Mr. Mayor, council members, it's not my first time. I wish it was, but um, I wanted to stand and, and Mark, I- Mark, I wasn't, your name and address for Oh, that. sorry, Mark Cleverly, 528 East Rio Colinas Court, Meridian, Idaho. So I also live just to the west of the property. Um, I wasn't planning on being here, but feel like I need to. So I also, I developed Burkdale Estates, which is right next door. And I understand infill, 
We also had a lot of issues with infill um, when we developed the 10 acres right next door. Um, and I will tell you, we had a lot of issues, uh, but we also went and met with most of the neighbors and got their input. We did have a Zoom call with Mike, probably uh, it was several months ago, maybe even a year ago. Um, and Mike didn't really listen to us. He says he did, but he didn't listen to the thoughts that we had, the concerns we had. Our concerns are we want R2, R4 in this, in this area. Um, we believe in Meridian. We believe that this needs to be consistent with what has been approved over in this area already. Sure, there's R8 right next door, but there's also R4, there's also R2. Uh, majority of it, I would say most of it. And I would welcome the opportunity to meet with Mr. Homan as a neighbor and as a resident of Meridian for a long time and give him my thoughts and give him my input and try to help him in his development. Um, I just think uh, you need, I would love for you guys to listen to the neighbors, the residents of Meridian and not uh, the developer from Boise. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Council, any questions? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoffman. Real quick, do you know what the density is down to right now with the changes that, that have been made? How many dwelling units per acre? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, you, I, I'm looking at this for the first time. One of my issues is, is there's a home that's consistent, that's there right now uh, that takes a lot of the land. Um, you look at the posted size stamp lots right there. There's a, there's a few in the bottom, it looks like, that I would love to see more of those that are on the south side. You look up north and on the east side, and I just, I can't, I can't get behind that. I can't, I don't like those those small tiny lots. I would love to see more of those those lots on the south side. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pearl. Uh, Councilman Hoagland, go, do you wanna keep asking? Um, the, did you have an opportunity to share your thoughts during our comp plan process a couple of years ago when, when that was designated as a future R8 location? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Just curious if any of, I don't know what, when your development uh, was completed. I just didn't know if, if. Yeah, Burkdale was done probably six years ago. Okay. okay. Uh, I believe the gross density is currently four now. That's any additional questions. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Mayor, next is Shane Kenworthy. Your name and address for the record, please. Shane Kenworthy, 443 East Lockhart Lane, Meridian. Uh, I'm a first timer as well, Mr. Mayor, council members. You know, I've attended the zoning meeting. I attended the last board meetings. I'm here again tonight. I have yet to hear anyone other than the developer in favor of this plant. So I'd love, I'm very pro-development. I would love to be the first one to stand up in front of you and say, I support this. I have several concerns. One, you've heard my neighbors, you've heard both in Seguro and Burkdale raise concerns about the density. I do understand that there's been some reduction. One of the questions I guess I have for you guys is if that one acre lot that's in there now is sold, what happens? Can they rezone, if it's R8, can they take that one acre and make it into eight different lots? That significantly changes how our neighborhood looks. The second concern I have is watching the quality and the interactions that the developer has had with the neighbors with, or the lack of involvement with the neighbors. I know he met with Mark. I was not aware of that notice. I, most of my other neighbors were not. Um, we were not part of that Zoom call. Um, watching the back and forth, the signs weren't up, the neighborhoods weren't up. He didn't listen to recommendations from other groups and he keeps having to come back. It makes me seriously worried about the quality of the development that's gonna go in there and what I'm gonna have in my neighbor for as neighbors, not, not the people, but the quality of the development. 
And then the last point is I am worried about the traffic. Um, I think in the previous meeting, you guys mentioned that the, I mean, I forget what the name of the road is that goes out to Chinden. It's gonna be a right turn only. So living on Lockhart, I expect that all of the traffic in the neighborhood that has to turn left is gonna go through Lockhart out to Meridian because they can go left. And I'm extremely worried about that traffic, especially with my kids and my neighbors. Thank you, Council. Any questions, Mr. Mayor? Councilman Pearl. I just want to make sure I'm I'm hearing correctly, and I assume that uh, all the testimony so far is pretty similar. So it's not so much the the look of the denser housing because the densest part is going to be on the east and the north, which is not on the west side. It, it's traffic concerns and. Um, and quality concerns, which which council has no control over the yeah. quality concern per se. So can you help clarify? Because I, I understand when when folks come before us and they say we have concerns about density, we having you elaborate is really helpful because everybody has a different understanding of what density is or how it might affect affect them. So if you look at sorry, if you look at Lockhart Lane right here near the top, when I look out my window, I am going to see all the postage stamps homes right there on the north side. Right, that's pretty dense. Yes, the, there's that one acre lot next to um, uh, Mr. Bowman's house um, that is, is still gonna be there that lowers the density quite a bit, but you still have a very high density on that north side that that's, that's what my neighbors and I are gonna be looking at, as well as the traffic and those concerns. <coughs> yeah, if I could, you guys could help me understand what happens with that one acre lot that sells. I'd appreciate it. Bill or Alan? Uh, Alan T. from Bach. Um, so there'll be a development agreement. This will be a plat. The, exactly what is approved here is what can be done. Uh, the only way that you would be able to subdivide that lot would be to come back in front of you for a public hearing. Mr. Mayor, that was the final sign up in advance. Okay. If there's anybody else present that'd like to provide testimony on this item, either online or in person, if you'd like to either come forward at this time or use the raise your hand feature on Zoom. And I'm not seeing anybody on Zoom, so. Once again, I just uh, had one more question, uh, and this I think might this might be uh, Alan's question. I was just reading through the agenda, page four of the agenda, on the notification process, and it says specifically that uh, mailing notifications must be mailed out to all properties within three hundred feet. The City of Meridian uh, rule, I don't know, rule. That's a bad bad choice of words. Is five hundred feet. Well, and why does that say that on page four in the agenda that says the mailing notification must be a 300 foot radius? The city reading requires 500 feet. Just a final question. Thank you. Let me double check, but it was 500. And if that's in there, then that was just clearly a typo. Well, if you look at the other agendas, they also say 300 feet. Go down to another agenda of another thing that's going to be happening today. It says 300 as well. Okay, let me take a look at the staff report here. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, can you confirm? I, I'm not we, sure what agenda we're referring to. The agenda is three pages, so I'm not sure what. I, I don't think we're talking about with the published agenda. I think we're looking at a different document that Alan. Oh, yeah, at. it's, it's I, I, Alan T. Mike. I, I, I understand what he's saying. The, the table on the staff report still says 300 feet because that's what it was. It hasn't been changed. That's a that's a typo. 500 feet was mailed. Okay, but it's it's on every other one as well. So if it's a typo on that one, so it's a typo on everything. I don't know how. Just again, it's a template. It should have been changed. We'll we'll change the template, but the 500 feet every home within every property within 500 feet was mailed. Can you prove that? Yes, we can. Uh, actually, yes, I could. I've got a. a Excel a spreadsheet and a map, and this is all provided to the city attorney. Just want to make sure things are done correctly. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anybody that would like to provide public testimony on this item? 
then I'll invite the applicant to come up for final comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Joe Canning again. Um, just a few summary comments. Um, it's already been pointed out that the comp plan for this area is R8. Um, our density is actually very close to R4. Um, I think that's important to point out. And I think that a lot of that's because we've tried to incorporate transition lots um, to kind of match higher density in the Northeast as you head to the west and the south and the density becomes less and that's because of the adjoining developments. Um, there was a comment on traffic. Um, this is an unusual site. There's actually three stub streets that are available to it. A lot of times we don't have that much to work with. So uh, that's actually a, an unusual situation. Uh, this project is gonna generate, um, what, 350 vehicle trips per day, somewhere in that range. Um, over a three stub street uh, into the property, that's uh, fairly low use um, for, for those adjoining roads. And I just wanted to point out that uh, the comp plan to the north for the church property is a much more intense um, projection for that, that land. Uh, we wouldn't be surprised if that redeveloped at some point in time or developed in the rear. And that would probably come in as an R15 or higher with commercial probably on the front. So I think, I think from a land use perspective, this project makes sense. It's a good transition fit to the property to the east. It's a good, a good fit to the property to the south. It's really a good fit to the property to the west. And it will be, I think, a good fit to the property to the north when it develops. Um, really, that's all, all I really have to say. I'd be more than happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Council, any questions for the applicant? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hovland. I had a question for Alan. I just wanted to follow up on that uh, to see if we're still at the uh, 4.1 dwelling units per acre on this development. <laughs> I do remember that discussion with the applicant, you know, why don't you go for R4 at that point? And he didn't want to do that, but I, I would certainly defer to the applicant. I was actually just, I'm going to kind of come around your question in a different way. I was actually just filling around and doing some preliminary math while this whole discussion was taking place. The R4 requires 8,000 square foot. That's the minimum lot size. Um, if, if you were to require 15% uh, open space, which is what is required under R4, or, um, take 10, uh, 10 acres, subtract 1.5, that's roughly 15%, divided by 8,000, that roughly comes up to be about 45. Now that's leaving aside uh, roads and all that stuff. But what I'm saying is just using the math um, under, under R4, you could probably actually fit more lots in here. Um, why did the applicant want to go with R8? Probably for the setbacks. Um, I would defer that to the applicant, but uh, under R4, you, you have to have some wider lot sizes and things like that, but you would get a very comparable density as this. Thank you, Alan. We're going to let council, if they want to take further comments, we'll, we'll come back to that. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Borden. Didn't expect that answer, Alan. I thought the dimensional standards that came with an R4 would require several lots to be removed. I mean, your, your street frontage. It's it's uh, that's that's true. It's very it's very difficult for me to just design this on the fly. That would be really would be the limiting factor. Would be the the uh, size of the street frontages, which I just had it open a second ago. Um, I can't I can't I don't want to speculate right now. Yeah, it's it's a physical design issue. But what I'm saying is, just based on pure numbers, 
it, it works out to be very comparable. I think that, and what I said earlier, I think probably the reason why the applicant wanted to go to R8 was probably for the lot frontages, um, but I would defer to him on that. I, I can't design it at my desk on my head. I can just punch some numbers in and look at what the densities are. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. Alan, in that calculation, were you removing the existing home and that, I don't know what the size of that lot is, maybe a half acre or something, an acre, were you removing that from your calculation when you, you started with 10 acres, but did you take out the existing home and um, the size? No, I did not. Mr. Mayor, Council on there, there's one comment I wanted to address, and that's uh, uh, for for infill development. We I, I I don't recall anybody when there's an infill development ever welcoming infill development. They always want something else done. I mean, that's just we've had many, many, many. Uh, we're, we're getting a more mature community where we have infill, and it's it it is always opposition to that. So it's that's. Uh, you know, something that we have to deal with. We have to look at our comp plan. What what was it that uh, we say is a, uh, we want to see our city grow. We want a diversity of housing. Um, you know, it, it. I would love for Meridian, I live in R2. I couldn't afford where I live now. And things have changed because of how our city has grown, price structure has changed. Um, we 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 uh, we want a mix of housing. We want diversity of housing. Young people can't afford what I live in now uh, when they're starting out. But we want nice housing. We want to have open space. We want to have pathways. We put in these standards so that no matter what comes in, it 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 is something that is still very very nice. And uh, uh, that's that's just one of the comments I wanted to say. Also uh, to, to point out that denial by planning and and zoning commission doesn't. Uh, uh, in fact, Commissioner McCarville, uh, I, I went back through the minutes and found it because I remember his comment. Um, he said a denial doesn't mean that you don't have to, a chance to work with it. It gives city council our thoughts and definitely you would have a chance to fix it to move on. And that's what we have quite common. They, if someone gets a denial, they don't want to have a denial going to city council and say, no, we stand, it's going to stay the same. They come to us and say, okay, here's how we changed it. Here's how we fixed it. Do you agree? So that's that's on us to say, okay, is that enough? Does it meet the standards that the city has set out? Does it meet our comp plan? Does it meet transportation requirements and all those things? So uh, I just wanted to speak to those because those were raised that uh, that's that's how the process worked. Everyone talked about this is not, and this is not the business of government, not something you're involved with every day, but uh, just to give you the lay of the land of what we deal with on, our, on a regular basis, that uh, it's, it's not unusual for us to have these types of things come and have everyone opposed and, and except for the developer and, and uh, uh, to have, uh, have things moved around and changed to fit better with what they've heard, so. Yes, Alan. Just to answer Mr. Borden's question, the, the density coming in here was 4.1. Where we're at right now is 3.58. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. I appreciate Councilman Hoagland sharing that. I was thinking along the same lines and in regard to infill projects. So thank you for that. Um, I, I'm kind of sitting here trying to balance what we've heard this evening with what the applicant has presented. And um, I'm struggling a little bit because we typically have two neighborhood meetings, which is my understanding that those happened, or we should have record of those. Um, there's a, a planning and zoning meeting and there's been two city council meetings. So there's been plenty of opportunity for um, the community to um, ask questions, you know, um, call the city and ask if they can get connected with the developer directly, uh, you know, contact city staff. This is, this has been going on for several months. So um, I, I think I'm kind of struggling with coming to this last meeting and saying, you know, we were completely unaware. We didn't know. And why didn't we get a chance to say anything? 
Um, and so I'm not saying that that isn't true, but I'm just trying to balance that with the applicant who has, from what I can tell, basically done nearly every request that has been made of them, um, including taking out a couple of really significant lots on the south side. And to, to try to find that, um, to be understanding of our public and the community, but also look at an application that as far as infill projects go, I don't know if I've ever seen one where they matched up the law lines exactly with a neighboring, with three different um, zones. Uh, it's just almost impossible to do. So that is um, a pleasant surprise. Missionary. Mr. Murray, just to add to the record. So in the staff report, I mean, it does list all the dates of both noticing and, and yes, planning does need to fix their template, but the notices are sent to the 500 foot as required by ordinance. The signs, there was a defective sign. We required the new sign be posted for tonight's meeting. And the purpose of notice, just for the record, is to make sure you get to come here and tell your, your three minutes of what you feel. People have done that. They've been at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting because they got notices and saw notices. They're here for the same reason tonight, and they were at the last one. So the noticing issue is not an issue in my mind. This is noticed properly. We've corrected notices as needed. Notices went out and people have the opportunity to be heard. That's all the noticing is required. So that has been done. So that is not an issue from a legal perspective to me. Thank you. Just so you know, sir, if I let you come back up and talk, then the applicant comes back up. If the council wants more information, I'm happy to do that, but I just wanna let them continue to talk this out. But I know you're interested in speaking again. I want to make sure you guys get you're done. We're good. Would you like to hear from one more person? Okay, sir, if you'd like to come back up and then the applicant will give one, be given one final opportunity. Yes. Marvin Montoya, 484 East Lockhart Lane. Uh, I just, a couple of observations and comments. Uh, and I understand that you all have the final say, okay? I don't question that. But if the planning and zoning says R4 and your own clerk says R4, and supposedly R4 would, would suffice, why are you proving R8? I, I, that does not make logical sense if you think about it for just a second. Second of all is no one in my subdivision other than Mark ever spoke to the developer. He never had a meeting with the people in the subdivision. So that's, as he indicated he did, he didn't. So for whatever that's worth, I just thought those should be clarified. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The applicant like to make any additional comments? Uh, yes, Mayor, members of the council, not really, but I just want to point out again, the comp plan for this property is R8. If we did an R4, we would not match, particularly the lots that are on the east side of the property. We really worked hard to make those lots transition properly across this site. We think we've succeeded, and to tell you the truth, it is difficult to do. <laughs> so really, that's all I have to add. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Merrick. Councilman Hoagland. Question for Alan. If my recollection serves, but I could be wrong, that you can come in with an R8 and go lower. You can't go higher. So if they had gone R4 and had an increased density, you can't you can't go in that direction, correct? Um, Mr. Hoagland, members of the council, it comes down to lot frontage is a minimum lot size. That, that's where it's really a design issue. If you go with R4, you have to have 8,000 square foot lots and 60 foot frontages. If did I say R8? If you have to go with R8, you have to, sorry, if you go with R8, you have to have 4,000 square foot lots and 40 foot frontages. If you want to go with R4, then you have to have 8,000 square foot lots and 60 foot frontages. It's a design issue. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Neary. Mr. Mayor, members of council, Councilman Hogan, also to add to your question, generally the, the decision on re-noticing is driven by the number of lots that are being proposed. So if the lots increase, the number of lots increase, 
then we would require re-noticing. But the zone necessarily is merely a request. The council, since this is an annexation, the council has the ability to choose the zone they wish. Mr. Borden. Will we close the public hearing on H2021-0083? Second. I have a motion to second to close the public hearing. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have and the public hearing is closed. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Borden. It's time to, I think, to act on this application. It's been heard uh, before us before and, and at PNZ. So we've had some good discussion. I think the staff report and the public comment prior to today and, and through today has been extremely helpful. I think the neighbors have provided um, great constructive change and probably being as active as they have has made uh, this project much better in a lot of ways. Um, for me, it's been remarked rightfully so that it's, uh, we say code compliant, but it, it starts off meeting um, this parcel being in the comp plan as medium density residential designation tells everybody for better or for worse that it's intended to have this certain spectrum of zones applied to it. So we all know that going into it. And this application, whether it's R8 or R4, um, is consistent with that intent. And that's what we try to do is we try to be consistent with that comp plan and how we, our long-term planning for, for a particular project. Uh, Council member Hoagland is spot on, understandably so, infill's tough. And, and the amount of public input we get is much higher. Frankly, when done well, it makes projects better um, because we have the voice of those adjacent property owners, even if there's tensions and difficulty in that. Um, I think this is one of those cases. I think the neighborhood has rightfully raised concerns that have made this project better and, and perhaps certainly not perfect, but we've yet not yet found an infill that, that satisfies everybody. It's just difficult. Um, so for me, some of the considerations that I looked at in deciding this and in, in weighing the public comment and the applicant's presentation and our staff's great work on this is the way that it's, it's address the concerns from PNZ back on January 2nd when the recommendation of the denial and direction to the applicant to make some very pointed changes and improvements. Sometimes, rarely, an applicant will refuse to do so and come to council and then they're often met with the same result. We take the direction from PNZ very seriously and their recommendations and I think good applicants do too. So in this case, what I saw that was compelling was those properties to the south and the east to a large degree tried to blend some transition. Designing those lots in a manner that would be consistent with an R4 dimensional standard, trying to ease that transition, which is what we always try to encourage um, to the east, then obviously utilizing some of those adjacent or uh, similar lot lines and, and R8 allowed you to do that. So that coupled with what will be four entrances and exits to this project. Um, noting that to the north, I think is mixed use community in the comp plan, I believe it is, um, which has a, a much more intense intent long-term with what's gonna be to the north. No, yep, mixed use community, yeah. So all of that to say that you've got an application that's created some transition, um, that's matched some lot lines that can utilize um, four different entrance and exit points, I think can disperse traffic successfully for a relatively small challenging infill project. Um, and that the ultimate lot count is at or very similar to the lot count you would have designed a different way. Even if it was zoned R4, you would have the same number of properties approximately the same number of traffic, et cetera. So for me, those are all the considerations that, that make me appreciate the, all of the input of the neighbors. 
Um, and I think the pressure to have it right procedurally, noticing, et cetera, as well as substantively makes a big deal. So I appreciate all that good work. I think the neighborhood made this better. Uh, and for those of the, that's just some of the context and explanation of why I'm supportive of the project in its current condition. And if the applicant hadn't made these changes, I wouldn't have been there. And I think that happens because good public input as well as staff direction. Mr. Mayor. Council on Pearl. I'm always in awe of how well Councilman Borton explains his thoughts <laughs> every meeting. And um, I don't have anything else to add. I agree with him. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Borton. With that explanation, I'll make a motion and see where it goes. I'm gonna move that we approve H2021-0083. Um, kind of consistent with the staff report of April 5th, uh, 2022. I don't, believe, yeah, I don't believe there were any unresolved items. Look at that one. I have a motion and a second, but we have a question for Alan. I was just making sure I don't, I didn't have any notes of unresolved items. I think all of the conditions, perhaps there are one as well. Um, yeah, Mr. Borton, members of the council, the conditions of approval were stricken originally because the planning commission recommended denial. Um, so it would be unstriking them. I think it's probably, um, I think it might be important that you clarify that the subdivision plot that's being approved was the one that you were, was provided today in public testimony since they've changed so many times. So noted, Mr. Mayor. The, the motion does include that subdivision plot present today, April 5th. And Mr. Mayor? Councilman yeah, Holman. The question that the, also the findings of fact, conclusions law, that will be a separate, separate motion, correct? Correct. Okay, so does the second agree with Mr. Borton's comments as described by Alan in terms of this map? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Second agrees. Yes, Alan. One more thing. One more thing, since we're talking about the unstriking thing. Originally, staff recommended that the lot lines on the east align exactly with the lot lines next door. Um, the Planning Commission did not agree with, with that particular one. Um, I wanted to make sure that if the council was approving this, that they were also saying they were okay with that condition being stricken from staff's conditions of approvals. Does that make sense? Councilman Borton. Uh, that the lot lines would be as presented. Okay, okay. And the plat, so they don't exactly match. Thank you. I just, I needed that clarification, sir. Yeah. All right. We have a motion second. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Neri? Just, just one last item. So we will take the unstricken findings from Allen, attach those to a development agreement. That will come back to you in two weeks with the findings finalized from what Allen just stated with the new map attached. So, so you know what you'll get next. All right. Then with that, ask quick call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Byrne. Aye. Burrow. Aye. Borton. Aye. Hoagland. Aye. All eyes. Motion carries. The item is agreed to. So next item up is item eight, which is related to item set seven, item seven, the findings of fact, conclusion of law. Uh, continue from March 15th. Mr. Neary. Oh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Alan looks perplexed. When we talked about this back in whenever it was February, they had asked to move them up together if possible to, to sort of accelerate the process because of the delay. So that was the intention was to bring the findings now, knowing what the findings would likely be, and that's kind of where we were, um, but you don't have a clean copy. We can do the findings if the council's fine with the findings as we just talked about it 30 seconds ago, we can do the findings and the development agreement together to not cause delay either. And that way you have a clean findings, clean detached findings of the development agreement, a signed development agreement in two weeks. And so you can delay this one if your preference is to do that. 
Yes, so, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I think that would be a better um, approach because there's been so many different revisions and so much discussion. I think it would probably be better to get the exhibit attached to the findings correct. And, and that will not cause any delay in, in the timing of it. So that will still be the same. Mr. Borden. Mr. Uh, I move we continue item eight, the findings of fact as referenced in H2021-0083 for two weeks to marry up with the previous application. Mr. Mayor, I second that motion. I have a motion and a second to uh, move this item to <laughs> for two weeks. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay, the ayes have it, and the item is continued. Um, Council, do we want to take a break before going to the last one, or what's your pleasure? All right, then we will keep going. Uh, next up is item nine, a public hearing continued from March 15, 2022 for Jamestown Route subdivision. Uh, we'll continue this public hearing with staff comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. This is an annexation with the R8 zoning district and the preliminary plat to allow 293 building lots on approximately 80 acres of land. Uh, again, the site consists of 80 acres of land zoned RUT. It's located at the southeast corner of the North Black Cat West McMillan intersection. A comprehensive plan designates this for medium density residential of three to eight dwelling units per acre. Uh, this is an annexation again with the R8 zone district to allow 293 building lots. Uh, there were originally 294 proposed. There are presently two single family residences on the property. There's one here on the corner, uh, northeast. The other one is more towards the center. That one's gonna, uh, towards the center along McMillan, that one's gonna go away. Uh, proposed project has a gross density of 3.6 dwelling use per acre, which is pretty much on the bottom of what the density range is. Uh, minimum lot size here is listed as 4,900 square feet, uh, very comparable sizes to the adjacent subdivisions. This subdivision uh, proposes five points of access. So there's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the primary access will be a collector street off of McMillan, which you can see here. Uh, this uh, is about midway to east and west, midway between the property lines, and it makes an S curve, uh, which you can kind of see here. This would be a collector. The other three accesses would be local streets. Uh, one is a western access which aligns to west quintail there's an eastern access which connects to the volterra Heights subdivision and there's a southern access which connects to the quartet subdivision number two north great lake great north grand lakes way which is the collector it does not align with north joy street north joy street is if you can see my little arrow it's kind of up here uh, generally we like to have collectors aligned uh, this is how it was shown on the ACHD uh, master street map. However, instead it's uh, offset about just a little shy of a thousand feet. So instead of being, I don't know if you can see my pointer, instead of being here, it's been pushed over to here. Uh, the reason why, according to the applicant, is that there is utility poles and uh, there's a lateral and some other um, geographic constraints, which makes it difficult for them to do that. So this was the most logical um, location. ACHD did not have any issues. Uh, they looked at this and they said they could go either way with this, depending on what the will of the council would be. Uh, there would be a uh, 10 foot wide pathways along North Black Cat Road in North McMillan. Uh, this proposes 15.6% open space. Uh, originally it was at about 14.5. The open space has gone up since the time of the planning commission. There are four amenities that are proposed. Two large parks, each that has a clubhouse and a pool. And because these parks exceed the 20,000 square foot in excess, uh, they're actually also considered additional ad amenities. Uh, there's a pickleball court, pocket parts. There's uh, additional pathways that aren't required. And then there's uh, an additional 5% beyond the required at the time that this was reviewed 10%. Uh, there's numerous, numerous build, building elevations were submitted. Our only comments on this were to add a requirement for enhanced architecture along West McMillan, a very standard comment about having to have several different types of materials and articulation to look better from the main streets. At the November 18th Planning Commission, the Planning Commission continued this application. 
Uh, the reason why is that ACHD had, first of all, ACHD had not yet submitted uh, uh, their analysis of the staff report. They wanted the, act, the uh, applicant to, res, to consider reducing the number of common driveways. The original version had uh, 11 of them. And this has been uh, reduced by five. Uh, they, again, they wanted uh, to look at the ACHD report. They wanted the applicant to talk to ACHD about whether they could align uh, that northern collector with Joy Street. Uh, the, the applicants across the street had some concerns with that. They also um, wanted them to consider doing some realignment of the micro pathways so there was easier resident access. Uh, this is the most recent plat that you see here. Um, I've received this, I believe, yesterday. Uh, this uh, it, it's called out here, but basically what this does is it, it adds uh, five knuckles, which eliminates five of those common drives. It adds pedestrian pathways. It might not be real easy to see, but between these common drives, this is one of staff's earlier comments is we wanted to see this connected together so that somebody here could walk to the other side with having to go all around this roundabout way through the road. So they have connected all of these common drives. They done some minor road adjustments. Uh, they removed a residential lot and added a little more common open space. Uh, again, they've added some pedestrian access and uh, uh, again, the um, open space has increased from 14 and a half to about 15 and a half, which has reduced the lots from 294 to 293. Uh, since the time, so, so when the planning commission continued this, again, we did not have an ACHD staff report. ACHD then did submit their, their staff report. What their staff report said was that West McMillan Road uh, from the site to 10 miles, so to the east, would operate at a level of service F when this development occurred. Um, McMillan, the, the applicant's traffic study actually recommended uh, expanding McMillan to five lanes and ACHD said that's not going to happen. It's only going to be three lanes. It, they've also said that the intersection of West McMillan and North Black Cat is scheduled for a traffic signal in 2022. North Black Cat is listed to be widened to five lanes between 2031 and 2035. Uh, the applicant's going to have to build a westbound left turn lane. And as I said earlier, um, ACHD supported either alignment with whether they wanted to keep the collector in the middle or whether they wanted to align it with Joy Street. At this time, following um, the uh, ACHD staff report and the new updates, the Planning Commission moved to deny this case. Um, their concerns were the timing of improvements. Uh, the existing level of service and the effects that it would have on McMillan, um, the age of the traffic study, and um, that they thought that there was too many lots on this subdivision. Uh, staff has received several letters of written testimony. A few of them were with Mike Wardle from Brighton. He originally had some concerns about the alignment of the collector, but after discussing why the, elector, the, the collector was designed as it was. He was okay. Uh, I've received uh, several letters from Michael and Michelle Watts. They are the property owners that live to the north. That collector would be lining directly up with their house. I'm pretty sure that they, all, they, are, they are here this evening. And with that, um, I would stand for any questions or comments, Council. Thank you, Alan. Counseling questions for staff. Would the applicant like to come forward? Thought he did, but maybe he didn't. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I am a uh, Elizabeth Keckeritz, 601 West Bannock. I'm with Givens Pursley, representing the applicant tonight. We are really excited to be here and we really appreciate the opportunity to present this Jamestown Ranch project to you. Okay. First, 
Uh, just to start out, I would like to introduce you to the development team, the Walsh Group. Ron and Nick Walsh, it's a husband-son development team. They've been in the Valley for a long period of time. Um, Nick was born and raised here. They've done over 30 developments in the Treasure Valley region. And most recently in Meridian, they completed the Village Bungalows near the corner of Eustick and Eagle Road, which is a 55 plus community. Tonight, we're requesting council approval for annexation. I can't see things. Rezone and a preliminary plat for the Jamestown Ranch subdivision. It's an 80.3 acre site located at the southeast corner of McMillan Road in Black Cat. Jamestown Ranch, what, one of the things that's really pretty cool about this development is that it is offering an intergenerational living options within the community. Um, there's going to be single family detached home community, but within that there's a market rate community with 228 homes, and then there will be an age restricted community with 65 homes. Um, there's a big mix of lot sizes with some smaller alley loaded lots and some larger lot larger lots on the south, with the average lot side is 6918 square feet, um, which we feel like is a really good fit for this area. Um, which has been designated as a high priority designated area here in Meridian. As Alan mentioned, the comp plan has the site designated for three to eight um, units per acre. We're requesting R8 zoning with the density of 3.65 per acre. This is consistent with the comp plan and all of the surrounding developments. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. So open space, actually our open space has gone up significantly even since we last um, spoke and were emailing back and forth with the planning staff because after looking at this and talking to the um, landscape engineers and looking at the city code a little more, a lot of the open space, which is along the canals, the area bordering the um, Macmillan and Black Cat, that actually does qualify for open space. And so now we're looking at almost 20% of the property. Actually, it is slightly over 20% of the property. 16 acres is qualified open space. The market rate community, which you can see here in green, is at 20.3% open space. The amenities are a clubhouse, pool, a large central park, many more pathways and parks, and there will be a playground, but that location is still yet to be determined. The age restricted community, which is in blue, has 18.4% open space. It also has a clubhouse, pool, pickleball, and a large central park and walking paths. So overall, the space for this development is 20% and it's right at 16 acres. And when you add up the qualified, the green and the yellow of the qualified and the non-qualified of where the different canals are, where there's gonna be different areas to walk and just some large open spaces, almost 10% of the property is included right there. That is eight acres of really nice frontage improvements along those roads. So we did receive feedback from planning staff, from neighbor meetings, from planning and zoning commission, and we've made some really um, some upgrades to this development, which I really think really improve the overall, really taking into account the different changes that were requested. And I think this makes for a really nice development. We'll go through each of these, but we did remove five common drives, um, added five micro paths, added two parks, added four bulb outs, but the clubhouse parking has been modified. There were three multi-use pathways added, wide ones, and the frontage along McMillan was also modified. So first we removed the um, five common drives and when you can see where those were removed in the, um, and they were replaced with knuckles in the sort of gray Navy locations. And so we replaced those ones with knuckles. We did decide seven common drives were kept where they're located on yellow, but they were redesigned. Most of them were redesigned to really improve the community, improve their use. 
Of the seven remaining common drives, four of them now include um, some of the micro paths on their own common lot. This really improves the connectivity between the different parcels. Um, as you can see on the right, these two common drives have pathways connecting with a path landscaping and an open fence. And then on the left, you can see the other three common drives that are remaining are really short and they all only serve two, um, two homes per, per drive. Also, because I feel like it's always a question that comes up, it will be signed no parking on these areas, so there won't be um, additional cars parking on the common drives. There were also five micro paths were added for that improved connect pedestrian connectivity. In the orange, you can see the original one, and then there are those new five ones. Some of them are with the common, with the common drives. Some of them are new. Um, but we feel like this really improves the walkability. So wherever you are, it's pretty easy to walk to the pool, to walk to the clubhouse, to walk out to the street. Um, it really allows you to get to those larger 10 foot multi-pathways on the connector and the arterials. Two additional parks were added as part of the redesign to try to make things work a little bit better. Um, one is on the far Eastern side uh, the end of Wheelhorse Street, and one is on the far western side at the end of Marla Way and Dr. Brune Avenue. With that redesign and working with ACHD, our roads were a little too long and a little too straight. And so traffic bulb outs have been added in several locations. The addition of these bulb outs really enabled um, the development to also more clearly mark their pedestrian cross pathways, crosswalks, I apologize. And one of the things you can also see here, which I think is a really nice, unique feature that adds some charm to this development, is they're using permeable pavers for the local streets. And they did receive permission from ACHD to do that. Um, the collector will be paved as a normal street, but these local roads will be the permeable pavers. Previously, also in response to ACHD's reports, the parking for the clubhouses and the common areas was on the street. ACHD asked that that be taken off the street, so it was not street parking, and parking lots have been added. Also, originally, we had proposed um, the frontage along McMillan. Well, let's see here. Uh, we replaced the five foot sidewalks with 10 foot ones along um, Black Cat and McMillan. We had originally proposed five foot sidewalks, but in looking at what ACHD had re recommended as one of our mitigation options, um, one of our mitigation suggestions was to increase the 10 foot pathway along McMillan, increase that to 10 feet. But then also in looking at it, it just made sense to do the same thing along Black Cat to really have that wider, um, more open space, that wider boulevard. Um, and then also there's a 10 foot pathway along the collector on one side of the collector. And then also the McMillan frontage has been widened. It is now on an 80 foot wide common lot, which as you can see from this, from this map here, it allows for a 50 foot irrigation easement starting at the right of way then there's the 10 foot multi-use path, and then there's a 20 foot landscape buffer to the rear lot fence line. And this um, 10 mile, this 10 foot multi-use pathway along McMillan connects to the existing pathway at Bridge Tower West. And that's what you're really seeing here is that it's going to substantially mirror what you're looking at here, which is the Bridge Tower West frontage. So it'll be the same sort of wide area. There are a few things that we would like to discuss briefly, just what our traffic improvements are, the phasing plan, and we are requesting a canal tile waiver. There are a lot of traffic improvements planned in this area. This is, as everyone knows, a really rapidly developing area of Meridian. There's lots of traffic. There's lots of traffic improvements planned. They are going to be done both by um, the development group and by others in this area. 
Um, the first sort of most pressing, or maybe not the most pressing, but the first thing that's on that's set to be developed is over this summer, um, that corner of McMillan and Black Cat is set to be have a traffic light installed in this summer or sometime in 2022 with a roundabout sometime in the future. Um, the quartet subdivision to the south, there are going to be two going down Black Cat, there's going to be two left turn lanes along there, which will also help alleviate traffic congestion. Where Black Cat fronts the Jamestown Ranch subdivision, because of the subdivision across the street to the west, it's already been widened. So there's already that sort of center third turn lane. So there is already a third turn lane, the center lane to turn into Black Cat, to turn into this to Jamestown Ranch off of Black Cat. Um, Ustick, which is the um, street further to the south, is intended to be widened to five lanes by 2024. And then it's understood that ACHD believes they are receiving funding for additional Highway 16 improvements in this area, which also should help alleviate congestion in this area. Jamestown Ranch is going to do um, all of the mitigation recommendations that were recommended by um, ACHD. Um, they are going to install a dedicated left turn lane into Jamestown Ranch off of McMillan, which really allows this area to operate as a, 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 a um, three-lane arterial at this location. It gets the traffic out of the main path. They're going to widen the pavement 17 foot from the center line, remove the two existing driveways, install the 10-foot multi-use pathway, and then the connector will connect from, their collector will connect from McMillan to Quartet as it goes down through the subdivision, and then it ultimately will go out to Black Cat. Black Cat, they are widening the pavement to 17 feet to the center line. We're in, they're gonna install the 10 foot multi-use pathway. And as I mentioned, that turn lane is already existing there. Additionally, they've been asked to contribute to the McMillan and Black Cat pedestrian crossing features for the future roundabout that's still being developed right now. So it's not entirely sure what, will, what it's going to look like, but they are absolutely willing to do that. And then at 10 Mile and McMillan, they have been asked to install or provide money to install three inch yellow reflective sheeting to the existing signal black plates. I also think it's, I'd like to point out one other thing with the traffic improvements is the traffic on McMillan only operates at a level of service F during the peak PM hour. At all other times, it operates maybe not at an A or a B level of service, but it's, it's only at the F level of service during that peak shoulder hour, during that peak hour. And when you look at the shoulder hours, it does operate within um, ACHD considers it operates within the bounds of what is acceptable. Additionally, the traffic study, ACHD mentioned to the traffic study using 2018 numbers. The numbers were actually taken from um, traffic counts were performed in July of 2021 and October of 2021. And that is what was provided to ACHD. So let's take a look at the phasing plan a little bit. We'll, they're intending on constructing Jamestown Ranch in three phases. Phase one, which is depicted in yellow, will have the 93 market lots and 65 age-restricted lots, which is all of them. Um, at that point, during phase one, all of the frontage along Black Cat will be improved, um, including the multi-use pathway and almost all of the path of the frontage on McMillan will be improved. I think it's about 85% of it. They'll also be constructing during phase one, the dedicated left town turn lane on McMillan, um, which will get people off of that main thoroughfare going back and forth along McMillan. Phase two depicted in red, will construct the east and southeast portions of the subdivision and collect, connect the collector to quartet to the south. Um, and that connection, if the timing all works, that connection should align with the timing of Quartet's planned collector connection in their third phase. So this should all be coming together close to the same time. Um, we'll also be connecting to Bridge Tower West and removing the access. Phase three is pretty small and self-explanatory. Finally, 
We are requesting a waiver to open, to leave the Lemp Canal open. Um, this is what has been included all along. Almost all of the properties fronting McMillan are open in this area. The size of the canal requires a 60 inch pipe, which is a five foot pipe, which is huge. ACHD is fine with this. Um, staff has been fine with leaving this open. Um, a waiver can be granted if it's used as linear open space. And we are doing that in this case, considering this some of the linear open space. And the waiver has been granted for the neighboring subdivisions and all the other subdivisions along here. Um, they are intending, well, they have tiled um, two side-by-side -side canals on Black Cat to make that road more easily, more easy to open. Just go through really fast. Yeah, if you can please wrap up. Yep. <clears throat> we are in agreement with all the conditions of approval. We did include in a letter um, some minor modifications to two of the conditions um, as shown here which were already provided to staff. And so we respectfully request that council approve this, this application for the Jamestown Ranch annexation, rezone, and preliminary plat. Thank you. Stand council, for questions for the applicant. Mr. Mayor. Council on Pro. Thank you. Uh, first question has to do with those conditions of approval. So you had a uh, first condition of approval. So. The phasing plan shows that most of what is going to be along Millen will be in the first phase. So I'm trying to understand that modification. Okay. So the reason is that this house I'll get there. The house, if you see where the red is, that house um, is not, if we were to go all the way across at, with the first phase, that house would lose access to McMillan until we're able to develop the other road and connect through and out. So they would no longer have any access. And so that's why that one small section is being left until phase two, because the house that's remaining needs to have access to the road and that access, they'll eventually be able to get out through San Vito Way as soon as phase two is commenced. Council on Pro. Sorry about that. Can can you bring that condition up again on your slide? I don't know. When I read it, I didn't I didn't get that. Um, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Council, any additional questions? Councilman Borden. Mr. Mayor, um, <coughs> excuse me. So really big project, lots of units and, and a lot of understandable focus on McMillan and it being three lanes at best. Um, but the amenities, you referenced two clubhouses and pools. Do you have an image of those in your presentation? I saw them in the staff report, but. Only in the staff report. Okay. We did not attach any more to the. We just have a few elevations in the presentation. We don't have the- Now, and it's on page 24 of the staff report. The reason I bring it up is it's somewhat unusual, I think, from what we would normally see is when we think of clubhouse and pool, and I, maybe I was looking at the wrong picture. <coughs> but in the staff report, I just had made a note in prep, is a picture of, it looks like a pool that's a big hot tub behind it thousand square foot house. And I thought perhaps that couldn't be it. I know that. Okay. <coughs> Mayor, Council Member Borden. The smaller of the clubhouses is at least 1600 feet and the, which is in the um, age restricted, thank you, in the age restricted area. And the other one is larger. I know that. But anyway. We can circle back to it. it. It'll be something I want to point out and see if I'm. That would be an important amenity for a subdivision of this size. Uh, Mr. Borden, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the, the question relating to the clubhouse. I'm looking at that page. I didn't understand the question. That, is that, you can put it on the screen if possible. Is that picture depict what 
were to consider to be the clubhouse and pool? This is what was submitted to me as the clubhouse from the applicant. It'll give me a minute to have to, I'm gonna have to okay. dig it up on this screen, but. Okay. Cause I, I'm not shortcut it as well on the files here. We can, Mr. Mayor, we can circle back to it. It's just something that'll come up as part of the discussion. Yes, mm -hmm. and that is what was submitted um, with this. However, I can also tell you the applicant is certainly amenable to a larger um, clubhouse and pool in this area. <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoagland. Question, Elizabeth. I, I got a little confused on the entrance exit to Black Cat. The, you referenced Quartet, but then I was looking at a map and I thought it said Quintail. Okay. Um, Straighten me out on that, please. Mayor Hoagland. So there are, so Quintail is the Jamestown Ranch entrance into, in and out of, um, off of Black Cat. And at that location, because of the subdivision across the street, it's already been widened to three roads. Then the way the collector comes down north off of, um, the collector comes north off of McMillan, twists around, connects into the quartet subdivision to the south, and the quartet is what then takes that collector through and spits it out onto Black Cat. Okay, got it, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. Thank you. A couple more questions. So that collector doesn't go all the way through to Quartet is fairly large. There's three phases. It won't run all the way through to Eustick then? Um, Mayor, Council Member Pro, it does not. It goes, no. It goes into the north, it attaches into the Quartet subdivision that's right there that attaches. It's what's available to attach to, is what it attaches to, is the collector there. More question, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. Um, did you happen to have any conversations with the school district about school enrollment and capacity as part of your planning efforts? We did reach out to the school, and I did have several conversations with Marcy. There are, um, let me find that my notes here. The, so the schools in this area are Pleasant View Elementary, Star Middle School, and Owyhee High School. They, um, we received the original letter and then an updated letter that said they anticipated 112 children in this, um, from this development. Um, when I did talk to her, she talked to me, as I believe she's talked to you as well, about how they determine the numbers of school and how growth drives the schools, and that there are two additional um, elementary school spots in this area. There is one additional middle school, and there's one additional um, <coughs> high school land dedicated for it. She did talk to us about, you know, the options, the busing, bonds in the future, using portables, um, those sorts of things. Council, additional questions for the applicant? All right, thank you very much. Mr. Clerk, do we have anyone sign up on this item? Mr. Mayor, we do. First is Rochelle Watts. As you come forward, if you can state your name and address for the record, you'll be recognized for three minutes. If there's anybody online that'd like to provide testimony on this item, and uh, please use the raise your hand feature on the Zoom feature. Hello. Welcome. Hi, Ms. Watts, I'm getting your photos up. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Good photos, right? Okay. Which they're, uh, I'm gonna do some talking to you Perfect. do that. But. Uh, my name is Rochelle Watts, address 376 West McMillan Road, and we are directly located just north of this across McMillan, um, where the collector road has been proposed to, how the design is, is that's directly in front of our house. We have a real issue with that. We attended the neighborhood meetings last July, one meeting, by the way, last July, and the two previous public hearings, I submitted information then, testified, we expressed our concern uh, about the increase in traffic and objected to the location of the collector road. Um, there is a proposed westbound turn lane that is to be put it there that would be directly located in front of our driveway. And there should be, okay, so this these arrows are, okay, that's, let me go back here. 
that's directly in front of our house. This is this picture was taken prior to them now continuing to pipe and put the information in. And I, I would like to point out that big power pole that's right there, because that is part of the reason that they have stated that they could not put the collector road in where it was initially planned on and follows the uh, Ada County Master Street map plan where it connects in with the quartet subdivision. Um, Mike Wardle obviously had, had sent a letter saying, why was this deviated? They appeased him for however they needed to. But um, I also have here a picture of that power pole that they state. Ada count, according to what the report is saying is that Ada County staff said that there's multiple power lines and poles that would obstruct that. That's Joy Street looking at the property and that's where the initial collector road was to connect up from the quartet subdivision that would that, that is to the south of this. Okay, and I also want to point out that fence that's right there. Uh, that at this point, there was a neighborhood meeting for a proposed subdivision on that small acreage there. So I anticipate you may hear something in the future about that. We haven't seen anything submitted at this point. This is from the property, that same looking toward there, and that's Bridge Tower West looking east, okay? Not too far down there is where the three lanes ends. Again, this is our driveway right here. We're standing in the edge of our driveway, and they're talking about, let's see, 300 homes going in there. And then according to the report, the development is estimated to gen generate over 2,800 additional trips. Now, to, let me see if I can find that other one. That's where it's located at now, basically covering up. So this is the home shop buildings that will be torn down for that development. This is looking east. And I also want you to consider that there's additional development here. So on the north side of McMillan, you've approved Daphne Square, Brody Square, Para Place, this pickleball court that I was talking about is the one directly across the street um, from the owner of the piece that they are keeping. But I wanted to point out, and I know I'm running out of time, that's just that pickleball court that runs along Joy Street that flows into Daphne. And I also want to point out, I know I'm running out of time. I also want to point out that um, Daphne Street here, they have taken that, you guys approved that for Daphne to be moved. So it is not how it sits now. So it will flow through the subdivision. If you, you know, if you ever look at the plat map for Brody and none of this building has started yet. So all of those homes are gonna be built. They're either gonna flow out from Daphne, which they would have to wind through Brody Square, or they're gonna go down Daphne to Joy Street and out onto McMillan. And if you could- I know I'm gonna wrap it up. Sorry. Wrap it up, please. Oh, I wanted to show that one was one other picture that was looking from, well, I want to show their shop, it's not there, but it's the, the pole that looks straight to toward Joy Street. And then the, the owners, the, who was the original owner of all this 80 acres that is keeping out the parcel of the home and the shop. There is enough uh, frontage, let me rephrase that. There's enough footage between the pole and the end of that shop to put more than enough. There's, we, it's 91 feet. That should be sufficient for this collector road to go through. I think it's just the design and they've, they've kind of ignored that. And actually, if you look at the Ada County Master's, they, they, I know the Ada they, County staff report. Let me see if council's got any questions for you. So they state they, that they prefer that site too. Mr. Mayor, they do don't have a question. Councilman um, Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you for those photos showing that that pole was offset. It's not exactly in the middle of that road or Right. or anything. Um, you mentioned something earlier. Is the James Place, Jimmy James Place, going to be torn down completely or is that going to be existing? That one that's right there is going to be torn down because that's where the road's going in. That That's the home that's directly across the street from us. Oh. Just east of there is the larger property on the plat map, which is where they they chose to keep that. 
that was the original James family and they've passed and it's the son that now owns it. Yeah. And I think Larry, and I know Larry from years, years ago. So oh, yeah, I know. Anyway, so um, yeah. <laughs> Long time think, farm family. Yeah, you know, I, we've been in this house for 30 years. So. I think he lives up in Cascade now. So no, he lives in Cambridge. And Cambridge. That's that's he left right. in the nineties. So yeah. that's where. He yep. Lives. So anyway, um, so that, that's the, and you answered another question I had, and that was the width. Is there enough room between that pole and that, that, and the back of his shop. So they made mention before that he wanted to keep that residence. He does not live there. Um, it had been his parents and he has not moved in since his father passed. Um, and I don't know what his intent is down the road, but like I said, he's been in Cambridge and has property and land up there uh, since the early nineties. Um, but he was wanting to keep that parcel. The house itself, you can see on that, on that plat is to the east of the shop. And that between the shop and that pole, there's 91 feet. I think when we looked at the measurements, it seemed like that would be sufficient for a road through there. Let me ask you another question if I might, Mr. Councilman Hogan. Yeah, Michelle, it, one of the things though, taking a look at a benefit of where it's located across from your driveway is the fact that you get a center turn lane and as traffic increases. But I'm concerned about that. You know, it's a left so. turn lane, not a center turn lane. If it was a center turn lane, no problem. It's a left turn lane. We're going to have a difficult time even getting out of our driveway. And I can say that most of those homes are not going to go west. Those travelers, as they leave those homes, they're not going to go west. They're going to go east. They're going to go down to Walmart. They're going to go. So all of those that are traveling back home, that's a lot of traffic going in and out, in and out, and directly in front of our house. It makes more sense for that to be with the collector road. And I think that that's why Ada County has that in their policy, their guideline, to try and not have a lot of entrances onto those arterials. And the three lanes is not due to be done until uh, 2031 to 2035. And it's a long time before that roundabout is going to be done there at Black Hat, too. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Pro. Thank you. Um, did you happen to speak with ACHG staff directly and share your concerns? I sent emails to the assistant that when we first, before the first hearing, and she said they would take into consideration the information. Their staff report stated that they, and I don't have it here, but the staff report stated, made a statement to the effect that they would prefer a collector road be done if it's feasible and if the city of Marinian required. That was in their staff report. Okay, thank you. Council, any additional questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Mr. Mayor, next is Nick Walsh. Nick here, the, the wishes to testify. Okay, okay. We also had Ron Walsh. Okay. Okay. Is that everybody? Everybody on paper, yes. Okay, is there anybody else who'd like to provide testimony on this item? At this time, either in person or online, use the raise your hand feature. If you're online, we'd like to provide testimony. Do you have somebody online? Mr. Mayor, I believe this is Mac Myers. I'm promoting you to panelists now, Mr. Myers. You should be able to unmute. Like we're trying. So I'll unmute it a second ago and I just sent a request to unmute. Hopefully this works. I think we can hear you if you state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Council. Can you hear me? We can. Wow. Wow. Okay, that's not working.
Okay, let's. We, well, well they, he was in twice. So hopefully now there's only in one. Mr. Myers, are you there again? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm yeah. Here. We're getting a lot of feedback on our side. I'm unsure why. Uh, did you turn that down? Okay. Uh, Mr. Myers, maybe we can get have you call in on a phone line. Would that work for you? Sure. 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 Okay. Chris, if you want to give them just Chris will share that with you. Go ahead. Mr. Myers, there's a phone number on the screen. You'll dial that and enter the webinar ID. Still echoing. This is not working. Can you guys hear me? We have just a regular phone that we can call into. Well, while we're trying to get this figured out, is there anybody else present that would like to provide testimony on this item that hasn't had an opportunity to do so? Okay. Okay, Mr. Myers, I tried one more time here. Try to unmute and see if that works. Mr. Myers, you're unmuted, and can you see if we can hear you? Um, do you want to do a breaker here from ACHD? Okay, Councilman Hoagland has some questions for ACHD. So, Ms. Clark, if you can continue to try to work this out. And Christy, uh, we're gonna ask you to unmute because you're on the clock. Councilman Hoagland. Yeah, I just wanted to find out, Christy, from ACHD's perspective, um, 
it just appears to me that they punted on on moving where that lined up. And I, I was surprised because so often ACHD requires that the road in one subdivision is across from a road to another subdivision or another development across the way, which in this case would be Joy Street. I was just curious as to why on this one, it doesn't matter that it's farther down, down the road. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, council member, I think that was council member Hoagland. Um, yes, for, for the record, this is Christy Anselman with Ada County Highway District. Um, when we put out our master street map, that's a, that's a general rule of where we want to see collector roadways. Um, arterials are a different story, but collector location, those are meant to be a guide for where the um, ultimate location is on where that collector will go through. Um, those move quite frequently. Um, we want them in the general location that's identified on that map, but sometimes they do move. Um, I was going through the staff report and they basically gave some options that if, if the applicant wanted to align, they could do that. If they didn't, it's fine. There's enough offset between the two, the distances that were provided in the staff report, there was like 980 feet um, between the proposed collector location and Joy Street, um, which would meet our policy for, for offset on um, a three lane arterial roadway. So um, I think it was just to provide some flexibility if they want to realign or if they want to align with Joy, they just would need to submit revised documentation to us. Um, but we would leave that to the to the applicant because what they're showing meets our policy. Um, I think one of the concerns potentially was the location of that power pole because that potentially could create some site distance issues in the future if we were to align with Joy. Um, but yes, that that would be my response to that. Okay, thank you, Christy. Uh huh. Christy, just so I understand, on the power pole, do different power poles rate different? Um, issues because I know that there's on the overland there's smaller power poles but they're right there at the intersection of future street alignments. Yeah, I mean the the one that's the uh, Mr. Mayor the one that's there is quite large. That's one of their um, very <laughs> very large. The circumference of this one is also quite large as well. Right. Um, I'm not saying that that is the ultimate deciding factor on whether that can go there or not. In the staff report, it says they can align with Joy Street if they cho so choose. Um, but that is that was one consideration talking to staff, but they can align with that. Um, I think there, there is likely enough room and there's enough offset. So it, it's a, it was really up to the applicant if they wanted to align or not, because it meets our policy as is. Okay, yeah, thank you. Council, yeah, so any other questions for ACHD? Mr. Clark, do we think we got anywhere? Mr. Mayor Allen just got me a phone number. I'm going to call from my computer and try to tap him in that way. All right, Council, let's go ahead and take a 15. We'll go ahead and take a 15 minute break uh, and we'll see if we can get this figured out for this last person to, to provide comments and go from there. So we stand in recess. Mr. Myers, we're on a break in chambers, but I'm going to keep trying to see if I can get you connected via computer here. Uh, one of the two accounts you're logged into is unmuted. 
or able to be unmuted. Can you test that? Mr. Myers, this is Chris Johnson, City Hall. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, as soon as they come back from break, we'll just uh, come right to you. So if you hang tight, we'll get you online here quickly. Thank you. I can hear you, sir. We did try to call and we got a uh, voicemail. Oh. That's strange. Nope, we called from our number here. I'm not sure. Yep, that's actually us. So sometimes that phone number, the city hall number shows various people when they call out because so many numbers are shared. Um, but that was that was us. That's strange, yeah. Wow, no idea how that happened. I think we're having some, I think we're all having some strange tech issues, but you sound great. Uh, as soon as they come back in, I'll let the mayor know you're online and then uh, you'll be able to, to, to discuss what you wanna discuss. Um, I know they received them, but I think they, 
um, I don't know if they had questions for you, but certainly would look forward to hearing from you and, and perhaps would have questions after that. So just hang, hang on the line if you don't mind, and I'll let you know when we're back. Thank you.
All right, we'll go ahead and come on back from recess. Uh, do we have Mr. Myers on the phone? Mr. Mayor, Mr. Myers, you should be able to speak. Yes, we can. Uh, Mr. Myers, if you can identify yourself, name and address, or who you work for so people understand who's on the phone. Okay. Council, you, you should have received uh, an email earlier today. Do any of you have any questions for Mr. Myers? All right, Mr. Myers, looks like uh, there are no questions. So I think we're all good. Yep, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Myers. I, I don't know. We don't have anyone from our public works, or I don't. I don't know if the, these have been. Have these been conversations you've been trying to have with our planning department? Um, and if so, with whom? Yes. Yeah, yeah.
Well, Mr. Myers, I, I think I can commit to we, we can get the city to participate in a conversation with you. I'm just trying to figure out how much of this is directly applicable today, right now, to this application that they can. Scenario, would you like to weigh in on the relationship between our requirements and the impacts to the other jurisdictions? So, yeah, Mr. Mayor, members of council. So, Mr. Myers, I mean, the again, it, it is a cooperative arrangement between all these different agencies to try to make these work. But again, from an enforcement standpoint, we are primarily focused on our requirements, not necessarily the other agencies. Um, they do ask us oftentimes to to approve their findings to be part of ours and our development agreements so that there is some tool to enforce them, but we really do leave it on them on how that functions. So. It's a, well, so, yeah, so it's a waiver of our requirement. It doesn't waive your requirements. So it's a, if our, our code allows us to waive a requirement, say along a, a canal that's going to be used as a linear open space, as I think was stated earlier by Alan. So we can waive that. If you don't, you don't have to, that's up to you. You can waive, I'm sorry, I couldn't see. Our pathways. Yes. So yeah, we could. If you if you uh, you have to allow it as well as we have to allow them not to or to allow them to meet our standard and our code. So I, I think it goes back to what the mayor said a moment ago, sir, is I don't know that that has to be worked out now. At this juncture, if the council is comfortable with wait, with allowing the ditch to remain open and a pathway to be built along it, and at a later point in time, it's determined they cannot build the pathway along it, they will have to then come back. And Mr. Myers, I'm... Yes, but sometimes it's dependent on, again, a number of different factors that all can't all align necessarily together because you're talking about design, design professionals, roadway design, roadway timing. I mean, there's a whole lot of folks. So really, there's a, it, it's a piece of a puzzle that eventually will have to either come together or it'll have to come back to be re, re, reviewed again. But trying to make them all align at the same time and then do it all at once at some point isn't necessarily required by the code. And, and Ms. I say, Mr. Myers, and you have my commitment that uh, our staff will be in touch to, to help coordinate a conversation about this bigger issue um, for this corridor. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to provide testimony on if you'd like to come forward and state your name and address for the record be recognized for three minutes. Uh, my name is Mike Watts. I live on 4376 West McMillan Road. I'm directly across the street from this development. And as far as what ACHD is saying with the main power pole, aligning at Joy Street and being big 
same size as that pole that is right at their entrance that they just put in across from the street from my house. Make sure you speak to that mic. Huh? Oh, just speak into the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. It is the exact same size pole that they just put their road in right next to our house. So that is not an issue with the view. So, you know, they should bring that road and align it with Joy Street. Thank you. Council, any questions? All right, thank you. Is there anybody else like fried testimony on this item? All right, then I invite the applicant to come up to the close. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. First, Chris, how much time do I have? Five minutes? Ten minutes. Oh, good. In, into the mic. Elizabeth Keckeritz, um, 601 Bannock Street, Givens Pursley, with the applicant. Can we go back to the slide presentation? Um, first, um, Mayor, Council Member, I believe it was Hoagland, asked a question about the size of the um, clubhouses and the pools. That clubhouse, oh, Council Member Wharton, that clubhouse was taken from the village bungalows. Um, development and in response to, um, so the, the clubhouse would remain approximately the same size in this area for the over 55 community, but in response to um, suggestions from the residents of that, the pool is going to be bigger than what is depicted there um, in response to what they wanted in the past, what the current residents there have asked for. And then the, um, the clubhouse and the pool for the um, open market, free market houses will be much larger. Okay. So, the canal. Okay, so as we mentioned, There have been, I'll just address the irrigation district issues first. There have been numerous conversations over a significant amount of time recently over what Settlers Irrigation District is looking for, what ACHD would like, um, sort of what the, where the city of Meridian is looking, what's best for the community, what's best for this development. Throughout all of that, um, one of the things that has come up is that this is a really pretty complex site um, let's look at this one. It's a really complex site. There's two irrigation districts and three canal laterals are all converging on this one site. As you can see from that open space slide, almost um, eight acres, 10% of the property is dedicated to right-of-ways and easements and things in this area. Um, because of the large amount of canal work that was required and the timing of the dry season, the development group actually entered into a license agreement with Settlers Irrigation District and Nampa Meridian Irrigation District that included all of the required detailed engineering drawings for all of the canal improvements. They received that signed license agreement from Settlers Irrigation District on January 6, 2022. At this time, they've completed all of the canal work in the license agreements at their own risk and the canals are ready for the 2022 irrigation season. Since that time, and since the irrigation work was completed, Settlers Irrigation District has come forward with some changes that they would like to see, um, including that the canal be tiled. However, the signed license agreement does not require tiling of the lamp. Um, However, as the Walsh group worked through some of these issues with settlers and talked more to ACHD and looked at what was done on the adjoining bridge tower property, they realized that they had an opportunity to make this a much wider, much broader, a really nice area. Um, and so what they just most recently proposed was that they relocate the Lemp Canal south of the power towels away from McMillan and leave it open. They would extend the tiled portion, the pipe, the canals obviously get tiled where they go under the intersections. They would extend that portion some distance. And then as you can see in this exhibit, the 
the open space area is so wide that it can accommodate the 25 section right of way, then the 50 foot irrigation easement with the canal in it, followed by the 10 foot multi use pathway plus the 20 space buffer on the side of that. So this preliminary plat can be approved with these discussions still ongoing because it allows for either the current, um, the current approval to be um, in place or for this other more improved, what we believe would probably be a more improved um, layout to also be approved within this open space common area. Um, Obviously, there's been some back and forth, um, and but as recently as last Friday, settlers did represent to us that they um, did not oppose the development and they looked forward to this continuing to move forward so that we could continue to work with those and get more final engineering drawings and discussions done with them and with ACHD. And there have been multiple meetings between staff, um, between ACHD staff, um, settlers and the Walsh Group's construction crew out there over the last few months. Moving on to the collector. Um, here you can see the view from the collector looking um, from McMillan Road. The view where you come out, there is already a three foot berm and a six foot fence and trees. There's a single story barn behind the fence. It's not actually the home. You can see in the picture on the right how that's really laid out. Um, the Walsh Group has reached out to the neighbor on several occasions. Most recently, they had a discussion just this last Saturday about proposed improvements that they could do, um, including installing a higher fence, putting in more landscaping, making a higher berm. Um, but they have been proactively reaching out to this neighbor, trying to work with them, and are willing to continue to do so um, to try to reach some sort of resolution here. Also, the collector location, it really is where it is, as ACHD mentioned, it really is great um, location along McMillan. It's a central location for the interior access. If it were to align with Joy Street, the way the whole layout works and would have to move, it would require a lot of the traffic to be blasting right through that over 55 um, plus section, which is really not ideal. The whole point is to try to keep that a little bit quieter with less traffic driving through there. And then it also, it's really one of the most important is that it's the traffic calming design, which is what ACHD recommends. And as I just mentioned, there's the age restrictive enclave in there. Um, Joy Street also, one of the reasons why this isn't a collector where people where you really anticipate a lot of cars going from north to south and south to north. Everyone, as they come onto McMillan, they're going to be going right or left. There's Even if it went across, there's just not going to be that much, even with another development that they're going to be going into right there. Um, but really, the traffic calming, which is what ACHD does look for, is that they should be designed to discourage speeds above 35 and in residential areas, discourage speeds above 30 miles per hour through passive design elements such as horizontal curves. And I think I believe that's all we have. With that, we respectfully do request that you approve this application. And I would stand for any more questions. Thank you. Council, any additional questions for the applicant? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoagland. Uh, Elizabeth, one of the issues that came up was, and in, in the language was a left-hand turn lane into off of McMillan, and instead of a center turn lane, and now when you showed the picture with it doesn't quite line up exactly with their driveway, to me, a left-hand turn lane is going to complicate things 
even more. So is it a center turn lane or is it a designated left-hand turn lane with left turn arrows? ACHD and what has been designed is a, for the traffic mitigation is a left-hand turn lane at that location. Um, there is enough right of way, like we could certainly, I'm sure the applicant would be willing to speak with ACHD about it, but at this point in time, it is a left-hand turn lane with the left-hand arrow. And one other thing that was raised was dedicating additional right of way on the south side of the road. However, having been in contact with ACHD, they have told us they do not want additional right of way on the south side of the road, that all their improvements are intended to be on the north side, where they're going to be widening it. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoagland. Yes, I, I read that. They do want it on the north side to make those, uh, make that three lanes down the road, no pun intended, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, it, the uh, traffic, the direction of the traffic, though, to me, is, is going to be going to the east. To and from is eastern, eastern direction. You've got the Walmart, you've got the Costco's, you've got 10 Mile, which takes you to the freeway. You access Chindon that way. Um, it, it's just, uh, it does, to me, you know, is, is problematic. I mean, from, from a development standpoint, the, the development's very nice. I mean, it's well thought out, well planned, you know, nice amenities. It's just, uh, unfortunately, McMillan is a substandard road and it won't be improved. And that's that just gives me pause right there. And, and McDermott, I mean, 30, 31, we've got nine more years of that thing with some left turn lanes installed or, or center turn lanes. But, but until it's, until it's 30, 31 at the earliest, according to their five-year work plan, um, is, is still just going to be a two-lane country road, and and that goes all the way down to Franklin. So uh, that it, and we've got issues throughout on Black Cat, Black Cat. So it's just one of those things. It's it's the roads that kind of give me pause on on this. It's not necessarily the development, but just uh, how to make that work when every development we prove increases traffic. And yes, there are places we can expand the roads eventually, but place like this it's not going to be expanded except maybe a center turn lane which will help but yeah so that's that's kind of what i'm struggling with right now what mayor council member Huglin, as i mean as well first um that is i mean that has always been one of the concerns however there is no plan to ever widen this road more or additional um, and as far as a center turn lane, as far as the turn lane goes, I would anticipate that when the property to the north develops, that they will also be putting in a turn lane right at that location or really close to that location, which helps get the traffic at least off of the main thoroughfare of the streets as that as they pull into there. I also think there will be increased traffic heading west as Highway 16 develops. And it's an easy way to get out and get down through town. But we do anticipate traffic going um, to the east as well. Councilman Perot. Mr. Mayor. So um, heard ACHG say that they're leaving it up to you, the applicant, to decide how to handle that. What I haven't heard is, other than the supposed um, you know, electrical line poles and, and other, maybe some other small geographic issues there that, that you absolutely cannot build it as a collector connecting to Joy Street. Can you just give some more details as to why you've chosen not to do that? Because I haven't heard anything compelling yet that, okay. so, that would cause me to understand your position. Yeah, Mayor, Council Member Pro. Yes, so one of the reasons to put it where it is is because that's really centrally located and acts as a good location for the traffic to funnel in and out and around the development. Um, if we go back to one of the pictures, I think I have that. Um, of the development, where, that, where the over 55 area is located, if you were to put the road, and they went through after Planning and Zoning Commission, a lot of permutations of this, 
on the far side, on that far east side, then you're going to be required to have traffic going through that 55 plus area. And that is definitely not something that's ideal um, to have because you really want that to be a lot quieter enclave there. Also, ACHD wants these roads to be curved. They want their they want the traffic calming on these collector roads. Um, and so for that reason, it really made sense to have it in there with the big S curve, which then that's how it loops into quartet, which also then makes a great big sort of S curve down through that development. Um, also, Joy Road, when you look at it. It really kind of just goes up. Next one. Okay. Um, you can see where Joy Street is. Um, it kind of just goes up into just a very small subdivision. There just isn't a lot there. Um, so it's not really, it's actually functioning almost more as a local street than a collector. And then it also, as we talked um, with Planning and Zoning Commission, one of the things they said was, in the end, this sort of spacing of the roads actually might make the road work better because cars have more time to sort of turn out onto it, have a little space, turn out onto it, versus having more traffic all coming together at one intersection, given the constraints to this three-lane, max three-lane road. Mr. Mayor. Pro. So everything I've heard just now, other than the, the last um, thought on the spacing has to do with your design of the development, not limitations that are created outside of yourselves. That's what I'm trying to get at. So, so you can redesign this if you wanted to, you can move the 55 um, plus lot somewhere else. You can move that street to connect. I wanted to hear, I got the impression from everything I read in the project folder that there was some limitation outside of your control um, as to why that didn't, and I'm not hearing that. So that's what I'm trying to, to understand. Okay, Mayor, Councilman Pro. there's also, there is the traffic, um, not the traffic, there is the large, um, I don't know, power pole there um, that ultimately it could be moved, but it would be at great expense and it would be, it is just really not ideal because of how the spacing of those really large poles has to work. Um, that you might have to, in order to move one, you may be end up having to install two more because of how they are so distanced. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hovland. Mr. Mayor Elizabeth, from the photos that we saw, that was off when you line up Joy Street, uh, the Watts showed how that there was room, and then the earlier slide that you had showed your right of way, and from where the pole is to the the road edge was 25 feet of open space. So it's not a line of sight issue for a car that's looking left, looking right. So I I, I don't know where that restriction is with with that power pole with with Joy Street. First, the picture, um, Mayor Councilman Huglin, the picture is at Bridge Tower where. The picture that we showed was similar to what it would be, which is at Bridge Tower because it's not yet constructed here. Um, so it would be a little bit different where that power pole is located exactly. Um, and there, and so by- Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor Elizabeth, if I might interrupt. This was the Watts picture that showed it uh, right across looking at jo from Joy to, to where the power pole lined up. And it was like, there appears to be room. And, and there, I think they said 91 feet from the shed of the existing property to that pole. And I would think that would be adequate. So I was just curious, you know, what, why that wasn't, wasn't, wasn't done that way. And, and I, yeah, I, I know you you talk about, well, it spaces that out. Yeah, it's good. But, you know, as, as we had in the other applicant, you know, developers work to make people happy to, to the extent possible. And to me, that was an, would be an easy fix. But in fact, I would do the S curb opposite and throw the 55 towards the back if you really want calm and quiet. But I'm not here to redesign your project, but I'm just curious as to the whys of how you, how you got there and why this is better. I also do believe that it's a, we have our traffic engineer, 
I believe the right of way required for a collector is 100 feet, and there's only, I think, 91 or 92 feet there. Say your name and address for the record. Joe Pockner, PM Engineering. It's 5725 North Discovery Way. On traffic issues like this, one of the things that we're looking at is traffic normally goes straight through. Because these are all, you know, with, with traffic entering into McMillan in this, we're going to go east or west. And with that, the bigger the spacing in between these intersections, uh, the better the traffic flows. So right now, if you're looking at the, the streets that are highlighted, we've got about a thousand feet in between each of those intersections. So the tr turning traffic movements are not going to interfere where if, if you have them lined up against each other, then you've got the conflicting. You're not only looking to see if you can pull out, but you're looking across to see if there's another car coming the other way. Right now, we've got on each one of these intersections, the way we've got it lined up, it's almost a thousand feet, so there is no conflicting uh, turning movements. That's one of the bigger things. Uh, our collector is, it has to be a hundred foot in right of way, and you would want that directly across from Joy Street. To do that, the radius for our new collector would require that pole to be moved and then uh, currently those, those idle power towers are 500 foot in between. So moving it that extra 80 feet, now the next tower is 600 or 580 feet. And so idle power is looking at to see, and if, you know, we've, we went through this analysis, you know, multiple times to see what we could do. Uh, the other thing is this is a traffic movement within the subdivision. Uh, what we are looking for is to, bring it into the central so we're not taking traffic clear through the subdivision and then out to the far side to exit out. Um, one other thing was on that overall, um, I'm not sure what's going on there. On the other, just the traffic calming. If, if you look at the overall from Quartet subdivision going all the way up, if we do a straight shot all the way up to Joy, you've got almost a half mile a straight shot. And that's what, that's what the traffic calming is where, where we're concerned about is that long straightaway where Quartet, when we uh, did a long sweeping curve, and now we wanted to do an S curve to further slow that traffic down to keep it calm. It, this is gonna be a residential area that we really don't want uh, cars traveling in excess of 30 miles an hour. Sure. So, quick question for San Vito Way, where that entrance is for those people in the south and also Vincenze, I think that's Bridge Tower West. Did they have to move the power poles? No, I, I don't believe so. I, um, I believe that they put the, the uh, uh, intersections adjusted for, you know, so they would not have to move those, uh, uh, the, the large uh, idle power towers. Okay. Follow up, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hogan. Just to, to accept your argument that there's an adequate spacing with, with vehicles for left, right, and where, where you have that out now, um, would that be better being a center turn lane for both sides of people entering and exiting, or is a left turn lane the only solution? I believe what ACHD, when they were looking at this, they were looking at the, you know, you've got a whole subdivision doing a left turn bay and one single resident going on the other direction. I think ideally well, what, what this is eventually going to be in the, in the near future is a center turn bay going the whole way through. We are going to, we're required by ACHD to put a center turn bay, but to do that, we've got to have large tapers to transition in and out of that turn bay. And that will provide some safe haven for you know the the, the single resident resident home, but ideally it would be a center turn bay the whole way through, and then eventually if there's an, any other intersections tying into it, ACHD will more than likely start putting dividers where they cannot make that crossing movement uh, like they are done on other similar roads to avoid traffic um, impacts.
you have any other questions? Councilman. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Perot. Could you go over the location of the amenities with us again? I and, and pull up the open space um, slide. So as you know, we we look at these um, drawings and communities weekly. And we, we often get a feel for what seems to really work well um, as far as open space and utilization and what doesn't. So what strikes me, you said that there's eight acres that are dedicated to right-of-way open space canals. It's pretty 10% of the, of the geography. And um, you're at 20% including all qualified uh, and non-qualified open space. So what I see when I look at this, and it, it could just be that I'm looking at this tiny little map, but I see a lot of green space that is in places that are necessary because it's buffering and not green space that's intentionally um, being utilized for, you know, uh, recreation. So it, it help me help me see it differently because I'm just I look feel like that there's just a bunch of green space put in spots where you needed that buffering. Um, you know, because it's a collector, because it's, you know, it's up against Black Hat. I'm not seeing a lot of this other than the central area where the pools are, that's really this great functional space. And in this area, there's not a lot of community parks near here. We don't know when the West Meridian Community Park is going to come in. The funding hasn't um, been set up for that. So this is really an area where there is not a lot of places for people to go to walk or to go to parks. And um, so, help me see this differently. Cause right now I'm looking at this and I'm, I understand the math and I understand the acreage, but I, I don't see a lot of usable open space. So the primary open spaces are the, so in the, um, the more age restricted, there's the 18%, there is the bigger area down through the middle um, where the pool and the clubhouse are, as, long, as well as all of the paths and the little walkways. We also added, there's the large open space in the middle um, and the green open space. And then the two other sort of smaller pocket parks, the one on, there's actually now three of them, one at the end of, um, I'm terrible at that one. One at the east side on the end, one, one on the west side, and then one connecting that sort of connects through the two streets in the middle. Um, and those are all usable um, green space areas that aren't just right along a walkway, um, that it really gives the people here the ability to um, use those open spaces. Plus then with the rest of the, and that equals, and just with those, you're right up getting to the 15%, um, plus then with all of the additional along the outside edge, that really does make it a nice walkable community. It's gonna be a place where you are willing to ride your bike down to Walmart and willing to ride your bike to other places in the neighborhood because it is that green open space protected area by being set off the McMillan and Black Cat. Mr. Mayor, if I may follow up. Council Member I'm trying, honestly. I mean, I haven't seen any slides that show, you know, specific amenities or anything that really, other than the the one photograph with a small pool that that helps me understand how this is going to function. So, um, I I'm thinking about this. The next question I have is why did Kennedy not just get connected instead of having two common lots and a pathway? Why not? connect those that street through. I believe Mayor Councilmember Pro, I believe that would be because of um, street lengths through there and being able to divide it up, making just having more of the connections and the pathways around things. But that pathway was an original part of your plan. Connecting those. Oh, are you talking about, oh, at the top? Yeah. Um, let Sorry, I'm fixing it. Engineers. 
One of the things, uh, Joe Pockner, uh, uh, again, uh, we had those connected at one point. ACHD wanted them broken apart so that they would not be uh, anything over 750 feet in length. They wanted to break it up and slow it down. So even on that portion there, we were, uh, but they did want the walking path through there. So that's where those, you know, we, we, we added the walking path, took the roadway away from it. So it was ease of walking and re reduce the speeds. Council, any additional questions for the applicant? Seeing none, don't go far. I will let them talk. Mr. Mayor, Councilman Hogan and Christy, you may want to unmute yourself. Hi, Christy, I've got a question for you. Um, with McMillan planning on only being three, la three lanes and widened in, in here 2031 to 2035, um, I know on Eustick Road, as we've been working through that, there's going to be center medians in places now uh, to help slow the traffic. So it's not just a big racetrack type of thing. And I, I think ACHD has been working on this, trying to work on traffic calming, which, which, is, which is good. But, but to me, that would kind of bring up an issue when your driveways and other collectors and whatnot don't line up. That, that makes it more difficult where there's more breaks in that, but I, I'm not sure. Is, is McMillan being considered for uh, center medians in, in future when it, when it gets uh, widened? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Hoagland, um, I hate to have an unanswer for you on this, but I think it's a little too early um, to start or for me to provide any clarity on center medians on McMillan um, because the forecasted need for this road um, isn't for quite a bit yet. Um, those kinds of elements get worked through when we get to design. Um, they look at volumes, they look at traffic speeds. We also work with our partner agencies um, and you guys, the city of Meridian has a staff that is on all of our project teams that can convey your um, desires and preferences for corridors. So it's certainly something that if it's the city um, wants to have, that when we get to the design of these corridors, it certainly um, can be included in those conversations. I, I have not heard any conversations about center medians, particularly on this corridor. That doesn't mean that's not a possibility. Mr. Mayor Christy, thank you. I mean, it's a bit of an unfair question because it is far out there, but the, you know, the medians on Eustick were, I, we had no knowledge of that here until recently. So that was, that was a surprise. So I'm thinking, okay, if that's the direction you, ACHD is going, uh, they'll probably apply it. But I, I think that just speaks to the issues both city, ACHD, and other uh, entities have to deal with is trying to look far enough ahead to avoid as many issues as possible, whether it's irrigation districts and working with them, ACHD, cities, counties, uh, adjoining cities, how, how do we plan far in advance to mitigate potential issues that we run into conflicts? And, and I know sometimes the crystal ball isn't real clear, but boy, the more we can do that to, to figure those things out well in advance, um, I, I think it, it's better for developers, it's better for the public, and it's, it's, it's definitely cheaper for you know, government agencies to not have to spend money that, that it's hard to come by. So. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Mayor, um, Councilman Hoagland, I mean, 
Um, that is one of the reasons why ACHE develops the master street map and the livable streets design guides is we, again, we, we update that every several years We're actually um, getting ready to update that again. And we work with our partner agencies and the cities to help identify and designate those corridors, um, both the number of lanes that are going to be proposed, as well as the typology. And within our livable streets design guides, we do provide um, some uh, guidance on what the planned um, street section may look like. And so if the current typology, and I apologize, I would have to look that up. I don't have that at the top of my of my brain right now um, to see what the current typology is of Macmillan adjacent to this. And if the current typology is not something that shows medians and it is something the city wants or um, there's something else, then um, when we go through that update, again, we work with staff in the city. And if, if that's something that the city wants changed, they can request that when we update that. That's kind of our best crystal ball is we do look towards the future and we do look at those typologies to say, is this a residential collect or a arterial? Is it um, an industrial? Is it a commercial? And what type of treatments those look like? That also lends into helping us determine the needed right of way in order to do those improvements. Mr. Mayor, follow up. Councilman Hall with Christy. Thank you for that. And I understand, Christy. I don't, I don't, don't mean to pick on you or ACHD. It's just uh, <laughs> You're fine. trying to think ahead. Um, and, and so if we, let's, let's switch to Black Cat. Um, mm -hmm. I know a, a development was approved down in the southeast corner here recently. Uh, they're putting in some turn lanes or center, center lanes, uh, turning lanes. Um, there's going to be some up where this is being proposed as well. But again, Black Cat is not scheduled to be widened to five until you know 2031 at the earliest. Um, you know, again, depending on funding and where growth is occurring, mm -hmm. those types of things. So, uh, the the level of service on that can you can you remind me what that was with the with, with the level of service on Black on, Cat on Black Cat? Yes. Yes, I have the staff report in front of me. So Black Cat Road, the level of service is better than D. Okay. And, and we, I, when we receive traffic um, imp, or traffic studies on development such as this, we do look to them um, to help designate where traffic is going to go and the needed improvements. So our standard improvement on like McMillan, for example, um, would be 17, 17 feet of pavement three foot gravel shoulder. If there's other additional needed improvements, that's gonna be vetted out um, through our, the traffic study. And it was their traffic study that did dictate the type of treatment that's needed on McMillan. Okay, thank you, Christy. Mm Mr. Mayor. Councilman Borden. We've gathered all the input. Applicants had last comments. Applicant has had last comments, yes. Two of the elements that I struggle with, and, and Council Members Hoagland and Perot hit on them. Um, the, the traffic and capacity of McMillan is, uh, and the timing of this in relation to McMillan's ability to serve it is extremely problematic. It's been a part of this application through P&Z, um, part of their recommendation of in this case as well. And, and then the amenities as well that Councilwoman Perot stated very well, or at least as presented, um, certainly lackluster. I agree that this is an area that doesn't have other amenities nearby within it that can serve the community. So those are two problems that 
I'm wrestling with on this application as well. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Burton. I, uh, I have been uh, quite silent during this uh, application, listening to my fellow council members and listening to the applicant and listening to a public testimony. And if I don't uh, have to speak, then I really don't have anything to add to the discussion. I mean, my fellow council members have <coughs> nailed it on the head. So um, as it stands, I probably um, wouldn't be supportive of this application. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoagland. Yes, you know, it, for, for me, it, it really is a, a traffic issue, a timing issue where McMillan and Black Cat, it's not until 2031 uh, that they're showing. Um, we know McMillan's gonna be substandard throughout and I, 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 I can get to that point. You know, Joe talked about having the, the, the distances uh, for movement. I, I, I think it could be worked that could be workable, but it, it definitely has to be at three lanes with center turn lanes for all those uh, various areas. Um, Black Cat is just uh, growing tremendously. That's the route I take home on uh, a back way. And although I turn at Eustick, the amount of traffic that goes north on there is amazing as you know 1g plates and other out of county plates are, are headed north to get to chinden and to work their way to stay off 10 mile um it's just uh interesting to see how people tr try to find the path of least resistance and it, it definitely impacts local roads with, with people who don't live in meridian um, and then we add our growing growing community to that uh, to me it, it really is a matter of timing um this, this this area will develop. There will be housing and whatnot on it eventually, but for me right now, we're we're not we're not close enough to having those roads um, make it at least a little more feasible for for traffic to move move smoothly as as we're growing and people use our community as a pass through instead of a destination. So. Um, that for me is the reason why I, I'm not supportive of this application at this time. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pearl. Uh, this is a tough one. I see some great things that the applicant is bringing to the community in an advance of maybe when it would have come. But I'm trying to something just doesn't sit right with me and I'm really trying to kind of put my finger on it and be clear about it because we never want to send an applicant away without some constructive feedback. Um, but I just, I, I don't think that the design of the of the project is a great fit for that location. It's, it is very dense and I don't, I don't tend to have challenges with density but sometimes when you set it in the in a specific location with specific other concerns related to traffic and movement and timing, it just doesn't quite puzzle that we that we'd like to have. Um, not only do we have all of the developments coming in that um, that the neighbors to the north mentioned in their presentation, but we have 700 and some homes coming in with Toll Brothers in the northwest corner of that. Um, intersection, and then we have another 400 plus homes coming in just near Owyhee High School, and I, there's probably more than that actually. So most of those individuals are going to be taking McMillan to the east, and so we have to consider that um, as well as the traffic counts that we discussed here this evening. So I'm not um, I'm not in support of it as is. What I'm trying to decide is is whether um, you know, I would prefer to send it 
to, to allow the applicant to spend more time working on it based on the feedback we've provided or um, you know whether to to vote for denial so I'm, I'm simmering on that a bit longer Public hearing is still open. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoagland. I move we close the public hearing on H2021-0074. I got I have a motion to second to close the public hearing. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Public hearing is closed. Well, Mr. Mayor, I, I made my thoughts, I think, clear. Councilman Hoagland. It, it, it just is really the timing of the roads, uh, the expansion um, with, with the ability to move traffic. And, and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not real hung up on, on the development. I, I see some good, good things they did and, and uh, uh, tying into the other areas, you know, you've got 293 homes and they've got five exit. Last one we had, 38 homes and four exits, and that still didn't make people happy, but you know, you never can can do that, as I mentioned before. But uh, um, it, it's just the, the timing in some areas, we just have to be a little closer to these roads being expanded. Um, nine, nine years is too long. And, and I know it could, could move up, and hopefully it does move up, but uh, with, with the demand that we have and the resources that are available for roads. You know, I know the state's committed a lot of money to a lot of things, mostly bridges, and some is trickling down to local highway districts, but uh, it's, uh, it's just one of those things that uh, traffic considerations are really uh, the main thing that, that people are really feeling burdened about. We did our city survey recently, uh, the traffic was just uh, uh, a top top item and one of the top items and it just for me this location at this time just doesn't fit and it might someday but right now it, it doesn't for me that's one pro um, if McMillan were to be possibly widened, which I know it's not going to be, ACHD doesn't have it in the plan because of that canal, um, that would be a different conversation. Um, it, you know, the question can be presented, well, why, why deny this and not Quartet or some of the other um, developments in that area? And it, it's really just that McMillan piece for me. I mean, if this, if, if, if that roundabout was going in sooner, um, if there was a center turn lane, uh, if we knew that Black Cat was going to be widened sooner, so that between um, McMillan and Eustick, I think we're still out at least to another six to 10 years on that somewhere. So if any of those pieces were to be coming together, I, for me, it would be a different conversation, but it, it's just because of that McMillan section, not going to, it's not going to be able to be widened like Eustick. It's not going to be able to um, you know, with Quartet, they brought, they're bringing in those turn lanes um, in a way that made me comfortable with the movement back out towards Eustick and south on Black Hat. Um, I lived off of Black Hat 12 years before anybody was even out there. I've lived out there for years. I, I know exactly how that traffic flows in that entire area. And um, it's, it, it would make it pretty tough. Mr. Mayor. That's what I'm going. If, if we're ready to uh, move on to our last item for the evening, 
Uh, after considering all staff, applicant, and public testimony, I move to denial H2021-0074 is presented during the hearing on April 5th, 2022. Uh, for the reasons related to the uh, traffic and road conditions that currently exist and, and the time before they can be expanded and uh, issues that relate to some aspects of, of the development but uh, uh, primarily because of the, of the traffic concerns and, and lack of in infrastructure improvements until uh, much later in, in, in the, this decade. Second. I have a motion, a second. Is there any discussion? If not, clerk, call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Burnt? Aye. Burrow? Aye. Kavanagh? I apologize. Borton? Aye. Hoagland? Aye. All eyes, motion carries, and the item is uh, is denied. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing for Aviation Subdivision H2021 0096. We'll open this public hearing with staff comments in a minute as we transition to Joe. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, sorry about that. Alan's not feeling too well, so I just want to make sure. If I bring home something to my wife, she'll be upset, and I don't want to make her sick. So, um, Last item tonight is item number 10, aviation subdivision, H2021-096. The site consists of 9.8, sorry, 9.8 acres of land, currently zoned R15, uh, the map on the left is a little old. We had a snafu with the zoning ordinance with the previous approvals, but it is R15, I assure you. It's not ME. Um, it is located near the northeast corner of Black Hat and Franklin. It's uh, directly northeast of the Compass Charter School. It has some history on the site uh, dating back to 2018 when it was annexed by the Compass Charter School. Then in 2020, um, rezone, map amendment, and MDA was approved. Um, the Comprehensive plan now shows this property as medium high density residential, which allows residential uses at a gross density of eight to 15 units per acre in the 10 mile plan with a target density, quote unquote, of eight or sorry, of 12 units to the acre. The requests before you tonight are for a preliminary plat consisting of 48 building lots, which includes six single family attached lots, 31 townhome lots, two detached single family, and nine multifamily lots. Um, includes eight common lots and one other lot. Additionally, a conditional use permit is being requested for 36 multifamily units on the nine lots within this total site. The total proposed unit count is 75 units. The subject 9.8 acres were annexed into the city of Meridian in 2018 with the Compass Charter School. It also received a CPAM approval at that time to change it from residential to mixed employment. Later, this parcel was no longer part of the long-term school plans and was subsequently sold. With the newer approvals, the property was returned to its original future land use designation of medium high density residential and included a new concept plan of the residential development and the proposed and preferred location of Aviator Street Extension. Subject site is also within a 10 mile interchange specific area plan, which staff calls just the 10 mile plan. Also recommends a mixing of a mix of housing types in this designation: row houses, townhouses, condominiums, alley loaded, etc. The applicant is proposing 75 total units, as noted, within the 9.8 acres in the R15 zoning district, which constitutes a gross density of 7.65 units per acre. This density can be rounded up to the minimum of eight per the provisions outlined in the comprehensive plan, which makes it comply with the designated uh, future land use. 
this site is part of a larger area of medium high density residential, pretty much everything to its east. Um, and it's slowly redeveloping from both the west and the east. Development of this site is a logical direction for development to occur from the west, which would be Hensley Station directly to the west. However, the transportation element of this area of the 10 mile plan is important, and there are known traffic issues in this area caused by the adjacent Compass Charter School, most notably at the pickup and drop off times in the morning and afternoon. Staff notes that applications for the site to the east are likely forthcoming, which would connect Aviator from Black Cat to San Marco Way within the Entrada Farm subdivision to the southeast. This east-west connection would create the needed ex secondary access for fire, as well as provide a different connection to Franklin. To help mitigate this issue as well as the overall phasing of the subject site, staff is recommending conditions of approval around the phasing of the project in relation to the construction of West Aviator. In addition to the general comp plan, the applicant is, is expected to meet certain design criteria found within the 10-mile plan. The applicant is now in compliance with these criteria by providing an alternate design option for the front-loaded townhomes, which would be these here. Uh, they now show a mix of two-bedroom and three-bedroom, which two-bedroom require a one-car garage, and three-bedroom or more is going to require at least a two-car. Um, they also are showing the garages placed behind the front porch. These revisions make the proposed elevations of floor plans compliant with the 10 mile plan and the recorded DA. The proposed plat complies with all UDC dimensional standards, road widths, and the proposed single family uses are principally permitted within the R15 zoning district. The applicant is proposing detached sidewalks and parkways throughout the entire site uh, to help activate the street and provide more compliance with the 10 mile plan. The plat meets all landscape requirements except for the required 20 foot buffer along the south side of Aviator. Um, there's still not the required trees shown in that. There is an existing condition regarding that. Um, the only issue with the landscaping, and it's not really an issue, is staff is still recommending that the applicant coordinate with the irrigation district to include some additional trees closer to the lots here, just for additional shade within the irrigation easement. Due to the proposal of two types of residential uses in the same project, the open space requirements vary for the single family and multifamily portions of the site. In total, the amount of open space provided should be at least 45,300 square feet or just over an acre. According to the plans, the applicant is proposing approximately three and a half acres of which two and a half is qualified. Uh, this area does not, is not actually even fully accurate because they did not include the parkways within this calculation, which would add additional qualifying open space. Therefore, the actual open space is even greater and the proposed open space vastly exceeds the minimum amount required by code for the whole project overall and individually of the single family versus multifamily. The applicant is still required to provide a qualifying amenity worth at least one amenity point for the single family portion of the site. The revised plans do not show that, but I assume they will take care of that moving forward. Um, the applicant complies with all requirements of the multifamily code with the revised and submitted plans. The applicant added more amenity to the central open space lot and it proposed slightly above the minimum parking spaces where they were below by one or two spots previously. The applicant is proposing to extend West Aviator, the collector street that runs through the site along its south boundary from its current location at southwest corner to the east property boundary. According to the plat, the applicant is showing a small portion of this road extension to be on an adjacent property, which you can see here this little corner of the street here or yeah corner of that property it is not part of this application and that property is not currently annexed into the city of meridian it is not typical of road extensions to do this but it does allow the applicant to have more usable land area and that is significantly reduced to the due to the existence of the pergam gulch drain which has a hundred foot wide easement the placement of the aviator extension requires a formal agreement with the adjacent property owner and a preliminary agreement has been agreed to pending the formal sale of the properties to the south. The applicant did provide that to me as well. If this agreement with the adjacent property owner is not finalized and or falls through for any reason, the submitted plate will have to be revised to show Aviator wholly on the subject site. To ensure this occurs prior to development, meaning the agreement is finalized, and staff reviews it, staff has included conditional approval that a final plat will not be accepted until an agreement has been formalized and the right of way is dedicated to allow the construction of the offsite portion of Aviator. Uh, ACHD has also given preliminary approval of this as well. There is no secondary access to this site as noted. 
because aviator when constructed to the east boundary would be a dead end street. The fire department requires secondary access for each access that has more than 30 homes off of it. Hensley station to the west already takes up this allowance and that's why they had to have an emergency access at the black cap. Thus, the construction phasing of the project plays a key role in how staff must address this issue, as all of the structures will need to be sprinklered if the single family portion is constructed first. The multifamily uh, units are already required because they will be constructed under a different part of the building code. The applicant has stated that their plan is to extend Aviator into the site to the point of no more than 150 feet past the eastern local street. So approximately right here, 150 feet east of this road. Uh, to avoid the need of in constructing a temporary turnaround. The local street within the project would be constructed at the same time to obviously create that loop road. However, the applicant is continuing to work with ACHD on a plan to construct Aviator as noted and road trust for the remaining portion so it could be extended with any future road project that occurs on the parcel to the east. Staff is supportive of this option as the road would be a dead end street as noted and constructing a temporary turnaround would be both wasteful space and would need to be located on the top of the Purdom drain, which could further hinder the applicant's ability to develop the site due to complications with the irrigation district. In conversations, ACHD has noted an openness to this road trust agreement as well, this option, but did not include it specifically in their staff report. So staff has included a condition of approval to encompass both potential outcomes of Aviator Street. At the commission hearing, um, well, I guess before I get there, I did not include that. Why would I not do that? Sorry, there's another slide in one of my presentations that would be better served for all of us. I apologize. There we go. Okay. So this is the general um, assumed location and extension of A Aviator Street that I was referring to. Zentrata Farms here. I will continue Aviator from the east boundary of Aviation Subdivision down through and connect to San Marco Way. Uh, I have met with this applicant. This application is in process. These properties are currently under contract, which is my understanding. So development is occurring in the area or is planned to occur. Um, everybody here has worked pretty well together from my understanding to help extend Aviator appropriately and plan that. At the commission hearing, the commission did recommend approval. Their key issues of discussion were the changes that staff was looking for um, in regards to the elevations and floor plans to better meet the 10 mile plan, which the applicant already addressed. Uh, they wanted some history of the existing sidewalk along Aviator Street versus the requirement of a detach, meaning that there's existing attached sidewalk in front of Compass and in front of Hensley Station, which is not meet code. Unfortunately, um, we did not want to continue that nonconformity, so we spoke with the applicant and we've realized that we actually have room to get the five foot detached sidewalk on both sides, so that has also been taken care of. They also discussed any potential of outstanding issues between the Commission and Council if the project were to be continued out, which didn't occur, so I wasted time saying that. Um, the applicants also, there was also discussion about the applicants proposed phasing of the aviator extension as I discussed. Um, the commission did not change anything in the staff report except striking condition 12A, which I had rec rec uh, recommended before that hearing due to some revised plans that I received from the applicant and further discussions with the applicant. At this time, um, there was no additional written testimony as of about noon today. And there were no outstanding issues for city council at this time. So I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Joe. Council questions. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pearl. Joe, um, on the slide that you have here where it has the five acre approximate piece that shows as R15 designation just immediately east of Compass Charter School, it was my understanding that they purchased that um, as a place to put their sports facility versus the applicant's property to the north, which is where they originally had planted it, did, did that, get, that get sold too, and they're not planning on putting any kind of uh, track or soccer field or anything? Um, Ma'am, they did purchase that. They still own it. Um, the 
you can kind of see if you look really hard through the um, the zoning color. There's the parking lot there, and there's some grading happening on the lot right or the area right south of it. So they are doing like a field. They're not doing a sports field, unfortunately. It was always planned just for like a play area, but there is about a I want to say it's an acre. It might be a little bit more than an acre because they have two parcels originally. So they moved the property line, and that's where this area right here is shown. They do plan to sell that to the developers to this east in order to allow them an access to Franklin. Um, granted, I don't want it there, so that'll be further discussions later on, but um, I don't think ACHD does either. But uh, they are using this portion of the site, Compass Charter is, yes. Mr. Mayor, one more question. That's one pro. Uh, what is the um, comp plan designation to the property immediately east? It's also medium high. It's what, medium also, high? Yeah, also medium okay. high, correct. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Council, any additional questions for staff? Would the applicant like to come forward? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Jaden Schneider, uh, 412 South 3rd Street, Boise, Idaho, uh, with Bronzebow. I'm the applicant representing the developer. The developer is here tonight. Um, I just wanted to start off with thank you for your time. I know it's late, um, but I really want to give a thank you to Joseph. Uh, he's he's put a lot of work into this project. We've gone through, um, I believe, four or five pre-development or uh, pre-application meetings in order to really nail down a project that uh, the city or planning staff can get behind. And uh, we're really happy with the project, and I'm really happy with uh, where we are tonight. And I really hope to show you a project that provides a lot of great community benefit, uh, especially as Joseph mentioned, there's a lot of usable open space in this project. Um, a nuance to the project was there was a lot of specific constraints. And so I'd like to just get into my presentation and, and we can go through some of these and, and I can talk a little bit more about it. So as Joseph said, uh, the aviation subdivision, 9.8 acres, medium high density residential, eight to 12 uh, units per acre. Uh, for our site right now, 75 units in total. We would have loved to have got more units as any developer would have. Uh, as I mentioned before, the site constraints have proven to be difficult. And this is something that we worked very hard on to get. Um, Joseph had even helped us get a lot more units than what we were feeling like we could get by allowing us to use a CUP and go some more dense multifamily with the fourplexes. And it really provides uh, some site plans that really make a lot of sense and really works well for this specific site. So first off, I wanna just talk about the existing features of the site. Um, on the west boundary of the site, there's an existing stormwater facility, which was a part of the Compass Charter School original plan. Um, as Council Member Perot had mentioned earlier about the site being previously uh, owned and uh, uh, planned in order to be a site for the sports complex and sports fields for Compass Charter School. They had gone ahead and put together some facilities, for instance, this stormwater facility, which remains on the westerly boundary of the site. Um, due to the fact that it is an existing condition and it does service the Compass Charter School, that is one site that we've had to work around. Um, this is just what it looks like right now. It, it, it's nothing much to look at. It's just a shallow swale. It's it's large in size just due to the nature of that Compass Charter School. The building itself is quite large in size. Moving forward with that, the largest site constraint was absolutely the Purdom Gulch drain, which runs Kitty Corner across the site. It's a hundred foot wide easement owned and maintained by Nampa Meridian Irrigation District. And as you can see, it, it eats up a lot of space across the site. Um, we've worked a lot with Nampa Meridian Irrigation District just to uh, try to figure out what we can do with their drain and how we can work with them in order to make a site that works. Um, as I mentioned before with, with the uh, meetings that we had with Joseph, we had come up with a plan that we were really in favor of, we loved. Um, Joseph had given us a thumbs up and said that the planning can get behind it. Nampa Meridian Irrigation District came back to us and, and told us to go back to the drawing board because it crossed over the Nampa Meridian Irrigation or the Purdom Gulch drain in multiple places. And they told us that it was in our best interest to only cross it in one spot. So in order to make that happen, and I'll, sorry, I'll just show you a quick picture here. This is the Purdom Gulch drain. As you can see, it's sizable. Um, 
it has two large berms on the uh, south and the north side of it, and it is a main vein of the actual irrigation district. It's not just a lateral, it is a full drain that comes through here in this portion of the site. So what Napa Meridian Irrigation District has requested is that we reroute their drain and go forward with the irrigation uh, piping on the easterly boundary and then along the northerly boundary of the site. So this is 48 inch uh, reinforced concrete pipe and the developer is funding that entire portion of the project and moving that forward in order to make a site that allows aviator to cross over the Purdom Gulch drain in only one location and to better uh, suit the site in order to make what you see now is a rectangular site which allows for a much more cohesive buildable area. Um, there's some community benefit that comes along with that. The fact that the uh, Purdom Gulch drain is now a piped uh, section allows for um, the, the open ditch to be omitted and that uh, safety factor is now elevated there. It creates the open space that comes along with the fact that it's now piped and it's a hundred foot wide easement. And then um, it, it helps with the efficient pattern of development, which allows us to uh, keep the subdivision portion together with having that open space in a contiguous pattern. The other uh, nuanced portion to this site that is uh, just one thing that I wanted to point out here was down in the southeast corner of the site, and I'll use my mouse to point it out, is this is the Nampa Meridian Irrigation District pump house lot. It has proven to um, add a little bit of nuance to how Aviator Street becomes aligned and the reason that it is where it is. And that falls back on some previous approvals and previous conversations that have come apart with or come along with conversations with ACHD. As you can see right now, Aviator Street is on the southerly boundary of the site, and it traditionally would continue on straight, which would allow for access from the north portion, which is the Aviator subdivision portion, as well as cutting across the north portion of the following lots that are kind of to the southeast of this site. The irrigation drain that comes through here splits in around the southeast corner of the site into two portions. The long and short of it is ACHD requested that Aviator Street be brought north of the pump house lot and north of that section of the drain so that there's only one crossing in that area and not two crossings that would have happened if Aviator stayed on the alignment that it was on in its current uh, east-west portion right now. So the existing end of Aviator Street ends at the northeast corner of the Compass Charter School properties. And Councilmember Perot mentioned it there is that R15 portion that they had previously bought. They now have a parking lot in that area. And that was that area that um, Joseph had pointed out of as, as they were working on currently. So what we've gone ahead and done uh, is brought Aviator Street up into the site and allowed for a corner portion of the site to cross over into the neighbors, the, the southerly neighbors portion of their property. That's BPS Franklin Road LLC is the new owner. Um, we would have loved to have coordinated with them sooner, but they were in uh, their due diligence period of actually owning or purchasing and now owning the lot. So they are currently the owner and they've been a pleasure to work with ever, ever since we've gotten contact with them and they've actually had title of the lot. They've given us big thumbs up and said, we're really happy. You know, we go ahead and allow and come through the Northeast cor or Northwest corner of our site. This gives us a connection for the future, the alignment and the fact that the uh, aviator street curve is on such a wide, uh, swath of a curve. It gives ACHD a lot of uh, leeway on how we connect into it for the development to the south, which then means that that southern that developer to the south isn't tying in off a hard right angle turn or an S turn that comes in and is is uh, aggressive. So this this wide berth, it's a 500 foot radius for both of those corners of I'll call it an S turn, but it's more of a just a gentle curve gives some benefits. So we have an agreement in place with the developer to the south. They've been great to work with. And just as a side note, everyone that we've worked with thus far has been very, very good to work with. Continuing on with Aviator Street, to the east of us, we've worked with the developer who now owns that property. And as Joseph mentioned, they've contacted Joseph and they've gone through their preliminary or at least uh, first pre-app meeting. They've been great to work with well. It's a well-known developer in the Valley and, and somebody who uh, has merit and, and weight behind their name. 
and they're moving forward and they've and and they were excited that we were coming in because it gives that crucial link to aviator street which then allows a one two domino effect of, of this connection and this connectability through this portion of the site now just to talk a little bit more specifically about the site i kind of just want to point out a few of the things that joseph mentioned um, we have proposed some front loaded townhomes uh, and those are the two to three bedroom units that Joseph had mentioned. What we really wanted to do, and, and Joseph had really pushed us to, to try to meet as best we could, was the 10 mile plan. And that was those uh, garages that are set back from the site. And so by pushing the garages further back in the site and allowing the front uh, doors and the porches of the site, it really creates a nice feel and a nice aesthetic of the entire site in order to uh, have more pedestrian walkability and have something that looks a lot nicer as you are uh, strolling through the subdivision. This is just a typical street section. You can see that there's an eight foot landscape buffer between the back of walk or the back of curb and the sidewalk. And then there's gonna be another section of landscape buffer between the actual lands, uh, sidewalk and then the front of the home. This is just something that we'd envision this would look like. Obviously with the eight foot landscape buffer, there's a lot of opportunity for adding in landscaping that can go in that area. And, and if done well, which we plan to do, this is something that everyone would be excited about to live in. This is just a quick graph of what the actual site would look like. Um, on the previous plan, we, we uh, have shown, uh, we had the garages further forward. This was again, as I said, this was something that the 10 mile plan asks for. They really want garages pushed far back. They want homes that have cars tucked away so that when you're walking along the detached sidewalk, you have landscaping on the, to the one side, landscaping on the other side, and you don't have the cars right up against the sidewalk. You have them tucked away in the home. You have front porches. You have a nice aesthetic that really goes along with that. Um, these are the elevations, just a color version of what we had previously shown and Joseph has pulled up before. And then on top of that, we have some rear loaded townhomes that are fronting onto the pedestrian open space. And so this was something that we were excited about. Uh, I'd lived in a community that looked very similar to this and had a good opportunity to have um, the garages on the rear of the home have the fronting area opening onto that open space. This is actually the community that I used to live in that I was very proud to, to say that I lived here. It has the front of these homes opening onto that communal open space. It's just an area that that when people come in, they they love to walk into your home and, and it's not like you're walking off a street. It's just somewhere that, you know, adds that community uh, for this specific project. This is where the HOA meetings were held. They, they pulled up chairs and they had this area out here and it was just people more so coming into your yard and less about you sitting in your driveway and, and being a part of that. So this is kind of an idea of what we'd love to see in that area. These are some elevations that developer has worked on uh, in a different subdivision previously, but just some ideas of what the front of these townhomes would look like. Obviously, with the idea of having that usable open space with the uh, pedestrian walkability for your front door and something that really connects well, well having the garage on the back and having that car access and street portion on the rear of the house. These are proposed here with the garages on the rear of the house, front porches on the front, and then master uh, bedroom and, and additional bedrooms upstairs with that owner's, uh, sorry, master suite, and then having livable space on the first floor. And then lastly, uh, just want to talk about the conditional use permit. And this was something that uh, I just wanted to thank Joseph on. He had, he had really pushed that we, we move forward with the uh, multifamily portion of the site in order to help with the density. We had really uh, tried to see what we could make happen with looking at either single family, looking at the attached product, and, and Joseph had brought to light that there are some really good opportunities for us to use this space. So what we have here are the fourplex buildings, which are uh, set up against the irrigation district's easement, and then have a common or a private lane that connects all these areas. With the central portion of this site, we really wanted to move forward with adding an area that was usable, an area that people would actually go to. We have a dog park, we have the uh, children's uh, play areas, and we have the picnic pavilion. And just, just areas that we want people to spend time and areas that we want people to go to. Um, while still adding all of the open space that comes along with the fact that we had to give a hundred foot easement along the property boundary. So not only do we have the open space that uh, will be walkable and will be safe now that the irrigation district is piped, but also add some usable open space in the middle that if you have young children and if you wanna move in here, this is where you would take them. 
Um, the extension of Aviator Street, as I mentioned before, is just really crucial to this project and it's uh, a key development feature that, that the city can get behind or that we believe the city can get behind in order to uh, mitigate any traffic queuing or uh, off-peak connectivity for this area. As Joseph had made a comment about, Compass Charter School has uh, some traffic queuing issues that come along with the fact that they have a pickup and drop-off time that's off-peak hours. And then the connectivity of uh, collector roads network for the future development is just something that we're, we're happy about too. So overall, I just want to close with this site is uh, a, a brainchild of not just the developer, but staff has really pushed hard for some things. And, and we've been glad that they have because it's created a project that we're very happy with. And then we want to just uh, provide a product that hits that uh, price point for for uh, new home buyers and and units that uh, I can afford and units that uh, people of my generation or people that may be able to look at can actually come into. And I think by adding the uh, fourplex designs and adding the townhomes and adding those uh, connective uh, or sorry connected buildings, this is a first time home buyer's home. This is something that somebody can come into. These homes are planned on being individually titled, which means that each unit would be a townhome and each unit is something that we can move forward with. And with that, I just would like to uh, ask council to uh, consider approving this project and thank you for your support. Hey, Jason, council, any questions for the applicant? Mr. Burr? Where'd that come from? It's me. Oh. Mr. Burr. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, qu quick question. So why, why not do the, the, um, the, the entire project in townhomes, why did, why did we add the multifamily? Other than the density that was spoken about, is there another reason? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Burt, two reasons. First, obviously the density question or comment that you, you had raised, uh, that one's very simple. We wouldn't be at almost eight units per acre with the 75, which rounds up to the eight units per acre for this site. We wouldn't be at that, which would then allow, which would then mean that uh, the city council would be looking at a project which would be underperforming on its requested R15 zoning. So that was the first thing. The second thing is the 10 mile plan is very specific uh, that it would like to see a mixture of uh, housing units and types, which this fits into. It allows for that attached unit, it allows for the fourplexes. And so it's it's following the 10 mile plan as best that we can. Should I follow up? The only reason I asked, I mean, that's funny. We we referenced the ten mile plan when ninety percent of the units out there are are multifamily units. So may not be specific to this you know particular project, but I would like to personally see more townhomes out there. I think there's a ton of multifamily already. I just thought, Mr. Bear, that's what I'm going. James, um, I want to commend you. You guys have a challenging site. <laughs> you really do. You've, you've worked pretty hard to, to make things work. I was just curious on, on the drain and, and the uh, both of them, the Purdom and, and the other one there, how, how is that going to be maintained? Are you going to have actual green space mode? Are you going to have, you know, the tufted grass type of approach? What, what, what are you going to be doing with that space? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council, I, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Hoagland. Thank you, Council Member Hoagland. Um, so how I understand it, and, and this might be a little more nuanced, uh, it, it is the easement that is owned and maintained. It, it's on its own lot and it's within an easement that is owned and maintained by the HOA for this portion of the subdivision. There is some specific conditions that uh, Joseph had brought up that uh, talk about the grass area on that. If uh, Nampa Meridian Irrigation District will allow us to plant grasses there so that it isn't just a field full of weeds, that would be our goal. We would love to landscape it. Nampa Marine Irrigation District, obviously their main goal is get water from point A to point B, and they would rather not see a large tree over top of their pipe and whatnot. So it, it, in what I understand, it would be an HOA amenity or an HOA responsibility to be owned and maintained with in conjunction with whatever Nampa Marine Irrigation District will allow us to utilize in that space. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. So you mentioned that the townhomes uh, would be for sale, would be deeded. The fourplexes, uh, obviously not. Are those gonna be two-story? And also is the intention that they be um, 
owned by one entity or will they be individually available for purchase by investors? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Perot, uh, actually, sorry to clarify on this one. The individual townhomes, as they stand in this CUP, are proposed as being individual buildings that are titled and owned by one entity. However, it was the intent of the developer to set up the site in a way that if, if they wanted to, they could go further and subdivide each individual. Subdivide is not the right word. I'm sorry. Uh, condominium eyes or condominium plat each individual one so that they could be owned and maintained or, or the airspace could be uh, uh, situated in such a way that they could be individually titled. Right now, how it stands would it would be uh, one unit owned by one entity. If, if one entity bought all nine units, they would, they would be the majority owner of it and, and they would still have to conform to what the HOA has to say and what everything is written into the CCRs about the documents. But uh, the developer, as it stands, the, the goal was to set it up in such a way so that they could be built and then they could be sold individually so that they could, if, if that comes to that stage. That being said, it is still it, the maintenance and the, uh, uh, it's attached to the, to the maintenance shop, the, the storage, not the storage, the owner's, not, the office space. Thank you. I'm sorry. Oh. The office space, it, it's still a part of it. So it's still set up in a way that it could be in a situation where one entity owns the entire subdivision or the entire portion of the townhome projects, sorry, the townhome, the uh, fourplex projects, and that they are the owner, the maintainer, they, they rent out to the leases in this situation. Mr. Mayor. Sorry, just to add on to that. The elevations that Joseph has shown earlier, these are uh, townhomes or yes, sorry, fourplexes that are set up so that they are a first story and a second story townhome so that a livable space on the first story, uh, two to three bedroom units on the second story. So they, they are two stories, not a, a one story on or two units on the bottom, two units on the top, not split with where you're walking up into your unit. So you, you have one door on each corner of the building, which would be your unit. Sorry, just to answer that question. Thanks, Joe. Council, any additional questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. Ms. Quirk, do we have anyone signed up to provide testimony? Mr. Mayor, yes, we do. William Tillman. <coughs> and he is declining. Okay. And we have nobody online except for Christy, unless she really wants to weigh in. Um, is there anybody else that would like to provide testimony on this item? If you would like to, now is the time. Deputy Chief, are you looking to speak on this item? Sure, I was. I was waiting to make sure there was nobody else okay. before I jumped in because uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the fire sprinkler and access stuff. Um, Planner Joe and myself and Jaden have worked a lot on this project to make sure that um access is good and the the project is safe so with this project um timing is going to be key uh so we're working with them on secondary access uh they don't have it currently at least we haven't seen it yet uh that i've approved and so uh i believe the way we have talked the last i remember they're gonna do the multifamily first because that has to be sprinklered anyway, because that's built under the IBC. Uh, the townhomes, um, as they're sitting on individually lots can be built under the IRC. Um, but if by that time they start, if they do not have secondary access, it's in my agreement and it's also in Joe's notes that they will have to sprinkler the townhomes. Um, the caveat to all of that is, is the secondary access and also we have to work with the land development group ahead of time because they have to know so they can lay the right pipe the proper pipe is laid for sprinkler systems because you have to have a one inch water line for the townhomes so um again there's a lot of little caveats to the whole thing but i i think we've got it figured out to where we can make it happen so I just wanted to talk about that because it it really is it's it's a big thing, and I just wanted to make sure it wasn't skipped. 
Thank you. Councilman Pearl. Mr. Mayor, question for Chief Mongiorno. So if in this situation, if everything were sprinklered and there's would not be a requirement for secondary emergency access, I get that it could help in the case of a fire, but what about all the other functions the fire department does, like getting somebody out of a second floor window or help me understand that outside yeah. of just a building, a burning building? So we we obviously can only do so much. And so sprinklers, um, because we have a lot of people that die in fires, as a matter of fact, uh, we the latest NFPA numbers were, were unfortunately on a bad uh, route right now of deaths in homes because of fires. Um, so we're trying to get back to the basics and tell people, you know, be careful in your homes. So in this case, uh, the fire sprinklers, um, at one point it was nobody has ever died in a sprinklered home from a fire. Um, I, I don't think that's true anymore, but still it's very, very low. So, um, so as far as human parts go, um, obviously we have the time as, uh, what does Chief Bloom say? Uh, time is, uh, what was it? Somebody said it, time is not, time is money, but yes. no, it's uh, time is tissue. So if somebody's, if grandma's having a heart attack, then yes, this, this project is stated in my report is outside of our five minute response time. Um, even with station eight being built, this is that whole black cat Franklin area is a no man's land. So we, we need land out there. I'm working with a couple of the developers out there to find some property. Uh, we need station number nine and it needs to go out there at that black cat and Franklin area. So our, um, our Linda road overpass will allow us access to several areas. Yes, it will. It That'll will help. That. Definitely. Yes. The mayor's correct. But anyway, so we have a, we have a hole there where we don't, we're, we're outside of our green, my green blob that I, that you guys see on my maps. So um, what we recommend with, with the developers and people that are putting in clubhouses is get an AED. So if you can put an AED in the, in the clubhouse, uh, you know, and like we've done in our parks, that at least gives us that ability to, you know, hey, you go, go run and grab the AED and, and I'll start CPR. So we have that. And then obviously we have our public education division that um, I hope to expand this next budget year. Um, and they can work with the HOAs and go out and do CPR classes and we can do stop the bleed classes and we can do all of that. Um, but the big thing for us is, you know, obviously is we want to prevent fires. So sprinklers do that. So it's, it's kind of a multifaceted thing. Council, any additional questions, comments, testimony? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoagland. Mr. Mayor, appreciate your response. Uh, Deputy Chief Bongiorno, um, being out, having had the misfortune of being there early in the morning when school's coming and, and having come back one time early to home and it was, being let out, um, it, it was just amazing to see the, the gridlock that occurs there. So there is that timing issue of when something happens. And so since Christy stuck with us for so long, I, I just want to make sure she gets, you know, ACHD gets some money's worth out of her. Um, Christy, I, I know that ACHD doesn't want to do roads where they go, you know, two lane to five lane, back to two lane and that sort of thing. But the Black Cat from Franklin to the railroad tracks, when we approved Henley, Henley, Henley or Hensley? Hensley, yeah, Hensley Station, um, they, they committed right of way for road expansion to, to the railroad tracks for that, that portion. Um, I, I just, I just want to put a bug in your ear that that really needs to have a turn lane there. And, and it's just a... a a situation that you know, is in need of a solution sooner as opposed to later. So I just see it as an extension of the intersection from uh, Franklin 
up Black Cat to about the, the, the railroad crossing. And then you can go back to two lanes. Of course, then you hit 10 mile. And, I mean, the, the, the Pine Street and need to turn lane there. But that would really help a bad situation. And, and we're looking at adding more homes, more traffic. There will be, uh, uh, in, in timely fashion, uh, another uh, way out. But uh, any any thoughts? Is that completely impossible out of the question? But I and going past those homes, I know they planned for it, and I know ACHD's prepared them for it. So, what 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 say you, um, Mr. Um, or sorry, um, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Hoagland? Right? <laughs> sorry, I've been on here so long. You guys are getting your money's worth. Um, so we are ACHD is aware um, of the concerns and the issue there, and it's and it's been something that traffic um, is also concerned with. So um, this is an area, um, I can't give any definitive. Um, I know our traffic is looking at some um, options there, um, but just in turning it on a planning level with the next update to the integrated five-year work plan, we are, this is an area of need. So it is, it is an area that we're hoping to add um, into, the, into the next update to get that black, black cat section from Franklin um, up to Cherry added in to get that, that roadway improved. Mr. Mayor? That's not going. Mr. Mayor and Christy, thank you. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear it's on their radar and, and they're aware of it, which I, I knew they would be. I'm, I'm sure they've heard a lot about it. So I appreciate that. And that would certainly help uh, this development and all the ones that come after that, as well as that uh, other access point going out to Franklin, and which I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that timing to make sure everything fits together, because that really is about as we heard from the last application, it's, it is about timing, when things are going to occur, uh, when it comes to the roads and, and the development, and can we make it fit together? Mr. Mayor, Councilman um, Hoagland, absolutely. Timing, timing is always key. Um, and like I said, it is, it is an area that is, that is in hyper-focus, I think, as well for us, as, along with other roadways. Um, what can help with some of that is uh, the city's um, elevation of that project as well. Um, we do request that the city submit a priority list each year. And currently that segment is very low on your list. So um, when we get to that point where we're asking for updates, this may be something the city can help elevate this by um, moving it up on their prioritization list. And perhaps we do just what you mentioned is breaking this up. We this commission may be not have the same thing, but we can look at Five Mile, we can look at Cloverdale. Previously, they've only done a section of a road uh, when their improvements make sense and connecting to other roads. But maybe that's one way to get this section done quicker for cheaper. So. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. Along the lines of Councilman Hoagland's um, comments, you all, <laughs> all my fellow council members have been hear me squawking about this area for the all the time I've been on here and my three years on planning and zoning. Um, when Hensley Station, actually when Compass came in, uh, I was planning and zoning commissioner and I was not a fan of that location, kind of envisioning exactly what's happened, which is this traffic issue on Black Cat with you know, buses coming out one way and parents coming out the other way. And Compass said, um, no, 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 we're not gonna have a track program. No, 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 the kids are not gonna run on the street. No, we're not gonna be utilizing Black Cat for, for you know, um, uh, for PE, but they do. And from the first couple of weeks that Compass was done being built, um, sixth graders were running on Black Cat along the, along the um, railroad track with no shoulders and no safety. And um, so I not only have concerns about, about Black Cat, but I have concerns about Aviator too, because there, is, there are a lot of people walking on that street. And it's a narrow street. I know it's supposed to be built to a collector, but Hensley Station's not done yet. Hopefully it will, it will function better when they've got all their construction stuff off of Aviator. But as it is right now, I don't see adding additional um, traffic to this section as it currently sits. It's not functional enough to do that. So for me, my comfort level is to wait to see the timing of when Aviator would extend through the property to the east. Um, and I know that there's multiple uh, parcels that it would need to go through to connect to Franklin. 
Um, so I just, I have significant concerns about just east and west with, with Aviator and it, it, it doesn't feel like it's built currently in the section that is built to handle what would be two dense uh, multifamily projects. As far as the design goes, I'm really thankful that the applicant has spent an incredible amount of time figuring out what's happening with this drain. Um, great work on that, but I think there's just a lot of questions still to be answered that aren't quite ready, especially the secondary emergency access. I mean, if you have somebody that has a heart attack, you know, a lot of our paramedic services come from the fire department, not from the county. And if they can't access that in a timely way, then, then we lose some of that um, paramedic service as well. Well, since we have we reached that point, would the applicant like to come forward for any final comments? Mr. Mayor, members of council, I just wanted to, uh, again, thank you for your time. Uh, Fire Chief Bonjour, uh, you're directly on and uh, everything you've said is exactly what we've discussed and what we are in agreement with in regards to uh, fire protection and uh, sprinkler system phasing the project so that um, the, the units that go up first would be in a, in a manner that follows the International Building Code and fire protection and, and that is the plan of the project moving forward. Um, as, as I was expecting, the extension of Aviator Street is, is an issue that is uh, something that just needs to be taken care of. And um, honestly, we've, we, there's a couple of comments that we'd love to make and love to talk about as, as we talk about this specific portion of the street. Um, the extension of Aviator Street and how it pertains to the neighboring parcel to the south um, as they move forward, it would be uh, my assumption or, or my understanding of the developer to the south would they would be providing emergency access for their subdivision, as well as tying into Aviator Street. And that's just a continuation of all of the other subdivisions and all the other projects that are coming along in this long slender portion. So if you look at the Compass Charter School and the portion and the neighboring parcels next door, there's these long skinny parcels, which are very difficult to build on. And by limiting the access to Franklin as ACHD is requesting, we are connecting to Aviator Street. So the extension of Aviator Street at this portion is just another key role in providing that future connection. If this portion of Aviator Street does not go in and does not add this connection, then the subdivision that's due east of this subdivision is an extension of Aviator Street that does not provide the key de uh, development and key access for the Compass Charter School to outlet. And it's, as, as we said in the presentation, it's the, uh, the developer to the east is moving forward. The developer to the east has already provided plans that to the city and to us that show the extension of Aviator Street, which provides a direct connection, connection to Franklin. It is that overflow. It is that outlet. This connection in conjunction with the neighboring parcel to the east is the key that gives that outlet, that Compass Charter School second portion. And so we are just really excited about the opportunity to provide this area and to be that, that key piece that allows the future connection. And I didn't mention it earlier in my report or in my presentation, I just wanted to mention it that uh, we, we are in agreement with everything that staff has put forward for this project and we're really happy to, to move forward with it. Thank you. Thank you. That's my whole Mr. Mayor, James, if the council were to approve this, what? Uh, first phase would be multifamily. What's the timing of that from when you would start anticipating completion? Sure. So one of the uh, maybe the biggest detriment to the developer, which is the biggest uh, uh, benefit to the city, is the fact that the irrigation district and the irrigation timing is now and we can't do those constructions. We can't tie into the irrigation lateral with our main portion. And I'll see if I'll switch back just to kind of give you a little bit more context to it. But as I talk about it, that connection can't actually happen until after irrigation system has been completed. So that will be in the fall. So the earliest time that we could even connect across Aviator or the, the portion of Aviator and finally build out this subdivision would be after the piped irrigation system is put into this site. So right now, what Napa Meridian Irrigation District has allowed us to do is to put in 50 feet back from this headwall for this is the outlet portion of the site because the Purdom Gulch drain, drain 
drains from the southeast to the northwest. So 50 feet back from here, we're allowed to start our construction. And then 50 feet back from the head wall where the water comes in down here in the south what east corner of the site, we're allowed to stop our construction. So the pipe section for aviator is going in, but it is not connecting into the drain. And we are going to have to wait all through the summer, all through into the fall into, I believe it is uh, the end of October when the irrigation district will allow you to actually connect into their design. So that means that we will wait all through the summer and there won't be any construction that is pertaining to actually building or anything there and we're, we're going to be waiting on that. So then it'll wait into the fall, the irrigation district will then allow us to move forward with our connection. After that time, we will finally be able to connect Aviator Street through and finish all the connections. So this loop road here in the northwest corner, as you see here, it comes up and it crosses over the irrigation drain. That won't be able to even be starting construction until fall, winter, most likely spring of 2023. So the time frame for this sub subdivision, even though we're looking for approval now, fits in nicely with the subdivision that's coming to the east as if they are pushing forward as they've propositioned and they've been pushing to the city, they might even be done before we're done. They might even be at that point where they are pushing in. We're just really excited about having the approvals in place and having that situation where we can be coordinating with the developer to the east and working together as a team in order to make this connection happen and then provide the city that necessary outlet. Councilman Hunkel. Follow up with Joseph with what you know with uh, future development. Is it possible to have decent timing on this? I know it's again, there's lots of things people have to do, but uh, is that feasibility in play? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Hogan, it's a great question. I generally, I think I agree with what Jaden has said. It's timing obviously is an issue. Um, I think with the irrigation portion, like we all know, it's not going to happen now. <laughs> That's going to put a nice de facto delay on it. Um, obviously, I can't predict how the project to the east would go, but I can say if this project doesn't move forward, the same issue we're talking about with this now becomes their problem because they will not have their secondary access anywhere either, and they would be proposing vastly more units than this. So you run into the same problem, chicken and egg thing, and, and it's it's kind of one of them becomes the key. Uh, it's kind of which one do you want to be? You want it to be a smaller one or a bigger one? Um, I think that's a big conversation to have. Um, that existing parcel to the east has a current private land connection to Franklin, but my understanding is ACHD does not want that to remain. And a lot of other discussions I've had internally, we're not expecting that to remain as a connection to Franklin. So the only way to get to Franklin is going to be through that subdivision and subsequent, subsequently through this one. So um, it, I think timing is going to have to work out. I don't know if I don't have a specific timing condition regarding building permits in the DA, as we have discussed previously and has been put on applications before. I don't know if that's city council's purview or what that kind of timing would be amenable for the applicant. I'm sure they would appreciate that more than a denial, but um you know. Joe, you kind of got into my head because it's like chicken and egg, mm -hmm. get get worse before you can get better or make everybody wait until right. they all collaborate on timing and road improvements before anyone can start doing any of their project. Or else, you, yeah, otherwise you you will, Black Cat Franklin will get worse before, um, or who knows how long, because if one of them <laughs> doesn't move forward, backs out, Correct. Who's interest, you may not get it if you don't condition them all to a certain extent. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor. Council on Pro. Uh, I'm thinking along those exact same lines. If there's the chicken and egg element, if, if you were to put an order in my mind, I, I love the fact that we're having conversation about this entire area, not just one project. If you were to put things in an order that would make sense to me, um, I want to see the improvements on a black cat first before even if even if the the eastern um, development if that application was before us I would still want to see because likely what's going to happen is is this the uh, aviator if it connects down to Franklin they're going to want to ride in and ride out possibly just like they did with the compass I don't know if they will but because Franklin's a, a five-lane road there they tend to have those um, 
exits, you know, they tend to not allow them to turn left on those. And so if that happens, if that's a requirement, then everybody's going to want to take Aviator out to Black Cat and not head down to Franklin as a, as a main uh, exit on that collector. So that's my biggest concern is, you know, we approve the one to the east before yours, we approve yours before theirs. But however it comes down to Franklin, whatever limitation ACHD decides to put on that, then I'm concerned that everybody's going to head back out to Aviator and, and exit on Black Hat. And we're back to kind of the same conversation we're having right now. So um, in my opinion, if the, can you pull back up the slide that shows uh, where the proposed Aviator, I don't know if that was your slide or, or planning slide that the proposed Aviator would run to. Um, I, I would rather hear the, the, and see the information for the applicant. Okay, so it will go solely through their property. It won't go through an, another property. I would rather hear the application for the property to the east. And I don't like, I don't like um, approving developments that are in where we are required to get an answer on another project that's coming. Because if that project gets denied, then everything that you've recommended and suggested about this aviator coming through is no longer an option. And now we, we're sending cars back out to Black Hat with the same issue that we've discussed. So as far as timing goes, I would rather see the project to the east approved before this one is for myself. That's my thought. Mr. Mayor, may I comment on that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Perot, uh, I completely understand. And I agree with, with the concern and I agree with everything that you're saying. Uh, perhaps uh, Fire Chief Bonjour can I, uh, add to this. I, 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 a comment that Joseph made, the other project, it, it's 20 plus acres, if I remember correctly. It's, it's in the magnitude of hundreds of homes to reach that density, 20, 20 units at, at 12 units per acre. It's, it's hundreds of units. It is a single connection, as you can see off of um, this connection down in the southeast corner. It's a single connection. I just personally, and, and maybe uh, the fire chief can join, join in on here, I understand your concern and you're saying this would be a hard sell for us to connect in with they if, or if you don't have a second connection. I think it's going to be an even harder sell if it's hundreds of units trying to come forward if they don't have a second connection. But I completely understand everything that you were making a comment on about that concern about the black hat about everything there. I would just go back to our comment about the uh, or reiterate our comment about the keenness of this connection in order to provide that relief and that overflow valve for a much needed portion that that needs to have that moving forward. Mr. Mayor. That's one pearl. Before we close the public hearing, I do have another question for the applicant. So um, given what I had just stated, if in my opinion, the 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 future application, future project to the east needs to be heard first. Are you agreeable to that? Would you be willing to continue your hearing until we can get more information on that? Or would you rather us, you know, if, if it goes that direction, I know at this point I would vote no, but I would be amenable to a continuation. It's going to be months out because we don't know when this is going to get heard. But I would rather offer that option to you than to vote against it because I don't I, I do think there's some tweaking that needs to be done to your project but for the most part I'm I don't I think it's a, a good design I agree with Councilman Burnt I'd like to see the townhomes plenty of multifamily in this area not to mention that um, there's a couple other projects in Meridian where the individual lots have been sold off to individual investors with fourplexes and you would hope that they would all keep and maintain their their one building similar to one another but they don't and it's created lots of issues with code enforcement it's created lots of issues with the tenants um, there's one in the corner of 10 mile and pine across from the chevron constant problems with that development because they're all owned by individual investors and the hoa is fighting with them all the time to you know you have one individual person like me who owns a fourplex they're not property managers they're not used to maintaining a building of that size they think it's like maintaining a home and it's not. And so that's what we tend to see in these lots that have one investor that owns a fourplex that's just a, you know, and that doesn't mean individuals can't do a great job, but it tends to not be very cohesive and consistent. And so it creates some issues that way as well. So I'm not a fan of that actual business model. 
but the city can't legislate that. So um, what are your thoughts on the continuation? Sure, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Pro, and I, I completely understand your comment, just to jump to the second comment first and then to the first. Um, the density is is the biggest thing. We we would we'd be open to proposing just townhomes. We looked at it with Joseph, and I could send you. We went through something like twenty six iterations internally on this project to try to get density. It's a six four five maybe six unit per acre project. This is an R fifteen zoning with just townhomes, and that is the big thing. I I, I just my understanding is that council put together this zoning map and this comprehensive plan for a reason they want the density and this is how this is how you get density on a site like this if there wasn't an irrigation canal that was taking up 100 foot of easement through here this project could be a slam dunk of a of a 10 units per acre it would be perfect it would fit in excellent the problem is the site constraints of this are just not feasible to really allow a project with one density and two site constraints if the Compass Charter School didn't have a storm drain there and they were willing to move it, great, you can get more density, we can go more townhomes. Long story short, that is our, that's our situation there. In regards to your first comment, I think that the developer would be open to it. However, I really feel like there could potentially be some options to uh, work with council to find a manner that we would be a little bit more palatable towards. For, for, for ants, sorry, perhaps looking at um, uh, deed restricted lots that show that in order to, uh, as as we had worked with uh, the fire chief on uh, irrigate or uh, uh, putting in the ear sprinkler systems. Thank you, irrigation. Putting in the sprinkler system for individual buildings being a condition of that secondary access. Perhaps there's something like a deed restricted lot for half the site that would say, great, you can only build half of your units at this time. At that time, then you can move forward because now there's a secondary connection, at which point building permits can get pulled. That's, we just feel confident that the developer to the east is ready to move in and ready to move with it. And we're excited and obviously just like any developer would be, we're excited to move forward. So I, I would hope that there would be a, a faster way to get about what you're asking for. Um, if it's a condition of uh, we will just deny your project, obviously we'd be more open to looking at uh, continuation and working with the developer to the east. Um, I, I don't know if the developer to the east ever actually wrote anything specifically. They had made a comment that they were going to write a letter to city council to say that, uh, you know, big thumbs up to this project. We're, we want this to go through because this is crucial to our project. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sure. The adjacent owner did send in that letter. Um, it's one of the things that it, they did before the planning commission, I believe. Um, I also wanted to comment on the, just quickly with the comments about the townhomes versus multifamily. Um, I don't, and Mr. Neri can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if council has the purview to say no based on density, if it, because we're at the plat stage. I don't know if we can do that. It meets the density, it therefore, you know, we got to move that portion of it forward. If we were to say, oh, you can't have multifamily, um, that would require a comprehensive plan map amendment because they're not going to be able to meet the density with just townhomes. It's just physically not going to happen with the requirement of the drain in its location. One of the iterations that we had had a nice loop road and had 100% townhomes and it would have met, but they crossed the drain twice. So Nampur Meridian said no. So uh, to that point, I just want to make sure that we're not, I don't want to steer the applicant that direction if, if, we, if we can't do that. And I don't know that we should if we've already done two map amendments on this property now. So um, that's the, yeah. I, if we need a condition regarding timing, again, open to doing that. Obviously the applicant's open to the continuance too. Wish I could help with the black hat stuff, but can't. Mr. Mayor. Missionary. Thank you back on what Joe just said. I mean, again, this is annex property, so it is entitled. It is, it's the comp plan. So it, it is a CUP. So some of the conditions like Councilmember Perot was talking about or what you just offered um, about timing and buildings and, and phasing of that of that multifamily portion can be conditioned in the CUP. I mean, that can, you know, building permit, you know, issuing building permits can be a condition on CUP. 
So there can be ways maybe to address what your concerns are. Um, I don't know if we can resolve them all tonight. So I don't know if that's, if we can clarify what specific conditions and that would again give the applicant planning time to craft those conditions as part of a CEP that might be cleaner than a continuance that's dependent on another property coming forward, which could happen in three months or three years. So. Mr. Mayor. I would like to clarify one last time. I keep saying DA provisions, but that's not before us tonight. I'm used to a plat and an annexation. Um, my apologies, it would have to be a plat condition. I apologize, which can still be associated with timing. We've done that before. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hogan. To kind of continue the discussion, you know, we talk about chicken and the egg. And to me, if, if we don't approve this, then why would, what, what's the incentive for the person to the East go? I mean, that's, that's the linchpin. We know Marco Way comes to their property line. If we approve this development, it will go to their property line here on the West. So now they have incentive to move forward. They know that they have that connection available on both ends and they can do it. If we don't do this one tonight, then, well, we're, we're, we're stuck with the same situation. Mr. Mayor. My, uh, my view of it. Councilwoman Pro. Sorry, Councilman Hoagland. I thought you were finished speaking. I apologize. Um, I, I hear what you're saying. However, I see the property is to the east, to the east as being able to potentially develop and not have to have the property the west if they're able to exit out San Marco Way and down to Franklin. But I don't see property, the, the subject property being able to develop and and have aviator as their main entrance and exit uh, with the assumption that the east property doesn't develop so i feel like the east property could develop and still function safely and reasonably connecting to the south to franklin but i don't see that same possibility i i would have grave concerns that the property to the east would not would not get approved and how we're stuck having this aviator street going nowhere for now um, and, and just, I just see a lot of safety issues. So my only, at this point, I feel like my, the only thing that would, that would ease my concern about that is if it was conditioned such that this could not be, um, a certificate of occupancy could not be issued until black cat road improvements are done. Mr. Mayor. Yes, show. Just to be clear, this is a black cat versus Franklin access issue that you're having right councilman Perot? yes i yeah it's it's not my concern isn't as much the emergency the emergency access there's a concern there but my concern is is actual traffic being generated by the development as far as safety on aviator if if the east property were never to get approved or at least not in the near future i have a lot of concerns about aviator adding more traffic to it it's just not functioning well right now as it is mr mayor follow up um, the other potential caveat to this is if the the property to the south um, does redevelop um, they will more than likely have an access to franklin as well and granted it's much closer to compass understood um, but that is another potential there um, i the previous application that was there and then they withdrew had an access out to franklin and it was not a temporary and ACHD was gonna be okay with it. So I believe that that would be what they anticipate as well. And I don't know, again, timing, <laughs> that doesn't go away, yeah. but there may be multiple avenues out. Um, I just, again, chicken and egg. So, so Joe, this is where my, you know, again, I, I may or may not be involved in any conversation tonight or moving forward, but to me, this is an, an area that we really need a master plan to access for this area to under, have a better understanding where people should actually be inter, exiting. Yeah. To the to uh, Councilman Perot's point, I mean, Black Hat and Franklin, that that may we may be able to get ACHD to do that sooner, but there's so many of these long skinny parcels in this area that may all want to individually have access. Maybe none of them should have access. Where should the access line up in this area to provide the best functionality? 
for this area because you know in my opinion because of compass charter I, I would suggest we want to get everyone to access closer to franklin than on to black cat because of the train tracks and everything else in this area that, that that's my non-traffic engineer two cents but until we can look at this area in a whole and figure this out because i'm like i don't want this large acre or this one to be conversing down through and maybe going out on Scunity or driving through. I mean, we just heard the last application or applications tonight where people don't want 20 houses driving through their area. Now we're, we could be talking about hundreds of homes driving by some homes to exit out on because we don't have, I don't think we have, I don't think that there's a traffic plan for this 200 acres in this area through you know and it probably really really needs one so that's my two cents on this project is i i think the unfortunate all the what about all these other property owners that don't have the little lines on it they, they have plans to do anything are they going to stay there for another 30 years 50 years i don't know it's my two cents on mr mayor um i have had a meeting with achd about this whole area with uh, Mr. Parsons, and that was uh, the topic of discussion. I said, well, what the heck is going on out here? What are what are the plans? With an assumption that a lot of these little tiny parcels, especially these ones, would be remaining for quite some time, um, just because my understanding is they're not interested in redeveloping, and then you know we don't make people, and that's fine. Um, I think more than not, more area of this area than not will redevelop in the near one to two years, more than likely. Um, and where those accesses are to Franklin, um, I wish I had gotten more concrete answers from who was in the ACHD meeting, but I did not. Um, they kind of pushed it back on us as to where we would allow or not allow, which doesn't coincide with other conversations I've had. Um, obviously, offset requirements are there, but I think there will be multiple accesses to Franklin, at least two, I would say, that will be permanent access is my understanding that the temporary access and ascent is now wanting to be a permanent access um, by ACHD. So that's one. Um, there's potential that that would connect east, well, ascent would connect east west through adjacent sites and then out to the collector as well. So there wouldn't just be this access to Franklin. Could be this one, could be another one here. Um, then you can throw in the wrench of there's the existing DA for Compass Charter says once they have a road here they have to close their access to franklin too so there's a lot of different pins going on here so uh i i hear your point i don't necessarily know and i've heard this over the years do you lay all this at the feet of one application i don't know that's for council and, and while it's not before us you know, on a personal level um and I, I could go almost the opposite direction where the applicant i could the townhome portion of this project i if that was split off and we could only do that, personally, I would could support moving a portion of this forward and have an exit out to Black Cat. It may not be my preference for today to help move along those next pieces to help those dominoes, but not doing the rest of the CU reduces somewhat of the traffic, allows some of it to move forward, but allows a, a larger conversation to occur with the rest of the property owners in the area to figure this out over time. Because I think that that's an important part, but that's. I don't know that that's an outcome from today, just my two cents and it flip flops your conversation about fire and but food for thought. And it's a portion that everyone seems to support as a townhome section, at least I can't say everyone, but at least from what I heard. Mr. Mayor, just to, and I do not want to argue with you in any way, you pay my bills. It's okay. Um, the generally, from what I do understand about traffic studies, and I am not a traffic engineer, single family homes actually tend to generate more trips per day than multifamily. Um, and then the unit count on this is pretty even. It's actually a couple more single family than the multifamily. So I see your point. Um, it's, it's, it's not our unit, it's just the part that people tend to like is that right. is the townhome more than the multifamily at this point in time. Yeah, understood. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pro. For the record, uh, I also voted against Hensley Station <laughs> for the same reasons that I just have stated, which is 
that this, especially that railroad track corner no, and no sidewalks, the shoulders are rough. It's just the, the black hat just needs those improvements. It needed it before Hensley station. I wasn't happy that got approved either. Um, so that's where I'm at. I, I, I don't think it's a no. I just think it's not yet. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Just for closing comments for us, uh, we're excited to move forward in whatever capacity that is. Um, obviously, we'd be less excited about a denial. Um, for the comments uh, given tonight, uh, the, the, the fact that we believe that we're a key infrastructure improvement and, and of great benefit to the city with adding this connection through here. Um, again, to reiterate the time frame of this project, even if we had a, a complete and unanimous approval today and engineering drawings miraculously approved tomorrow, it can't be built tomorrow. It cannot, it cannot move forward at the earliest until the end of the irrigation season. And if you're in the construction industry, you understand that no one's going to be paving in January, February. You're not even going to be able to get to that point where you actually have your approval. This is a 2023 project. This is a project that comes at a later date. Obviously, with the entitlements process and the fact that the developer is ready to move forward and ready to make plans for the future, that is where we're ready uh, to ask the council to approve it and ask it to move forward. However, like I said, we're ready to work with council to find a, a common ground and we'd be excited to uh, find some situation that would do that. But as I've hammered on many points, I, we strongly feel as this is the key uh, Keystone project to get the connection and to be that overflow and to be that um, a, that way for to mitigate this problem to no longer let Compass Charter School cause a problem on Black Hat. This is the first step in a number of steps to creating a remedy to an existing problem. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Burr. Just a question for the applicant. What, what were your thoughts about what the mayor had suggested? Uh, can you be a little more specific? Sorry about that. About his comment about doing the townhomes now to create that connectivity and, and not the um, overuse portion of it till. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Burnt, um, yeah, we we'd be open to exactly to something that would involve that, uh, and it, for that exact reason that we would want to add that connectivity and we want to add that. Um, I, I guess in our ideal situation, we think that that would be uh, a little bit more contingent on adding the connectivity for the developer to the east and adding that there. Uh, it, I, you had made just a comment there about a traffic it was it a traffic study or a, a traffic plan there. Uh, yes. So I think I think that in our time frame and in our mindset of what we understand to the developers in the in the surrounding area, they're they're ready to move forward. And and given our time frame, as I said before, I think that they might even be done prior to what we can do, given the fact that we're kind of hamstringed with irrigation season. But yes, we're absolutely open to that. And as I had mentioned to Councilmember uh, Perot. Uh, earlier about uh, potentially, and I had used the term deed restricting the lots, uh, being it a non-buildable lot until you have uh, the connectivity in a similar manner to how we had talked about sprinkler systems. So yes, that's a, absolutely something that we'd be much more open to as opposed to just a firm no on this project. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoekman. In regards to that, uh, doing the townhomes first, though, would, would uh, maybe a question for Deputy Chief Bongiorno, would they be required to be sprinklered? Yes, sir, they would. What if they limited it to a certain number in that? Is it... Hensley Station wrecked that. So it's, okay. they would have to be sprinklered unless between, like, like 
Jaden's been saying it's it's timing. So unless between now and whenever they start their first uh, builds, we've got that secondary access either from that property to the south or something else. Um, so if that happens, because I know the the builder to the south has been contacting me weekly, so he's getting ready to come forth with something that's going to have an access out to Franklin. So if that happens, then, and, and it gets approved, then they're clear to go without um, sprinklers. Mr. Mayor. Council on Pro. Question for Joe. So we can't condition based on another private party's process. So we could condition it based on whether ACHD improves black cat, right? But we couldn't condition it on what any, any timing of any of the surrounding private properties, can we? Um, is my understanding that not necessarily, no, Mr. Neri shaking his head no, but I, I, I know I've heard of, uh, you can't get building permit until a secondary access is available something like that. It would be a little bit more broad than saying this specific parcel gets approvals or something, but it could be uh, no building permits until Aviator gets extended, no building permits until there's another connection to Franklin, period, something along those lines, but not specifically to a parcel, no. If Mr. Members, Council Joe's right. So yeah, we can't really condition on another application or we can condition on conditions that, like he's talking about another access point, a different a different way to get there improvement to the roadway i mean all of those things are reasonable based on the code but we couldn't condition on somebody else's approval mr mayor Council on pro my concern about my concern with um conditioning on there being a secondary access is that those don't always that doesn't necessarily mean a road that everybody drives sometimes the secondary accesses are just used for the fire department so you could specify that, that doesn't alleviate my concerns about actual traffic. Sure. Councilman, you can also specify that in your condition too. It could be not a emergency secondary access, but a public road access, a secondary public road access. That could be part of that condition. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoglin. As we talk about conditions, I, I'm more inclined to support a condition that is a secondary or main access uh, alternatively as opposed to black cat just because you have uh, a public entity ACHD not that they don't want to do it but they have competing interests and so it's just a matter of where does it fit when does it fit here you have developers who are trying to develop their property and they have a self-interest to get it done so I, I see that happening sooner uh, than, than a public entity just because the interests are different, competing interests, so. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Borden. <clears throat> to that point, could this application be approved, the townhomes be permitted to proceed, and one of the conditions on the CUP for the multifamily be that no permits are issued on those until the secondary access connect an aviator to Franklin. Mr. Mayor, I think that would work. I don't see how you, know, you can do it the other way as well, whichever way works. The CUP, the CUP allows us to do that on the multifamily. So does the plat too. Yeah, correct. Just to add in one more caveat, because potentially you never know what's gonna happen. Would you also want to allow if ACHD improved Black Cat, that would release it? Mr. I don't know how you would articulate language improve black cat it has to be pretty specific if black cat was improved well you would just i think you would end the sentence with unless black cat road is improved by ACHD, then such and such that we've nary and bill parsons and i have wordsmithed quite a few things with conditions just food for thought thank you correct mr mayor that's what I'm the applicant can, can respond. I would assume the less sprinkling you have to do, the, the better off yeah, that, that would be more desirable. So if there's a secondary access, fire department has two access points, you don't have to sprinkle the townhomes, 
that's that's a money savings and and you want a lower price point we all want lower price points for homes now so um, your thoughts on that uh mr mayor uh, it, we absolutely you're completely correct and uh as uh fire chief bonjourno has made comments before uh about the fire safety and the sprinklers we're absolutely ready to sprinkler every building if that was the requirement we, we will want to move forward with this project either way but you are completely correct with what you're what you're stating there about cost saving measures and uh, measures just to uh, comply with safety standards. But if that safety standard is uh, the safety of the community is paramount with sprinklers, that condition can be met. Um, it doesn't seem like that would be necessary with a secondary access. And uh, if that if that's the condition that's before us, then we'd be excited to move forward with the with the uh, subdivision. Mr. Mayor. Council on Pro. I just want to understand more clearly the purpose of allowing the townhomes to be built um, prior to the the multifamily. If we're going to require secondary access or another main road access, then then why distinguish the timing of the two separate parts of the of the deal? Yeah. My two cents, I didn't know if, this, if the CUP was going to be moving forward or not for the, so that was my comment. My comment was that people seemed to like the townhomes. They weren't convinced that they even liked the multifamily. So that's why I was making that suggestion because it seemed to be the part that had the best chance and getting something moving allows the road to be considered. But it, I, I don't know where the council was on the, there seemed to be some questions from some of the council about what they wanted to see or prefer in that area. And if you if you want to go down that road, I think that's another conversation as well. Mr. Mayor. Council on Pro. I'm amenable to a condition, both with the plat and the CUP, that there isn't any um, billing permits issued until there is a main, a second main access. I'm not comfortable with allowing half of it to be developed and half of it not and i just i think it needs to be um you know all completed and right. go ahead put the infrastructure in do the drain do all that stuff but just not allow for a building permit until that that second access is done i'm comfortable with that mr mayor to be clear i've heard two different versions of that now so i just want to make sure um whoever makes the motion either a piece of it's going forward prior to the access or none of it is going forward prior to the second access i just want to make that very clear yes yeah, someone will make that clear whatever they decide <laughs> thank you <laughs> mr mayor yeah, I, mr mayor and council i just want to make sure it's clear according to the fire code anything over 30 on a single access, as long as it's sprinklered, is allowed by the fire code. So they can build all of it. All of it would be sprinklered and it would meet code. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Yes, Mr. Mayor. That's one pro. I appreciate that. My concern is not as much the fire safety because the applicant has already said they would sprinkler its traffic concerns and safety around the charter school, um, pedestrian safety, uh, future flow of traffic based on not having a traffic plan. That's really where my concern lies. And Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hoagland. Come back to, back to circle things around to whether it is the extension of Aviator or a development to the south that connects to Franklin. This development will need to be approved to make those connections. So. That's what we have. Do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Are we there yet? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I would just like to say that we're excited to move forward in whatever capacity the city. The city would like, uh, as I said before, we'd be much more uh, happy about finishing this meeting with an approval as opposed to a denial. And, and the developer is, is key to me that they are, they are very excited to move forward with the city's decision on how to best uh, make this site safe, but also add that key infrastructure that comes along with the extension of Aviator. Thank you. Yeah. 
Mr. Mayor. Councilman Borden. Move to close the public hearing on item H2021-0096. Second the motion. I have a motion. <laughs> Second to close the public hearing. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. You guys have it and the public hearing is closed. Mr. Mayor. Councilwoman Pro. After considering all staff, applicant, and public testimony, I move to approve file number H20210096 as presented in the staff report for the hearing date of April 5th, 2022, not um, with the uh, exception of um, not allowing for any building permits to be issued until there is a second public road access to the property. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second for discussion. I have a second for discussion. Councilman Hoagland for discussion. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm playing through my mind. Um, no building permits issued until there's a secondary access so they can commence construction. And so they will have to make sure the timing is correct with other developments as they move forward. So, okay, I think that works. Mr. Mayor. That's one pro. That does allow them to get the infrastructure done, get the drain done, get the roads put in, the lights put in, so they can start moving. And that's why I like that particular uh, concept. Mr. Mayor, sorry. Sure. Does the motion maker want to include the caveat of black clad improvements taking that off or not? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pearl. Um, I think that if that, if the, the second access from Franklin is completed, I'm not as concerned about the improvements on black. I'd love to see the improvements on black hat done, but most people are gonna take the easier route. And if it's hard to get out onto black hat from aviator, which it is already now, then they'll probably head toward Franklin. Just human nature. Okay. Do I have further discussion on the motion? If not, Kirk, call the roll. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Byrne? Aye. Burrow? Aye. Wharton? Aye. Hoagland? Aye. All eyes, motion carries. Thank you very much. Council, anything under future meeting topics? All right, then do I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. I have a motion to adjourn. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. We are adjourned. Thank you.